Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nashville. We are delighted that you are there for your summit. You know, when you are in Nashville and in Tennessee, you're in the right spot because whether it's Vanderbilt to UT to Oak Ridge Labs to Y12, we've got some of the brightest minds that are looking at emerging threats and are paying attention to what is happening with our military and our intel communities. I know that you are going to have a fruitful week, and I hope that you will continue to talk about how you innovate and support our military sector and the importance of the private sector and the military sector working together to solve the problems that face us as we view these emerging threats. Hello, I'm United States Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee. I want to first thank Vanderbilt, my alma mater, for continuing to host this important summit that explores the most pressing issues of our time. Now more than ever, the United States is facing an increasingly complex national security environment marked by strategic competition with China and once unimaginable threats. That's why this summit is so critical in advancing our shared understanding on the impact of new and emerging technologies on modern conflict. Over these next two days, you'll be hearing from top experts from academia, government, and industry. It's my hope that you all will establish collaborative partnerships that help us achieve viable solutions to these global problems. I'm so pleased that Tennessee and Vanderbilt will be leading that charge. Thank you. Hello, and thank you all for attending Vanderbilt's third annual Summit on Modern Conflict and Emerging Threats. And thank you to Vanderbilt for hosting this event as well, as all the participants for sharing your valuable time and expertise. My name is Mark Green, and I have the distinct honor of representing Tennessee's 7th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, where I serve as the Chairman of the Committee of Homeland Security. As threats against our nation grow, it is my role as Chairman to craft policies that strengthen our homeland security from America's physical border to our cyber border. Our cyber border poses unique challenges. As AI tools and cyber tactics become more sophisticated, our country faces new risks. And I believe Vanderbilt University is uniquely equipped to address these threats posed by these rapidly evolving capabilities. One way Vanderbilt has stepped up to the challenge is through its Institute for Software Integrated Systems, which produces leading research on various cyber topics. And I applaud Vanderbilt's work on the NSA Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Research to keep our country safe by developing ways to protect our critical infrastructure and enhance our cybersecurity posture. Considering advancements in AI and the vulnerable source code of apps such as TikTok, we must be proactive to ensure our adversaries cannot exploit the data of American citizens. Another important facet of our nation's critical infrastructure is the operational technology used in our industries, which impacts the daily lives of all Americans. Tennessee has the largest public power company in the nation. A successful attack by a cyber threat actor could be devastating. Underpinning these challenges is the need for a skilled cyber workforce that can tackle these threats. As chairman, one of my top priorities is to ensure that the over 700,000 empty cybersecurity positions in this country are filled with the best and brightest candidates. I know that's your goal too. As we seek to improve our cyber posture, my committee is committed to ensuring CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, is a partner for the private sector and other stakeholders, not another heavy-handed regulator. Cooperation and information sharing are paramount to collective cyber defense from local, state, and federal governments to big corporations and small businesses across our country. This is why Vanderbilt's work to bring together recognized leaders and experts from the military and intelligence communities, the private sector, and academia to examine the future of cyber conflict is so important. Thank you for all you do and enjoy the conference. Well, good morning, everybody, and let me add my welcome to Vanderbilt's Summit on Modern Conflicts and Emerging Threats. My name's Gillian Tett. I oversee King's College in Cambridge, and I'm also a columnist with the Financial Times. And I think I probably should start by apologizing for having brought the English weather. <laughs> but more seriously, I'm delighted to be here because 
A key theme of today is not just global conflict, but also the potential for global collaboration. And the transatlantic element of that is obviously extremely important. Part of my role at King's College in Cambridge means that I oversee the archives of Alan Turing and John Maynard Keynes. And I find leafing through the letters of Keynes particularly haunting given today's situation. Because back in 1919, he lamented the fact that before 1914, the elites around the world took it for granted that globalization was good, that free market capitalism was good, that tech innovation was fantastic for them, and so it should be for everybody else. And of course, innovation in those days was about things like electricity and the telegram. And there was a sunny sense that that mood of peace and prosperity would continue forever. Of course, it didn't. And in 1919, Keynes wrote a lot about a very dark world that was emerging, where all the progress that had been achieved was going rapidly into reverse. And I must say, when I look around the world today, it does feel a lot like we're reliving history in the sense that we're seeing not just rising protectionism, but rising conflict. We've seen the horrific events in the Middle East in the last few months. We've also seen the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. But of course, what is gonna be particularly in focus today is the question of China and how the US can cope with an increasingly aggressive China and the threat that poses, not just to the region, but more widely. So a lot of big questions to consider about how allies can tackle these threats, prepare for these threats, offset these threats, work with the private sector and others to try and create a more resilient and secure world. So we're gonna start by hearing, first of all, from Daniel Diermeyer, the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt. It feels a bit ridiculous for me to introduce him to you, given where we're sitting right now. Um, I'll simply say that he has had a storied career running a number of business schools in America. I think that aspect is particularly valuable given that one key theme that is gonna emerge from today's conversation is a need for collaboration between the public and private sector in a way that was wildly out of fashion th three decades ago, of course very much in fashion back in the early part of the 20th century and is now coming back into fashion again. We truly are in some ways going back to the future. But he brings a perspective of running business schools. He also is a political scientist. So those two attributes, I think, make him perfectly placed to kick off this morning's session with some thoughts about the world of emerging threats and modern conflicts. Thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. <coughs> And thank you, Gillian, for the kind introduction. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the third summit on modern conflicts and emerging threats at Vanderbilt University. And I have to say, it's wonderful to see so many of you. I just like have to reflect a little bit when we started three years ago, which was really an experiment at the time, and to see that how quickly the summit has become a wonderful forum where experts <coughs> from the security area, uh, foreign policy, private sector, and academics can come together. And as it has done in the previous years, this now annual conversation will shed light on some of the most important security challenges of our time. Over the past two years, against the backdrop of an ever-shifting geopolitical landscape, we have looked at the shifting security landscape of Eurasia, the use of misinformation, that was an important theme. Cybersecurity and emerging technologies, the changing nature of warfare, the acceleration of epidemics, and the use of biosurveillance, to name just a few of the themes that occupied us. We've heard from military leaders, members of the intelligence community, academic partners, private sector practitioners, reporters, educators, elected officials from this country and abroad. In short, with support and insight from partners and colleagues, we spent the past two summits 
offering unique, wide-ranging service of our current and evolving security landscape. And this year, <clears throat> of course, we wanted to do something a little different. We want to go deep on one topic. So the next two days, we will offer an intense exploration of China's relationship with the United States and the broader international community. We will start by laying the groundwork, exploring the geopolitics and socioeconomics in China, and, ex and then considering our tightly interconnected supply chains. Then we will dig into two issues critical to international security, cybersecurity and the trafficking of fentanyl, before a final panel of us a broad and strategic perspective. FBI Director Christopher Wray, who we will welcome tomorrow as our closing speaker, offered this framing a few months ago during an interview with 60 Minutes, and I quote, the People's Republic of China represents the defining threat of this generation and this era. There is no country that represents a broader, more comprehensive threat to our ideas, our innovation, our economic security, and ultimately our national security. That quote alone gives us a lot to cover in just two days. But this work and our conversations are essential, given what's at stake for both nations. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has described the interaction between the United States and China as, again, and as a quote, as one of the most consequential relationships between any two countries in the world. The complex, intertwined, and interdependent nature of our systems today requires us to address China with nuance, strategy, and an interdisciplinary approach that recognizes how actions in our domain affect one another. And that kind of interdisciplinary approach is really one of the aspects that draws participants to the summit. It matters that we speak open and that we have hopefully ongoing conversations about national security leaders who spent their days facing down real world security threats. That we have faculty members with unparalleled depth of knowledge in their fields and industry experts whose companies sit on the front lines of our interactions with China every day. It will take all of us to understand this complicated relationship as it is today and as it continues to evolve and to develop, to develop robust, effective responses to the challenges and opportunity it presents. The kind of radical cross-sector collaboration we need to address national security challenges is one of the things that sets Vanderbilt apart. It is a part of our culture. Our engineers and computer scientists, social scientists, and legal experts, brain scientists, and humanities scholars are all collaborating to discover solutions to the toughest problems in national defense and global security. And for us, this is not just an academic exercise. Consider our collaboration with Fort Campbell, for example, less than an hour and a half away from here, where we work hand in hand with soldiers and special operators to address real world challenges facing service members and accelerating groundbreaking innovations with global impact. Through that partnership, Vanderbilt engineering and computer science researchers have already fielded solutions that enable the US and NATO allies to communicate more effectively when supporting Ukraine by dominating the electromagnetic spectrum. And with guidance from our partners at the National Security Agency and in collaboration with Vanderbilt's Office of Cybersecurity, a team of undergraduate students from across Vanderbilt are using AI-informed gaming environments to develop new strategies to combat email phishing attacks by malign agents. We are proud of Vanderbilt's contribution in these important areas, and I'm extremely proud that we are about to take our commitment to another level. So today, we are announcing, announcing the launch of our newest endeavor starting this fall the Vanderbilt University Institute for National Defense and Global Security. 
This institute will help us deliver world-changing solutions to the kinds of challenges we're discussing here today, all at the speed of modern conflict. Led by our School of Engineering, in partnership with our College of Arts and Sciences and our Peabody College of Education and Human Development, the Institute for National Defense and Global Security will organize our efforts through four interrelated pillars. Innovate, educate, convene, and advise. Through the Innovate pillar, we will expand our collaborations with government and military by embedding interdisciplinary scholars with partners around the national security community. And I hope that will include many of you in this room. This approach allows our scholars to tackle the most pressing problem, designing with users, with users, rather than for users, and greatly accelerating the rate of innovation. Our initial focus areas will capitalize on vendorable strength, including AI, cybersecurity, and human performance. Through the Educate pillar, we will educate service-minded students aimed towards careers that address social needs, preparing them to become interdisciplinary leaders. Through executive education programs, we will also equip the current national security workforce with the information and tools to flourish in a world that is getting smaller as technology moves faster. The Convene pillar builds on efforts like the summit. We will continue to bring together thought leaders, and practitioners to discuss, dissect, and deliberate over the most consequential national security problems in our lecture series on modern conflicts and on ventures on Venice, the United States and abroad. And finally, the advice pillar will allow us to facilitate the exchange of ideas in new ways. We envision bringing national security leaders to our campus to work alongside faculty and students, sending our scholars and researchers on sabbaticals that support both classified and unclassified security-focused programs, and joining critical discussions to bring Vanderbilt's distinct voice to the table wherever our expertise is needed and welcomed. It is fitting and important for us to announce the launch of this institute with this audience, because our success depends on what we at Vanderbilt call radical collaboration. Ideally, with many of you in this room. We will continue to host a summit, nurturing this forum for this discussion and debate, but the Institute will help us grow and enhance our ongoing work to break down disciplinary and organizational silos that slow the groundbreaking solutions to national defense and global security challenges. But for now, I'm thrilled to focus on our next two days and the preeminent lineup of participants who will be with us. Consider just our keynote speakers. In just a moment, it will be a great honor to welcome General Timothy Hawke, Commander of the U.S. Cyber Command, Director, National Security Agency, and Chief, Central Security Service. General Hawke took on his current role just 75 days ago well within the 100 days limit, right, when you assume a new role, and we're delighted and grateful that he made time for this event. At lunch, we will hear from Shita Patel, the Assistant Director at the CIA's Transnational and Technology Mission Center, and today we will close with the Peter W. Singer, a Senior Fellow and Strategist at New America. Tomorrow, at about this time, we'll hear from Ann Milgram, the Administrator of the Drug Enforcement, and administration, her insights will inform our broader conversation about the fentanyl crisis. There were more than 112,000 fatal overdoses in the United States last year alone, making illegal drugs one of the most significant threats to our national security. We will also welcome Mario Diaz, Deputy Undersecretary of the Army, to provide an Indo-Pacific perspective. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we will close tomorrow with FBI Director Ray. Nashville sits, if you really want to know, 7,000 miles from Beijing. But we're about to hear why geography is no barrier to the threats before us. These challenges in circular economy are ideas, 
our innovation ecosystem, our workforce, our health, and our overarching security. The ramifications are national, local, and even intensely personal for each of us. These challenges affect not just national systems, but our immediate neighbors here in Middle Tennessee as well, including members of the 101st Airborne Division, factory workers at the Nissan plant down the road in Smyrna, ER physicians at our medical center coping with an influx of fentanyl overdoses, innovators creating new IP at our Wonder Incubator space, and countless other people whose lives and livelihoods could be upended if we do not develop effective responses to emerging threats. It's important to keep this in mind as we're starting the two of these two days together. Thank you for being here today, for joining us in this collaboration and the common purpose necessary in this moment, and for all your work to keep our country and its people safe. Please enjoy the summit. Thank you very much indeed, Chancellor Diermeyer, and congratulations on the launch of the new institute, which sounds very important indeed. And as somebody coming from the academic world, I'm delighted to hear you underscore the role that universities can play in advancing these issues. Um, Alan Turing did much of his work at Cambridge University that then went on to essentially help win World War II. And that's a pattern we're seeing played out today over and over again. But first, we're going to hear from General Timothy Hawke, who's the fourth commander of the US Cyber Command and 19th director of the NSA. Um, he started his career um, studying Russian um, issues, Russian studies at Lehigh, and then went on to a very illustrious career in the military, holding all manner of roles around the world and as Chancellor Dima just said, was recently appointed to run the Cyber Command and the NSA. So over to you, General Hawke, and then after that, um, Chancellor Diermeyer is going to interview him um, and pick up some of the themes from his earlier remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tett, for the kind introduction and Chancellor Deermeyer for your earlier remarks. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. We're kicking off what I'm confident will be a very informative two days focused on the threats posed by the PRC, as well as our collaborative efforts across the military intelligence community to meet that challenge head on. We are joined by several distinguished visitors, including Provost Raver, DEA Administrator Milgram, uh, Ms. Shatil Patel, Assistant Director, Transnational and Technology Mission Center from CIA, Ambassador Hanso, the Estonian Ambassador to China. We are also joined by individuals representing key institutions and organizations from across the country, including members of the Tennessee National Guard, the University of Chicago, the University of Tennessee, from, of course, Vanderbilt, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and many others. Special thank you to Chancellor Deermeyer and the leadership and staff at Vanderbilt University, who have worked so hard to bring us this event on their beautiful campus. We're all grateful for the very warm welcome that you've given us. I must also commend Vanderbilt for their ongoing commitment to advancing innovation and education on issues of modern conflict and emerging threats. I haven't had the chance to meet with all of you, so as I've gone through my first 75 days in my new organizations, I've spent some time introducing myself. They've asked me a number of questions. Given where we're, we're seated today, I thought I would share some of my musical interests. As I started to think about you know, introducing myself, one of the things that I, I told everybody, I've got an eclectic music interest, from Garth Brooks, to also some excitement over the fact that there's going to be a Nashville resident and formal Pennsylvanian who's going to release a new album in two days. For those of you that aren't tracking, Taylor Swift is putting out a new album. <laughs> so three months ago, I inherited the leadership of the National Security Agency in the United States Cyber Command. 
two remarkable organizations with unique but complementary missions. In my role as the commander of Cyber Command, we are responsible for U.S. military operations in cyberspace. We secure the Department of Defense's information networks and work with partners at home and around the world in support of U.S. national security interests. In my role as the director of the National Security Agency, we fill critical roles within the intelligence community, which are responsible for conducting signals intelligence and cybersecurity in support of the nation's most important strategic requirements. Individually, Cyber Command and NSA play key roles in national defense. But when our organizations have a unity of effort, we can achieve outcomes for our nation that no one else can. Underpinning this success is our incredibly talented workforce, whose skills and creative approaches to solving hard problems and modernize, are modernizing the way the command and the agency respond to our determined adversaries worldwide. Today, I'd like to talk about the strategic environment. It's one of unprecedented threat and opportunity. There are three aspects that have tremendous ramifications for our national security. The competitive challenge and threat that the PRC poses, accelerating technological change that is producing a rapidly expanding art of the possible, and the growing numbers of non-state entities empowered through technological innovation who are capable of consequential effects with a global impact. First, the People's Republic of China presents a unique challenge to our nation. It has both the demonstrated intent and growing capability to threaten the existing global order. It is both an urgent military threat in the Indo-Pacific region and an enduring generational competitor across all elements of national power. Nowhere is this more evident than in the cyber domain. The PRC is engaged in a deliberate campaign to challenge the United States and our allies technologically while putting our critical systems and national infrastructure at risk. The PRC continues to grow the scope, scale, sophistication, and speed of its cyber capabilities. The PRC cyber forces operate unconstrained by matters of law and international policy. They are highly capable and rapidly able to exploit opportunities. And they demonstrate a risk tolerance that allows them to operate across an open society while we counter them in their closed and centrally controlled environment. In 1973, China had a GDP of roughly 120 billion in today's dollars, with limited ability to impact the region, let alone the world. Today, its economy is in the trillions, rivaling that of the United States. China produces and drives cutting edge technologies, and it is actively pursuing not just global relevance, but dominance. This dramatic shift in relative national power has been achieved absent of kinetic conflict. And we must recognize this. And we must be willing to contest the PRC below the level of armed conflict, particularly in cyber. Second, accelerating technological change and global interconnectedness produce a rapidly expanding art of the possible. Technological advances and innovation arise from diverse entities worldwide. Nation-state research and development is not the princi principal driver of technological change. Academia, corporations, and even individuals working in collaboration play rapidly growing and consequential roles. We live in a rapidly changing world. Today, a nation's fate is less a result of what it controls, but more of a result of how rapidly it adapts. It is no longer the big that eat the small, but now the fast that eat the slow. It used to be in national security that we generated the waves to ride. Now it's more about recognizing and riding waves we don't generate and don't necessarily control. The advantage will go to those that see first, recognize first, adapt first, and apply first. The world is not about to change fundamentally. It already has. We must recognize that fact within the national security community and adapt. When General C.Q. Brown was Chief of Staff of the Air Force, he wrote an article entitled, Accelerate, Change, or Lose. I highly recommend it. Speed and agility are key, not only in operations, but in capability. How we develop and how we acquire. We must challenge established approaches and move toward rapid innovation to effectively prevail. We cannot succeed when our existing processes move slower than the rate of innovation and change. Third, a dramatically expanding set of global actors and non-state entities empowered by technology can create and exercise consequential impact during competition and conflict. 
We do not need to theorize about increased nuclear proliferation risk or rogue development and deployment of novel biological agents produced by AI to see that this is true. Instead, look to what we have seen in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, where technology has had a consequential impact on the course of a war as a result of the actions of influential industry, satellite, te satellite technologies as an example. So what are, the, what are the ramifications of this changing global environment? First, although the U.S. is effective today, we will not remain so without deliberate and rapid change. We can count on our adversaries to continually adapt and change. We cannot assume our continued technological dominance. We must behave differently. Second, drivers of change will emerge rapidly and unpredictably, making it imperative that U.S. organizations operate with agility and speed. We must change our organizational structures, relax constraints, and innovate to operate more effectively in a world where no single entity will have all of the talent, intellectual capital, data, computing capabilities, or authorities to meet unexpected challenges and create and exploit a fleeting opportunity. Third, it will be necessary, it will be a necessity to collaborate in an agile manner, shifting across a number of stakeholders. We cannot act in isolation or rely on purpose-built industrial age entities. Over the past six years, we have faced multiple threats in cyberspace to include Russia, Iran, and the DPRK, as well as criminal organizations and other non-state actors. Yet the PRC represents the most formal of these threats with thousands of intelligence, military, and commercial sector personnel engaged in a deliberate campaign to steal our nation's intellectual property, threaten our national security and, and defense industrial base, and gain footholds in our critical infrastructure to do us harm. These are not isolated actions, but rather they are part of an ongoing campaign of continuous operation to advance China's drive towards global hegemony. U.S. Cyber Command and the NSA are responding via persistent engagement. Continuous proactive operations, which we work not in isolation, but in close collaboration across government agencies, with the private sector, academia, and our allies and partners. This broad collaboration toward a common purpose is a principal advantage in contesting China during competition and critical preparation for crisis. The collaborative relationships, partnerships, and complementary operations that Cyber Command and NSA are building today allow us to achieve agility, scale, and capabilities that we would not otherwise be available to us. Our nation has a substantial advantage over the PRC because of the value we place on freedom of thought. This allows us to innovate and partner quickly, whereas China's mindset is one of centralized control. Cyber Command and NSA recognize that we cannot merely respond and react to cyber threats to our nation's networks. Rather, we must be proactive, persistent, and resilient. At Cyber Command and the NSA, we believe that cyber defense is a team sport, and we want to continue to expand our teammates. Let me give you some examples of where we're working with our partners on a daily basis to make it harder for malicious cyber actors to operate. Hunt forward operations. To understand an adversary, their techniques, tools, and infrastructures, Cyber Command deploys small teams to hunt for them in allied networks. We receive requests from friendly governments for assistance in assessing their networks for vulnerabilities and adversary presence. And then we help them expose and mitigate malicious cyber activity. By doing this, we gain crucial, crucial insights that we then share with others, enabling broad foreclosure of adversary opportunities in cyber. It constrains our activities and it imposes costs. Since 2018, Cyber Command Cyber National Mission Force has conducted hunt forward operations in 28 different countries. Over that time, these operations have matured into an important pillar in the defense of our nation. CyberCan has also expanded collaboration with interagency and international partners and has relied on these relationships to disrupt revenue building operations, disrupt adversarial cyber ecosystems, and secure the Department of Defense networks and critical infrastructure systems from foreign adversaries. Over the last two years, these partnerships have led to disruption operations to multiple ransomware and malware networks used by foreign cyber actors, operations causing loss of trust within the adversary's cyber ecosystem, sanctions against foreign companies that have been connected to foreign adversaries, 
and federal indictments on foreign cyber actors who have conducted cyber attacks against the United States and our systems. Cyber Command intends to continually generate mutual beneficial outcomes at scale with our partners by enabling them to use our authorities and capabilities. This is deeply ad advantageous for the United States as well as in our efforts against other nation state and malicious cyber actors. Since 2021, there have been over 20,000 distinct cybersecurity vulnerabilities identified each year, with the most vulnerabilities 29,000 discovered in 2023 alone. To be effective in such an environment is going to require collaboration. That's why in 2020, the NSA created the, the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, which allows us to work side by side with over 1,000 public and private partners to identify foreign intelligence efforts to acquire sensitive proprietary technology. The C has issued dozens of cybersecurity advisories. These unclassified reports detail adversary attack vectors and the vulnerabilities they seek to exploit, as well as the, as the mitigations to employ in their order to defend and eradicate them. These CSAs cover a wide variety of topics, such as ransomware guidance to include best practices for home use, artificial intelligence, and activities of nation states such as Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China. As recently as February, one advisory was dedicated specifically to threats of PRC-sponsored actor Volt Typhoon and the targeting by the PRC of the communications, energy, transportation, water, and wastewater systems in the United States and our territories. At Cyber Command, industry collaboration is through an effort called Under Advisement, in which the command maintains an ongoing relationship with cybersecurity firms, researchers, and individuals across the cyber ecosystem. By exchanging information and working collaboratively, the command works proactively to address and counter threats. An important point in understanding our approach to seeing national security more broadly than just the military element of national power, a point driven by the nature of the environment that the SECDEF, the Director of National Intelligence, and other national leadership are very clear on. For NSA, as an intelligence and combat support agency, and Cyber Command as a combatant command, it means a broadening set of interactions. In the future, U.S. Cyber Command and the outcomes that we pursue may not be our own, but rather enabling a demarche from State Department, a sanction from Treasury, or an arrest by the FBI. Thus far, what I've really tried to lay out is how we're thinking about engaging with our adversaries in continuous cyber operations, as well as collaboration with partners, and how that creates advantage for the nation. Now I'd like to pivot and talk a little bit about how we're posturing to bring advantage through innovation in a world of rapidly emerging technological change. As you know, artificial intelligence is a leading focus for the government. It has the capability to upend multiple sectors of society simultaneously. We, as we think about our military, our economy, international relations, technological growth, AI has the ability to be used against the network and systems we've been entrusted to defend. It is essential that we stay ahead of our global competitors in the race to understand and harness its potential, as well as to protect ourselves from adversarial use. China is demonstrating a higher degree of sophistication in its influence activity, including experimenting with generative AI. China also announced its global AI governance initiative to bolster international support for its vision of AI governance. In response, Cyber Command and NSA are working in a united front to meet these challenges head on. Last year, NSA drew on the successful partnership model of the, of the Cyber Collaboration Center to establish the AI Security Center, which has already become a key component of NSA's cybersecurity mission. It will advance the science of AI and ensure secure development, integration, and adoption of AI within our national security and DIB partners. NSA created an AI roadmap to counter that of China's with the goal of detecting and countering threats, drive and deepen partnerships across the government, industry, and academia, and develop, evaluate, and promote best practices. Publish mitigation solutions to advance secure development, integration, and adoption of AI within our national security systems and our defense industrial base. AI, like other tools and authorities, carries risks. By ensuring that we are using them in a carefully controlled, regulated, and transparent manner, we can harness them to advance our national interests without threatening the rights of our citizens. NSA is uniquely positioned to take on this charge because of our multiple authorities levied by Congress and the President 
for the protection of national security systems and the defense industrial base. Because of our strong dedication to civil liberties, privacy and transparency, and because of NSA's cadre of experts working directly on the science of AI. NSA has a long record of bringing technical expertise to bear and deliver value through collaboration in, in the public sector. As examples, Secure Enhanced Linux. NSA developed and introduced Security Enhanced Linux 23 years ago. And every major computer operating system in use today now incorporates elements of SE Linux or its technical approaches. Ghidra, the reverse engineering tool and core capability for vulnerability research, developed and shared with the public in 2019, has been recognized as an R&D 100 top technology innovation as one of, and also as one of the top 25 job apps of all time. Beyond these technical achievements in cybersecurity, NSA is a recognized leader and sponsor of key research and development in the areas of AI human language technology, quantum information science, and high performance computing. Building on a series of new authorities and expectations, Cyber Command has also developed an AI roadmap and is working to apply AI and cybersecurity to better identify and close vulnerabilities across the Department of Defense networks. AI is a tool that will enable our mission. It's a tool that the talented members of our cyber operations force have been using for years, along with support from our partners, especially DARPA, and as well as those DOD uh, federally funded research and development centers and our university partners such as Vanderbilt. We have implemented machine learning models across our missions and currently use AI for operations across our various missions. We have established an AI task force within Cyber Command to move us from opportunistic AI application to systematic adoption, again driven by strategic and tactical objectives that will focus on three important outcomes. First, we are focused on delivering AI capability for cyber mission force operations and taking steps to integrate our AI task force even more closely with operations. Second, we are posturing Cyber Command to enable AI adoption at scale by addressing many of the non-material issues, like policy and standards that we required to allow responsible, ethical, assured, and secure application of AI. Finally, our no-fail missions mean that we are laser-focused to counter AI threats and exploiting emerging opportunities. One of the ways we're getting smarter on AI, as well as other emerging technologies, is through our extensive and expanding academic relationships throughout the country. NSA has over 400 partnerships with colleges and universities through our Centers for Academic Excellence, which are designed to help students understand NSA's mission and how we might partner in the future with should they want to pursue a, cure, a, a career in cybersecurity, whether at NSA or within industry. We also have labs at seven institutions, to include one here at Vanderbilt, where students can work on real-world problems. Cyber Command was recently designated as a federal laboratory which will enhance our capacity to drive innovation, collaborate with academia and industry leaders, and contribute significantly to achievements in the development of cyber technologies. We are also using cooperative research and development agreements and educational partnering agreements to collaborate with industry and academia, integrate commercial technology, and grow our footprint in the S&T and academic communities. Accelerating these, resources, or these initiatives will require resources. When Congress passed the FY24 appropriation in March, Cyber Command assumed direct responsibility for executing the management and the budget for the Cyber Mission Force. This marks the culmination of several years of planning for a responsibility that was previously left to the military services. With this, with this authority, Cyber Command will better able to ensure coherent investment towards our highest priorities. We'll partner with the services and improve the department's overall approach to investments and acquisition of cyber capabilities. What do I want to leave you with today? We live in a dramatically changing world where no entity working in isolation will have all that is required to respond to emerging threats or to create and exploit fleeting opportunity. Therefore, advantage will go to those best postured to work in collaboration with others. Accelerating technological change creates a, a rapidly expanding art of the possible. Those who work with others to see, understand, and apply first will be best postured to adapt, innovate, and succeed in a rapidly changing world. China is pursuing deliberate campaigns to gain advantage in every aspect of national power. We will succeed by moving more quickly to recognize and contest threats, to innovate and apply technologies, 
and to recruit and expand allies and partners. Agility and speed will be required to gain and maintain advantage. Underlying all these initiatives is our talented workforce. Technology is a tool and not a substitute for a skilled, creative, and innovative personnel. NSA and Cyber Command's workforces continue to be our most important competitive advantage. Yes, the threat posed by China is real. The PRC has the desire and the ability to make themselves our peer on the world stage. But the unity of effort demonstrated on a daily basis by Cyber Command and NSA create advantage for our nation, and that will not be understated. There is an opportunity through extended collaboration to bring greater unity of effect for the nation and the Department of Defense in cybersecurity and the application of emerging technology. Both organizations can play a role in that unique we have unique technical experience and we have adversary insights that allow us to be a fire starter for innovation and acceleration for the Department of Defense by leveraging our talented and highly technical workforce, the partnerships that we've formed across the industry and academia, NSA's long history of significant technical contributions to critical technologies, and Cyber Command's focus on leveraging our new acquisition authorities and software acquisition pathways to operationalize the process of quickly bringing new capabilities to our cyber warfighters. Finally, Cyber Command's Constellation partnership with DARPA will allow a scalable model to overcome the valley of death in critical cyber technologies. The unity of effort of both NSA and Cyber Command offers a powerful opportunity to leverage the unique but complementary cybersecurity missions, authorities, and expertise of both organizations to provide combined advantage countering malicious cyber activity. Together, we can lead the department in advancing beyond what is today in a mindset that was built initially on industrial age approaches to a threat-informed and risk-based approach, consistent with our laws and our values that harness our AI and high-performance computing efforts to reduce China's freedom maneuver and effectiveness. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today, and now we have time for some questions. General Hawk, let me first uh, welcome you again to Vanderbilt. It's wonderful to have you with us today. And I want to start with like um, um, some of the things you talked about as you're assuming this new role. Let's start with the most obvious question. You'll be the first uh, Air Force officer to helm uh, Cybercom. Um, the first three commanders came from uh, the Army and the Navy. What does it mean to have somebody from the Air Force to assume that role? So I, I think from my perspective, what, what it really is about, are, are we growing the talent in the Department of Defense that can assume these roles across all of our combatant commands? So I, when, we, when we talk about talent and who serves in combatant command roles, I, I think it is far less about the service we come from and really the, the skills that, that we potentially bring to the role. And because I know that's how I evaluate for every hire that I make. Is, is about where are we today in terms of the type of talent we need. And the exciting part for us is that in, as the department has grown in the cyber mission, we're now seeing leaders that have grown up doing this mission in, as, uh, from a tactical level. They've succeeded and done work at an operational level, and now they're going to reach strategic positions. So I think the exciting part is we're, we're developing talent that is able to do these roles in the department. Wonderful. And one little um, organizational comment, you see at the screen behind me, uh, not only the general's name and my name, but also the ability to send questions. So uh, if you have a question, um, I'll start with some, some questions and uh, start the conversation, but uh, please send them in. And then uh, they will show up at my high-tech device right here. So I'm not doing email on the site. I'm like uh, keeping an eye uh, on questions that are coming in. Uh, uh, so um, there was a, there was a, there was some fascinating um, ideas and perspectives that you provided, and particularly I think on how uh, some of the challenges are changed or how how some of how the how the, the speed of technological progress uh, is changing about how we need to think about um, the role um, 
uh, of uh, Cyber Command, the NSA, and so forth. And I'm going to connect with one of the metaphors um, that, you were, that you were using, which I thought was particularly apt to capture that, is we were used to make the wave, and now we have to serve the wave. And um, that puts um, a tremendous um, amount of importance on speed, agility, um, Coming from a world where sometimes public perception is that universities uh, operate at glacial speed, they're not known for their speed and their agility, a totally wrong perception, by the way, uh, just for the record. Uh, but my sense is, is that you will, you, will, you will face similar perceptions, is that the, the governmental agencies, um, do, they, they may not be the first example that come to mind when you think about speed and agility, but more generally, uh, there is organizational questions, there are people questions, there are questions about culture. Just take us a little bit inside about how do you think about accelerating speed and agility as we're thinking about these challenges and the, and the changing environment. So I think we have a different challenge than most of the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. So when we think about what goes on across acquisition in the department, we think about ships, submarines, airplanes. Within NSA and Cyber Command, we are largely talking about writing code. So from our perspective, how we approach that does have an opportunity to leverage best practices from industry. How do we think about rapidly testing and being able to take risk in an environment where we have the opportunity to control that environment? So I think those are things that are advantages for us. The other areas that are advantages is how the Department of Defense has given us increasing levels of authority. Mm -hmm. So NSA has, has long been an organization where the nation has relied upon for development of, and, and within the government context of specific technologies. But increasingly within Cyber Command, uh, the, the department and Congress have now given Cyber Command the authority for acquisition of all of our capabilities. So we're the acquisition authority. We now have control of the budget for all of those activities that we execute both internally and in partnership with, with the military department. And then we also um, are responsible for how we set the requirements for what the department needs in cyberspace. So inside that, there's an opportunity for us to be able to move very quickly in identifying what we need, applying resources, and then moving out to be able to, to, to integrate those capabilities. What our question will be, how much of that or, or can we, will we do inside for our cyber mission force where we have to be excellent at? We've got to be able to give our force the best capabilities. But how can we also make the overall Department of Defense better? As we think about cybersecurity and we think about all the way down to a weapon system or a post camper station that might be in some other geographic area, how do we help them grow cyber capabilities that will be part of a much more coherent ecosystem? We have a lot of opportunity space there, and, and the department's given us a lot of trust. We now have to deliver on that. Wonderful. So um, a couple of the themes that, uh, that resonated with me as you were talking about this, too, was questions about people, innovation. We talked about the speed, partnerships. Um, I think the partnership side is another aspect of this. This makes these um, challenges particularly difficult. Um, and I remember well, and you know, many in this room will remember well as, um, when we you know, look back to the post kind of 9-11 security landscape, one of the challenges there was how do we think about protection um, of critical infrastructure from like uh, physical kinetic attacks, terrorist attacks and so forth, and that required already the collaboration between private sector uh, and the national security um, uh, agencies uh, because so much of the critical interest infrastructure is privately owned. Now, as we're moving into a world uh, where cyber threats are uh, arguably maybe the dominant threat of our time, how do we make sure that this works effectively and efficiently? Because clearly, um, even though we have working partnerships, but the incentives are different, the way things are organized are different, how do we make sure that this partnership works, works as effectively as we can, as we can imagine it? So I, I think one of the areas that we have seen is really clear expectations throughout the executive branch. So when I look at the national defense strategy or I look at the national intelligence strategy, there's clarity in, in that our pacing challenge is China. Mm. And so as we align ourselves, there's also so many common interests. 
And, and when we think about the partnerships that we have across the executive branch, the U.S. government brings a whole series of tools to those challenges. So when we think about at our core, what drives national security in, in the United States? It's our economy. That's the foundation of our national security. So how we think about intellectual property theft and how we can enable industry or our teammates that are responsible for domestic cybersecurity in FBI and in DHS, how do we enable them to help protect our overarching foundation of our economy, or of our national security, which is our economy? So that's an example of really having unity of, of effort against a clear set of objectives. So in NSA, that means we have to think about what is the intelligence that we need to produce that aligns to those series of priorities that is outlined in the national defense strategy, the national security strategy, and the national intelligence strategy. Those are harmonized, and I think we're seeing a very clear demand signal that is looking not just to our fellow military partners, but all of the elements across the executive branch that are working across the United States to set a foundational uh, both economic and technical security for the United States. I'm getting like three questions on critical infrastructure. Clearly, like this is something that people are particularly interested in. I'm having, uh, so I could just like, just let me go a little bit deeper. Uh, there, I had like two questions on that. So clearly, people are interested in that, on like uh, questions like power plants, water systems, internet capabilities, and also whether you can give us an update on addressing World Typhoon. So, so I think first and foremost, when we think about these areas for both NSA and Cyber Command, it starts with enabling this conversation, right? If you would look back even two years ago, would we have been able to talk about a, a, a PRC cyber actor with a level of specificity of what they've done, where they've done it, what techniques they've used, and to be able to put that out in an extensive series of documents that lay out exactly their techniques, their procedures, and to do that with many elements of the U.S. government that contribute to that, the fact that we've had international partners contribute to that, and industry all collaborating to spell out at an unclassified level how China is targeting our critical infrastructure and how they're, what techniques they're using that would potentially target the Department of Defense. That starts, that's the foundation. If we all can have that conversation and we can have it in this room about what China's doing, how they're doing it, now we can get to unity of effort and how we respond. And so I think that, is a, that for us is really foundational. So when we think about any part of a campaign, it starts with how do we generate insights? That's one of our core roles that we can do that will help not only other elements within the national security community, but it can help all the way down to the local county that's trying to think about cybersecurity for the mm -hmm. first time, that they can understand this threat and have a conversation at state, local governments, because at our core, all of us operate every day in our hometowns is off of infrastructure that has never thought about the possibility of a nation state targeting them. And so the fact that we can generate those insights really is then a capability that allows us to enable defense. That now we're starting from a known series of things. And in reality, the, one of the most impactful players that will have uh, many ways determine our overall cybersecurity as a nation is going to be industry. They build the domain, they operate the domain, and they provide services to those same state and local governments. How do they understand the threat? How can they rapidly accelerate their, their overall cybersecurity? And then the part that's uniquely national security, how do we impose costs? How do we make it more difficult for China to operate in that space using all the tools that are available within the executive branch and also with our partners? So I want to pivot to China in a minute, but there, I had a couple of uh, questions on um, structure. And uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting question. Um, so we have uh, full acquisition authority now. Um, we're moving towards a unified uh, combatant command. Do you see a future where cyber service becomes kind of the equivalent of a whole new service like a Space Force? Are we going to have cyber for us? So, so I think from our perspective, this is a question Congress has asked us. Mm. So we actually have a study underway right now um, with the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber. So the Commander of U.S. Cyber Command and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber. We've been given a series of studies uh, that we are to deliver this summer. 
One of those is how our forces are generated, currently generated through the four military services. Um, the second one is on what is the structure of our headquarters. The third is about creating our acquisition organization. We have a number of other smaller studies, but the, the, the last one that was really impactful was a defense science board review of our overall warfighting architecture in cyberspace. So our intent is to take all of those studies and package them into what we've described as Cyber Command 2.0. What does it look like for the future of Cyber Command? And inside that, uh, one of the things that Congress has specifically asked us to do is how do we make our force? And it should include how the services generate today as, one, as a, the, far, the, the status quo to creating a cyber service. And we're evaluating all of those to give back to the Secretary of Defense in June. I think from our perspective, we also want to be thinking about not just how it would affect Cyber Command. Uh, but also, how, do, how would it affect the Department of Defense? Like, what makes us, because we need not just the forces that are given to Cyber Command to be great. We need every service to be great at cyber. Because they operate, every weapon system they operate is really a cyber weapon system. Um, so how do we think about that and how we evaluate it? Um, we hope to give a really good input to, input to the Secretary this summer. Well, fascinating. So let's pivot to China. Um, give us a sense for how advanced China's offensive cyber capabilities are. I mean, Xi Jinping has said that the goal is to make China a cyber superpower. Um, and then what does the U.S. needs to take to ensure it remains ahead of China, particularly when it comes to advanced IT capabilities like AI and quantum? You talked extensively about AI, but it would be great if that could be connected to Chinese capabilities a little bit more directly. So, so I think one of the things that, that we, want, we, we certainly want to be able to do, what you see in Volt Typhoon, is an example of how China has approached establishing access to put things into threat. Like there is, there is not a valid intelligence reason to be looking at a water treatment plant from a cyber perspective. Uh, so there is clearly what, what looks like uh, something that would be pre-positioning. So they're sending a, a pretty loud signal of how they intend to use cyberspace in a crisis. We should listen to that. So that's part of, of what that is. Where they are using more advanced capabilities and have done so for over a decade is partly in how they steal intellectual property. Intelligence operations to be able to extract data from Western uh, nations to do an area where we still have significant advantage, and that's innovation. So stealing our innovation. So inside that, those tools, one of the areas that AI it helps us today and can continue to help us, is how do we rapidly evaluate those tools? How can we look for vulnerabilities in those tools? How can we look for indicators for those? And then how do we rapidly make those, those things automated to be able to capture indications with our industry partners to accelerate their pursuit of China within their own customer base? So I think those are things that we can enable, and we have to think about how do we compliantly share our data? Because we think first, and this is, you know, our requirements for how we handle data are different than industry. Mm. We will start with a foundation that is about civil liberties, privacy, and, and then how we transparently talk about that. And so that means we have to know exactly where every piece of data came, what authority we received it under, and then how we use it to ensure we do it consistent with our law. So that's an area that does make us move a little bit more slowly, but we do it for good reason and so how we apply these technologies also allows us to buy back some of that speed. I think it's impossible to think about China without thinking about Taiwan. And so um, I think one important debate that's going on in Washington, of course, is whether China will attempt to use force to re re reunify with Taiwan. But can you talk a little bit about the non-kinetic actions you see China potentially taking in regards to Taiwan and then what the U.S. and its allies can do about it? Well, I think from our perspective, um, our job is, is to make sure that we never see that day. Um, and, and as a Department of Defense, as we think about integrated deterrence, it's, it's our role in cyberspace to be a part of that multi-domain team uh, that really continues to deter China from doing things that will be against our national security interests. So that's a foundational uh, start point for us. I think we can look at what is happening today in Russia, Ukraine to inform us as to what is conflict going to look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we see the use of drones that have now taken on different perspectives and so rapidly changing um, in, in what that has meant for that conflict, 
We can see what it has meant for how data and information have been so critical in that conflict. And the area that I, that I think that we have to really be mindful of is thinking about what the information environment would look like in a crisis with China and how they would use the tools that are available to them in the information environment and what would be the implications of that, both within the region and with our population. Those are areas that I think we have to continue to really be thoughtful about as we go forward. We had a little bit of a discussion of that uh, during breakfast um, when we thought, when we had a, we had a, a, a quite passionate discussion um, over Oppenheimer and the point of view of uh, you know, the movie and how it was done. But I think one thing that was, um, that was in, but that I think that reminded us, you know, when, when we saw the film and, uh, you know, whether we thought it was overproduced as I thought and others thought it was great. So at any rate, we put that aside. <laughs> Okay, uh, but there is a, um, I think one thing that is so striking of that is uh, whenever we have new technologies of conflict, the, the, it, it raises whole new strategic questions as well. And I think one of the aspects of that is, as we're thinking about our institute, is that we want to bring together um, experts that come that have the engineering expertise on cyber, but then also we need to have policy makers and people that think about the strategic aspects, the international relations aspect, if you will. And um, I think one thing that was so fascinating after, you know, after the development of, um, uh, of uh, nuclear weapons and um, the type of uh, capabilities that came with that, it created a whole new way of thinking strategically, the birth of game theory, mutually assured destruction, flexible response. Um, as as, as you know, horrific the consequences where they were contemplated, I think it was also a time when we had kind of quality of strategic thinking that was really impre that, 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 that there was a quality there uh, that you know, stayed with us for decades. So in cyber conflict, I think just raises a whole new set of challenges on that. For example, um, you know, you know when somebody is sending out a, a ballistic missile, not so easy to know where a particular cyber attack comes from. So questions of attribution, deterrence, um, need to be rethought in this environment. Um, can you give us a little bit of sense of how you how you are thinking about that? The so, let's call it the strategic nature of that. So I think this is a perfect area when we talk about your institute to have conversations around. Like, what has changed in our overall deterrence theory, not yet addressing cyber? When we think about now multiple nations that both China and the PRC with peer capabilities from a nuclear perspective, how does, it, how does that change our approach? With game theory being a two-actor game, yes. we, have, we now have a multi-actor game. So there's a number of things where we, we start with that foundational understanding of, of game theory that now we do attempt to apply it different in different parts of our strategic theory that no longer really are representative of the environment we're in. So there is an opportunity for us to really be thinking about what are the implications? And, and when we think about is, is deterrence in cyberspace a possibility, given the environment that we're in today and what it already means for the activity in cyberspace? And, and how much of that needs to be thought through, not a cyber versus cyber lens, but really a whole of nation and, and a response to an activity in cyberspace that we feel is, puts a threat to our national security or national security of an ally, um, or is so outside the bounds of international law that it requires a response. Those are areas that we have to explore, likely through a new lens, not through the lens of our past, because they may, not, they may no longer apply. Great. I mean, I think one, one other thing, we talked, we talked, we spent some, I mean, there were a lot of questions about critical infrastructure, and uh, we talked about that, and the possibility of disruption, and then um, how to think about that, and how to partner with the private sector. Um, there's a whole other dimension that, uh, of course, is a whole new um, area of conflict that now has to do with, like, uh, influence operations, or in military defense information operations where we are thinking about strategic coordinated effects uh, carried out to shape opinions, belief, uh, misinformation of target audiences towards a specific goal um, or agenda. And of course, that's the, that seems to be a significant area of growth um, for adversaries. 
So can you give us a little bit, can you discuss about the relationship between inference or information operations and cyber operations, and how important are these operations to national security? Yeah, I, I, would, I think that largely information operations are foundational for every operation that the, that the department will do going forward. We have to be thinking about the information environment component of those activities. And I think we saw it again in, in Russia, Ukraine. The, the fact that the United States you, we really used sensitive intelligence to be able to demonstrate to the world what we believed Russia was going to do, when they were going to do it, to really set the tone of this is what it needs to be for the international dialogue. That was in and of itself a strategic uh, use of information to be able to drive support for an ally. Um, the other aspects, I think, from a military perspective that we need to be thinking about, how are we preparing our force for the likely, their likely involvement in a conflict, and what will the information operations look like targeting our military force? Mm. How well are we prepared for that? Is that mm. an area that commanders talk about, that if they're gonna receive messages that are personalized on their own devices, um, those are things we need to be thinking about how we prepare. But it's not just within a military environment. I think we have seen some shifts in the cyber crime uh, world that have already moved to information operations that not just ransomware and holding things at risk, but hacking and extracting information that is now held as a coercive tool for a ransom that is really about the disclosure of information. Mm. So it's not just a, a, and something that is within a military domain or between nations. This could be very personal for any business in, in, uh, in the Western society that's targeted by an actor and coerced based off of a hacking activity that would disclose information that would either be uh, embarrassing or lose some form of competitive advantage. So it's, it's a part of our daily lives, and it's certainly going to be a part of military activities moving forward. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. election defense. Now, obviously, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have an election coming in the fall. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, election defense operations and how they've changed over the years and specifically, you know, how are you thinking about um, securing um, the ability for the United States to have uh, fair and proper elections um, in the fall? So from a uh, Department of Defense perspective, we have a very clear assigned mission. So the Secretary of Defense uh, in 2018 assigned to Cyber Command and NSA the role to be thinking about foreign threats outside the United States that would attempt to impact our elections. Mm. And so with that, there's a, a, a series of things that are expected from us. How do we understand the threat environment? And how do we communicate that to all of our national security partners? And then if there's a potential for cyber threats to our elections or our election process, how do we get that information to the right individuals? So for us, that means how do we partner with the FBI, how do we partner with DHS uh, as the lead federal agency that is responsible for election infrastructure? Um, how do we get to them that information that could get to states, to local, and to tribal individuals that are executing our elections? So we're thinking about foreign threat. And, and those threats, I think we have seen evolve uh, since 2018 to now our fourth election cycle that we have been a part of the national security team defending our elections. And from our perspective, we really think about it in the same way we think about anything else. How do we generate insights about foreign threats? How do we enable defense from those activities? And then how do we ensure that we're being a part of the team that is making it more difficult to them to operate and impose costs? Uh, so I certainly think we have seen in, in the entirety of this environment a change in the technology. And I think for this cycle, the area that um, we are wanting to inform that threat is, is uh, one of those is around generative AI. So I'd like to pivot in the, in the remaining uh, few minutes that we have towards uh, the role that um, education, higher education can play uh, in advancing this agenda. Um, one aspect um, has to do with talent. And uh, talent, uh, really, on one hand, there's, a tech, there, there, there's the technical or tech, uh, the, the engineering talent. By some estimates now, 
Uh, China is producing seven times as many engineers as the United States. Um, obviously, that starts in K to 12 already. But what is it? What what can the educational sector, including universities, do to create the talent and then also make sure that um, that there's a pipeline of students that are interested potentially uh, in a career um, uh, in cyber or at the NSA? And, and how do we make sure that we you know can compete against the you know the salaries uh, that can be paid by the private sector? Tell us a little bit about the talent pipeline and how we can be helpful in this, in this context. So, so first I'll start like within our organizations, because I think there are things we control within our organizations. One of those is culture, and it's about how we really give hard problems that have consequence to a, a really talented group of leaders, both in Cyber Command and NSA. Um, in, and what we, we want to ensure is that it, we're bringing the best talent in, giving them those hard problems, and then really we're not gonna match them dollar for dollar, but we do wanna make sure that they are getting benefits to the maximum extent that we can. We get great support from Congress and the Department of Defense to be able to do that. Uh, within Cyber Command, we're a growing organization. Um, that's an area for us as we set the culture uh, of Cyber Command. We certainly win with people, and we want to be able to offer opportunity, not just for those cyber operators on a keyboard, but we need acquisition professionals that can lead and build capability that will allow our nation to be better defended. So that's a different set of talent that we want to bring in. Um, the areas that we want to partner with, how do we leverage our relationship with all of the universities that both in NSA and Cyber Command that we have relationships with? And be able to give hard problems to work together. I was excited by the things that your team is working here and looking at how we do malware analysis, how we look at generative AI and spear phishing, and how do we develop counters for that. Those are exciting things that when you, when you magnify those across 400 universities, but we should have a number of problems solved and be able to entice people to this type of work. So I think that's one. The area we can probably collaborate together on is how do we collaborate on curriculum? Like, how do we bring back through our academic partnerships our perspective on curriculum and also through those bodies that are going to evaluate curriculum and, and going to um, approve certain degree programs? How, how could we help lend a voice that accelerates the change that's necessary in that curriculum to remain viable for those national security problems? And then how do we collaboratively all across the nation, both industry, academia, and government, do activities that bring youth, particularly within schools or in summer camps, to be able to be introduced to STEM and, and these type of activities earlier. We participate, we have, uh, NSA runs a series of NSA generational camps, cyber gen camps, uh, with a number of universities. We see that as foundational. And then we want to partner with any uh, 501C or any other element that's out there that is doing STEM education. An example of that is Cyber Patriot, that has 5,000 teams competing across the United States um, to, to um, do cyber challenges. We're going to capture them as early as possible, not necessarily to all come into national security, but our nation needs to close that gap. Final question is on, is on uh, research and hard problems. So what are the wicked problems that keep you awake at night? And then we have, a, we have a group of very talented people in here, including you know, some of our very best faculty. What should they be working on? So, so I think when we think about the future, so when we're, what does it look like in terms of the challenges that are in front of us? An area that, like, that is at our core. So from an NSA perspective, we make code and we break code. That's the core of, of what NSA does. What is behind that is compute. And so as compute continues to evolve, how are we posturing the national security community to ride that wave, right? That's an example of a wave that we're now catching instead of our history, which is we were in front of. And it's one that is changing rapidly, and we have to leverage every little bit of our authorities that we have in both NSA and Cyber Command to make sure that we're still on top of that wave. And doing that in partnership with academia, with industry, in ways that we haven't done in the past. And so I think that's one really good example. I think our other example is, for us, how do we as NSA and Cyber Command capture the talent that we have and the ability where I think we can ride those waves? How can we help the department 
be in that wake, mm. right? It's a large organization that has many challenges in terms of keeping, we have capability that we are sustaining that is 50 years old in an environment that we want to make a zero trust architecture. Like those challenges, there are others that are dealing with the same things throughout industry and through local, when we think about our local critical infrastructure. How do we secure that? And how do we do it in a way that doesn't require everyone to physically rip out every device when we know we're not gonna be able to afford that? So I think how we think about cybersecurity uh, is an environment for us where we can do that together and thinking about not just if you have a perfect environment, but the dirty environments we all live in, how do we make them uh, less targetable by a nation like China? Well, General Hawk, thank you again for joining us today and for being part of a broad, wide-ranging, informative, and candid conversation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Chancellor Diermeyer and General Hawke, for a fascinating conversation. I think the comment about the fact that America is now having to not so much make the waves as in the past, but learn to surf the waves, is a very powerful way of capturing the message of a lot of today's discussions. Now, we're going to take a very quick 10-minute break, since we are ahead of schedule, just to let you stretch your legs. But please, please, please make sure you're back in your seats at 950 because there's going to be a very important panel discussion about China and how to make sense of China's geopolitical and socio-economic landscape. So please, very quick 10-minute break, and then we are going to go into the next panel discussion. So please be back for that at all costs. Thank you.
Well, he hello everyone. Can you please take your seats as quickly as possible because we have a truly fascinating panel next. I think we need a bit of military discipline to get everyone back quickly. Okay, well, let's get started with the next panel. Um, as you just heard from that fascinating conversation with General Hawke, China is top of the list of the um, perceived threats to the US right now. But one of the things that I notice as I go around with my Financial Times hat on and talk to investors and business leaders and policymakers around the world is that there is a profound sense of confusion, bafflement, uncertainty about what on earth is actually happening inside China. The country seems to be simultaneously transparent and also extremely opaque, not just in terms of its military intentions, but also its economy and the socioeconomic developments. So we're now going to have a panel discussion which is going to dive into what exactly is really happening inside China with a group of people who are extremely well qualified to talk about that. And I'm going to start off by handing over to the moderator, Raymond Friedman, who's the Professor of Management at the Owen Graduate School of Management here at Vanderbilt University, who has been um, an expert on issues ranging from labor relations to negotiation, dispute resolution, the management of diversity, and cross-cultural differences between Chinese and American managers. I think that means he's an ex expert cross-cultural translator. So, over to you, Professor Freeman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to start by introducing four amazing speakers we have here for you today, and I'll give you a brief introduction to each. Uh, Dave Frederick is the Assistant Deputy Director for China National Security Agency. He sets agency-wide strategy for addressing the PRC and before he was executive director of US Cyber Command. Welcome. Uh, Mary Gallagher uh, is Lowenstein Professor of Democracy and Human Rights at University of Michigan, expert in politics, law, and society in China, and author of many books, including Contagious Capitalism, Globalization, and the Politics of Labor in China. Welcome. Andre Guinan, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science here at Vanderbilt. Uh, and a fellow, and he, he has been a nuclear security fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and a fellow at the NATO Defense College. He studies international security, deterrence, and international alliances. Welcome. And lastly, Hannes Hanso, the Estonian ambassador to China. Previously, he served as Estonia's defense minister and was a member of the European Parliament and, repre and helped represent the EU in China and Mongolia. Welcome, everybody. So the goal uh, of this panel is to get uh, a set of basic understanding uh, laid out for, for understanding a context, for understanding later discussions on more specific topics later in the, in, the, in the conference. I have three buckets in mind that I'm going to go through. One is going to be internal social and economic situation in China. The second one is looking at China's economic and military relations external to China. Um, and with the rest of the world. And third, the, the big issue that people talk about, Taiwan. So those are the three big buckets that I uh, plan to cover. And I'd like to start uh, looking internally at what we know in, in, about the economy and society in China. And I'd like to start with Professor Gallagher and Ambassador Hanso to discuss this aspect of China. And Professor Gallagher, I'll start by asking you to update you know, with the current understanding of the economic situation in China um, and it's thought to be challenging at best right now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to, uh, there's a, a number of different clocks, so I think there's no way I'll go over my, my allotted five minutes. Um, I wanna start by talking a bit about the current economic and social situation, but necessarily going back to the pre-COVID era and then what happened to China 
during zero COVID. Um, and I think it's the combination of those, those two things that really matter in understanding what is happening in Chinese, the Chinese economy today and what Xi Jinping is saying about the Chinese economy, because it's really important to listen to what he's saying about the economy. Um, at the same time, I want to argue really strongly against the notion that this is peak China, which has been advanced in the media recently, um, which might be the case really from a purely GDP growth standpoint. It might be that these are the highest growth rates that China will see, um, the, the growth rates it saw 10 years ago, um, and that the Chinese economy uh, may never in some way catch up to the United States. But I don't actually think that's the most important metric to think about right now. I think the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions for China are arguably intensified because of slowing growth, um, not reduced. China's growth has been slowing for the past decade. This was recognized as a necessity as China tried to wean itself off of um, growth uh, in the mid to 20, 2008 around the global financial crisis as it started to try to wean itself off of this reliance on government investment that it had relied upon once the, the crisis happened and exports started to decline in importance. Uh, of course, more recently, heavily also dependent on uh, the property sector. This reflects a long-standing desire to transition China's growth model away from this investment from the government and real estate towards what has been called high-quality growth, innovation in new centers, dual circulation, and to some degree towards domestic consumption. I see 2021 as a critical year um, in this progression of thinking about how China's economy will change because it was that moment when Xi Jinping saw China uh, as the most successful country in managing the pandemic. And he was quite confident about China's superiority, um, not just in controlling COVID, but also in, um, in this battle for new types of um, technologically driven growth. Uh, looking around other countries around the world that were still struggling to operate, dealing with shortages, and dealing with the pandemic. Uh, in 2021, he launched his most ambitious programs uh, and, and uh, ideologies to address these long-term goals. He talked about common prosperity as a, as a goal of reducing inequality, of uh, shifting to domestic consumption, of expanding the welfare state, um, uh, new types of taxation, crackdowns on what he called disorderly capital. Um, this led to a lot of speculation that Xi Jinping was finally moving forward towards some significant structural reforms in the Chinese economy. But the way it was done with these big announcements and big speeches and uh, campaigns unleashed also a lot of fear and a lot of loss of confidence in China's business community. This was then exacerbated by what happened afterwards as zero COVID was extended well beyond its usefulness, leading to harsh and inhumane lockdowns across many Chinese cities, most especially Shanghai in the spring of 2022. These crackdowns broke the spirit of China's entrepreneurial classes, surprised urban elites that they could bear the brunt of the government's ruthlessness and that their rights of movement could be so extremely curtailed. This led, of course, in November 22 to what was called the blank paper protest movement, in which protesters very quickly focused not on local governments, which is usually the case, not on local corruption, but on Xi Jinping himself and on calls for him to step down, which is something I have actually never seen happen in Chinese protests, at least that quickly. Now, the blank paper protest movement was very short-lived, and many people who participated were severely punished, but it did have the effect of getting rid of zero COVID once and for all. So the ambitions of 2021 were dashed. His moves to crack down on tech led to a rout for some of China's most successful companies like Alibaba. And Western economies, including the United States, began to recover and recover better than most expected. 2022 also revealed the government's shocking lack of preparation for an exit strategy from COVID and re reiterated fears that Xi Jinping's information environment might be so severely damaged by his encirclement by yes men and underlings so that he may not truly understand um, the extent of the economic uh, crisis nor um, what would happen after uh, zero COVID ended. So what does this tell us about Xi Jinping's leadership and his role in dictating the economy? I would argue it's really a pattern of failure. 
It's a part of a series of announcements and proclamations from 2013 that have not gone well or gone as expected. So he's made a lot of promises. He's done a lot of announcements uh, as, as uh, China's unparalleled leader, um, but he has yet to deliver. And I think what that means is that there's a crisis of confidence in China's governance model. Um, and this is, you can see, in things like the stock market or, or in uh, the way in which the business community is reacting, as well as the continued uh, desire of Chinese students to go to other um, countries like the United States for higher education. It's also why we see this current situation now where we see Xi Jinping so, focus so close, closely on the bright spots in the Chinese economy, hoping that these bright spots will change the narrative. So what's happened since then is that the third plenum was never held. This was the plenum expected at the end of 2023, um, announcing new changes to economic policies. So there's nothing new on the economy or there's disagreement internally or uh, Xi Jinping is just simply not willing to talk about bad news. Um, China's current pursuit now, which is to double down on new productive forces, what, what, the new slogan is new productive forces, Previously, it was made in China. Previously, it was innovation or um, uh, high-quality growth. Um, and I think this is really interesting because it's very effective, actually, for scaring the bejesus out of people in the United States and Germany, in particular, around electric vehicles. Um, and it, but it actually does very little for addressing China's domestic problems, which are structural in nature. But she, this is also, I think, telling about Xi Jinping himself. He believes very strongly in the appearance of confidence in order to create confidence when it doesn't exist. So you see doubling down on these sectors, and so investment is actually not going down. It's just shifting from uh, infrastructure and the property sector to manufacturing um, to create this, um, this, this um, you know, focus on things that are do going very well and also uh, using that to mobilize uh, competition with the West. Uh, and this is really smart. I mean, it actually instills nationalism and pride in China's population around the areas that China is doing well in. It may work to help to rebuild support for himself as the leader. Um, so he's doing the right thing by advancing and promoting these industries that are now being threatened by the West through tariffs, of course, from the United States, um, an investigation in the EU on, um, on Chinese subsidies. The problem for Xi, of course, is that these sectors are not significantly big to address the deeper structural issues of the Chinese economies. So to conclude, I want to say this is also a problem for the West. These policies of exclusion that the West has currently taken with China's um, uh, new industries could reinforce his power unite the private sector and citizens with him, when in fact there is a real opportunity to divide them by being more open strategically to Chinese investment at a time when the environment at home in China is not good either politically or economically. Of course, this poses some risks, and these risks are talked about a lot in the US media and among US politicians, risks of you know, communist infiltration or risks of the theft of intellectual property. Um, but I think this is a risk worth taking as a way to preserve the US's reputation as a haven for smart, hardworking, entrepreneurial people from China or from any other place around the world. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I did actually go too long. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was great. Um, so, um, Hannes, I'd like to ask you to, to uh, you've lived in China for a long time. You're, you're on the ground there. What do you see going on in, in social issues in China? Um, we talked about some of them on the phone earlier. What are the key things that we, we all need to be aware of? Thank you. Uh, the first time I went to China was in 1994, uh, and since then, once a decade at least, I have had a period, several years or more, uh, that I've spent in China. So I've seen this country uh, developing over the sort of 30-year uh, uh, period. Um, there's enormous challenges that are faced, uh, the Chinese government, the Chinese nation, uh, is facing at the, uh, at the moment. The period of the sort of rapid growth that we all grew used to uh, is gone. Also the period when foreigners were, as investors, as people uh, were welcome to China, is gone. Um, just as a side remark, um, I always like to go out in Beijing in the evening if I have a chance. 
And what I find these days very often is you go and sit down in some nice corner restaurant and um, local people are having the food and drink and maybe more drink and at some point you know, they will want to come across and where are you from? I say I'm from Estonia. Okay, you're not from, uh, you're not from the US, come and join us for drinks. That really happens as a pattern here. Yeah. They first check you if you're an American. If not, then cool. Um, so this is a new thing. This is a new thing in, uh, in China. Uh, so the legitimacy that was formed, uh, I think, uh, for the CCP and different uh, presidents or prime ministers of China is slowly uh, giving way to uh, skepticism because uh, people really see very little prospect Many are voting uh, with their feet, our embassies literally, 50 meters across from the US uh, visa section. And I see these young people, Chinese people, in their thousands. It takes about six months to get a number to be in that queue uh, to apply for a visa. Uh, and and, and uh, about 300,000, I think, come to study here in a year. Another 150,000 will go to Australia, 100,000 to, uh, to the UK and, and Canada and, and so many other. Uh, places. So um, there is a skepticism. Foreign investors are skeptical uh, leaving the country, uh, moving uh, out, many to Vietnam, many to other Southeast Asian uh, destinations. Um, but you asked about the social problems, what I see. Um, youth unemployment is very high. Uh, in June uh, 2023, uh, the Chinese government, when the numbers reached 21%, that's officially, uh, and it's important to emphasize officially, 21% uh, then the Chinese government simply stopped uh, uh, producing the statistics. So they recalculated the formula, uh, so now it's again 14%. But in fact, of course, everybody knows that in rural areas it's about 40%. And if you uh, consider underemployment or part-time employment, it's 50%. Recently I took my family out to Yunnan province in southern China, and I saw these people from Guangdong province working in a, in a, in a hotel. Volunteering, they told me. I said, why? Because they're from Shenzhen, you know, the industrial IT hub of, of China. They're from Shenzhen, but uh, they're volunteering because they get food and they get uh, free board. They're there because there's no work. These are, the, these are things that you see in your everyday life when you talk to people uh, in China. So, um, about one in five of 100 million Chinese, 100 million Chinese between the ages of 16 and 24 were unemployed like last summer. You see Guaidis, these couriers, they, they, they wear blue or yellow or green in, in Beijing and all the other cities in China, the couriers. You know, many of them are highly educated young people, but they have simply nothing else to do. So that's one problem, youth unemployment and very few prospects to enter a labor market. A uh, previous speaker already mentioned property crisis, but uh, the, uh, the seriousness or the the, the, the scale of this is just absolutely staggering. Um, about 80 million properties have been built in China. Uh, they are half built or built, but uh, they stay vacant. You could sleep 400 million people in those, more than the entire population of uh, the United uh, States. Uh, so those large companies, some of them have become very prominent, uh, and I think you've heard of those too. Country Garden, Evergrande Group, I mean, they go like 300 billion US in debt uh, before they go bankrupt. Many of them have, uh, have um, ratings, you know, uh, junk ratings now, those companies. Because the Chinese, uh, they're people who have the, by far the highest uh, savings ratio, savings income uh, ratio in the world. And where do people say, uh, invest traditionally? There's no sort of social system uh, like we are used to in many Western countries, at least in, in Europe, pension system. So people who used to invest, and they invested in property. So 70% of the uh, family investments are tied up in property. And when I take a train inside China, um, you see the, uh, you, you, you go past these ghost towns between Shanghai or Beijing or any other, any other big city. I mean, it's just, Huge sky rises have been put up on simply the fields. There's no windows, structures are there, um, empty shells, no cars, no people, nothing. So this has gone wrong on a colossal scale. I mean, as I said, our embassy in the US, embassy and neighbors in Beijing, and you know, I often go for a run, and within about one kilometer, 
If you know where to look, you'll see those huge houses, simply no lights on at night. They're empty, no one there. Uh, so, and local governments, they, they have now reached this financial crisis too because they used to depend on selling land to developers. It seemed to be everlasting, you know, you could just infinitely do it. Uh, now, no more money is coming in. Uh, COVID, you know, the local governments really, municipalities, municipalities spent huge amounts of money trying to enforce this zero COVID. There's no, no money coming in. Uh, and uh, so there are huge structural problems within the Chinese financial system. Now, richer provinces are asked to uh, compensate or, or subsidize the, the poorer ones, especially in the north, there are huge difficulties. So, I mean, they turn off the streetlights at night because there's no money. So that's another difficult issue. And of course, population decrease. Um, everybody knows about one China policy. This was lifted more than 10 years ago. Two, ch new, two children were allowed, then now three. But the Chinese people are not having children. As simple as that. To 2022, the population decreased by 850,000 people. It doesn't look much, you know, with a country of 1.4 billion, but it will grow exponentially. So 2.06 million, and that's again official statistics. Some say that the real numbers are much worse. Uh, so it will grow, continue growing um, by the turn of the century, and that's by Shanghai Social Sciences Academy. Could, China could have a population of 1.75, uh, sorry, 575 million people only. You know, there are different statistics. So population is aging, you know, average age uh, is reaching almost 80 years soon. So how many working people will you have per uh, a retiree, so quite some serious uh, problems there that you see when you live uh, on the ground in China and when you speak to the people, they don't see you know the future too, being too too bright. Uh, when you listen to the government, of course, it's all fantastic. Uh, ambassadors are invited to uh, National People's Congress opening ceremony. Uh, so one just took place in, in um, at the end of March. Um, I attended the opening ceremony. And this is quite some sight, you know, the Prime Minister is speaking, and there are 3,500 3, people, the delegates, they all turn, it's a written text, everybody has a copy, so they all turn the page at the same time. 3,500 people turning this page at the same time. It's deafening, the, 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 the sound that it makes in this uh, huge hall. And you, you hear those, uh, you know, those speeches from the Prime Minister, everything is good. So, but there is a gap between, I think, what people see on the ground and what you hear at these sort of uh, events that I just mentioned. Thank you very much. Those are amazing insights from on the ground in, in China. Um, I'd like to switch direction to look outside of China. And, and with that, I want to switch to uh, David and talk about what he sees as the main kind of uh, category of threats we have. Uh, coming from China as they reach around the world, uh, economically, uh, militarily. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm still kind of shocked at the ambassadors, some of the points you made, so uh, so I have to collect my thoughts here. Uh, but uh, thank you for sharing that. It really, really, really kind of sobering. Um, you know, when I, when I look at kind of global reach uh, for the PRC, um, and what they're doing to kind of extend their influence and, and power. Um, you know, I'll focus uh, initially uh, on kind of the military, the military aspect of that, but I do want to touch on the informational and, and kind of economic forms power in, in a moment as well. Uh, but when you look at extended reach and kind of, kind of look out beyond, uh, you know, the cross straits uh, focus uh, that the PLA has, um, at the, I'll talk about kind of at the global level and at the regional level. So at the global level, you know, the, the longest arm uh, of the People's Liberation Army is definitely in cyberspace. And uh, General Hawk uh, talked about that extensively in his remarks, so I, I won't kind of belabor that and repeat too much, but uh, can't, can't kind of overstate the seriousness of what they're doing in terms of pre-positioning, attack capability, and critical infrastructure, and, and how different it is uh, from how, uh, you know, responsible Western military, uh, military forces would, would operate, right? And they're, they're really moving to, to establish, you know, a, a capability to, to conduct real indiscriminate attacks uh, to, to, to sow chaos and, and disorder. So that's really concerning. Um, kind of moving out of the cyberspace uh, discussion for a moment, uh, you know, when you look at the investments they're making in both their uh, outer space, their counter space capabilities, missiles and nuclear, 
it is also an area there where they can kind of reach out uh, and, and affect you know the United States directly. And so, uh, China is investing significantly in their space capabilities and in their um, in their counter space capabilities. And they've they've uh, deployed a whole range of of attack platforms, everything from direct ascent missiles to uh, co-orbital satellites that can attack uh, U.S. satellites uh, to electronic warfare and, and directed energy weapons. And so. Uh, that's that's an important important aspect that, that we're looking at uh, in the Department of Defense from a national security standpoint. Um, and, and with that, they've established partnerships uh, in other regions to enable them to operate their space capabilities. And so they've got uh, support bases uh, now located in Pakistan, uh, Argentina, uh, Namibia, and Kenya that are that are critical to their overall space capability. So they really you're really seeing this growth, uh, you know, uh, in terms of in expansion of their focus uh, well beyond. Uh, their local region. Um, and then and another area, I think, is their regional uh, posture. And, you know, uh, China is, is slowly building out uh, their regional uh, basing and logistics infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, they've normalized kind of their participation in, in uh, a military presence uh, in, uh, through their operations they're doing in the Gulf of Aden in terms of anti-piracy patrols. And uh, certainly they're very active in UN peacekeeping. So their military is getting some exposure and developing, you know, uh, partnerships uh, around the world in that context. Um, you know, of course, their, their base in Djibouti is very well known. Uh, and, in, and in 2022, the, the PLA uh, affirmed that they, they will have some access uh, to Cambodia's Ream Naval Base as well, which is an area that, you know, that they've invested, uh, that China's invested heavily in, in Cambodia. Um, so that's, that's something we're watching. And, and you know, the, the U.S. assessment is that they'll, they'll continue to, most likely continue to look for additional places to grow military logistics and basing infrastructure. And, and if successful, uh, that will start to put some constraints and risks for U.S. military operations, right? It'll, it'll definitely create a complicating factor there. So, uh, you know, that's, that's an area, th those are kind of the key areas we're looking at kind of the global, global and regional scale uh, in terms of the, the PLA. We'll note that, you know, the foundation of national security power really is in the economic and ideological front. And, um, you know, I think in that space, uh, the PRC has got, it's, they've seen mixed results. Uh, and I think the, the, our other speakers have already hit on that. But, you know, they, they certainly are trying to uh, offer a, a completely different model um, of, you know, ideological and informational model uh, to, the, to the world and especially, you know, pushing that in the global south. Um, but, but, you know, re really kind of mixed mix success in that space. Um, there, a 2022 Pew Research uh, survey of, of global respondents indicated only 18 percent believe that Xi Jinping would do the right thing in terms of world affairs. So uh, not, not, a great, not a great look in that context. Um, and then on the, uh, on the economic space, certainly a Belt and Road Initiative ran into some headwinds. And, uh, and you know, post-COVID, they've, they've launched the Global Development Initiative to try to kind of reboot those efforts. But you know, that economic power, you know, where they're successful, will kind of open up additional doors for them. Uh, but what, what we've seen is uh, you know, countries are, st are starting to become very concerned about economic coercion. Uh, and there's so many examples of that, ranging from uh, uh, the efforts they did against Australia uh, uh, around questions about the origins of COVID uh, to, um, uh, you know, kind of economic punishment to, on Lithuania, Norway, and others, you know, South, South Korea and others. And so I do think nations are starting to wrestle with that reality and when they look at their economic partnerships with the PRC. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask um, Professor Gannon, um, Andre, what effect, what are the possibilities for the West to respond? And what are things that restrict or might influence um, uh, the US, Europe, uh, EU, their ability to respond to the potential threats that are emerging from China? So I think there's two elements that I'd like to discuss. There's the political one and then the sort of military dimension. Uh, on the political dimension, the upcoming election in the United States is an incredibly important one. And I can confidently say that every April for the rest of my life. Uh, but I think the point sort of largely stands for this one in the context of China. In a poll that was conducted last month in the United States, they asked respondents, what is the biggest threat to the United States? 41% uh, of respondents said China. 24% said Russia which is really interesting given what we have in the conventional sort of news headlines. What I find more interesting was what happens when we break this out by party affiliation, where for Republicans, 67% of them said China and only 10% said Russia. And for Democratic respondents, it was something like 42% that said Russia and only 20% of them said China. 
5% of independents said the United States itself, which I'll leave as a future commentary. Um, but I think what this really points to is it tells us something about what the upcoming election and who wins that election in both, the, in both Congress and the presidency will say about what U.S. priorities are in the world. I think this both has to do with the geographic dimensions of it. Is China where we're putting our resources or are we still trying and failing to pivot away from the Middle East? How much will things that happen with Russia and Ukraine continue? Is there a way out? And the elections will change the way that the United States is able to allocate those resources differently across its departments. Uh, and so I think that that's something that has a big dimension. I think there's also a big difference that that upcoming election will have in terms of just how far does U.S. national interest extend? Uh, and I think this is a really, really foundational question that underlies most of the conclusions that we come to as policymakers or practitioners or, or academic researchers, but I don't think we think about it enough. Uh, why is it that events that are happening regarding China and Taiwan matter to Americans, however that is defined? Uh, what about issues in the Middle East, about issues with Russia and Ukraine, about supply chains? And there's different ways of saying that these things are or are not salient to the US national interest, but that's something that the decisions that are made from those assumptions are ones that are gonna matter greatly in terms of what happens in the, the upcoming election and so forth. Uh, on the security dimension, over the past 25 or 30 years, what was hyped a lot was that we've entered the missile era. Uh, we had you know, the use of, or the development of nuclear weapons during the Cold War, the ability to target any spot that existed on the world. From the Gulf War onwards, we saw this actually happening in a conventional sense, where you saw wars being fought where the uh, bloodshed by the person that is doing the attacking is very, very low. We're just lobbing very heavy pieces of metal at one another. And the idea has been that that's how we're going to see warfare being fought. We had discussions earlier today about how we're seeing that with the use of drones. What I think is really interesting that some people have sort of talked about in the past week, and it's too soon to tell, but this missile era is now maybe being transformed into a missile defense era where we no longer have the idea that the Earth is flat and that everywhere can be targeted. What was seen as a pie in the sky idea about shooting a bullet with a bullet 15 or 20 years ago, turns out that we're pretty good at it. And I think we're a lot better than we thought. I think that this dramatically changes the degree to which countries think that uh, defending Taiwan or defending Ukraine or getting involved in the Middle East means physically being in the region versus the degree to which it means you can just sort of step back and lob things from far away. Uh, and I think that this was a large part of why the United States was sort of beefing up its relationship with Australia. Part of the AUKUS agreement was there's a Goldilocks effect there geographically. They're not as close as Japan and South Korea and being in the fire zone of you know, potential missiles and being vulnerable, but they're not so far away that it becomes expensive and difficult to do. And I think that's a calculation that we see is, is changing. Uh, and so I think that when I've seen you know, wargaming exercise that I've participated in for what would be the role of the United States military and other security apparatuses in conflict with China, it's really hard to tell now. Uh, what areas of the world are relevant for the United States military? Can this be fought from 2,000 miles away? Or what does sort of invasion of crossing the strait actually mean for the role that other actors play? Uh, and so I think that that's different now than it was 10 years ago, maybe even different now than it was two weeks ago. Uh, and so I think that replanning how we think about the role of geography and a military sense uh, is continuing to evolve, not even to mention the cyber sense of bits and bytes can travel pretty quickly, uh, but does it matter if they're trying to go 4,000 miles as opposed to, to just down the street? Uh, and so I think that these are the types of considerations that policymakers should be considering. Well, thank you. That brings us right to Taiwan, the, the, the next bucket I wanted to focus on. And just to, to level set, I just make a, a quick set of comments on kind of the history and how we got here. Um, you know, historically, Taiwan was, was controlled by Dutch, Chinese, Japanese in different points in time. 1949, of course, Nationalist Party uh, retreats uh, uh, to Taiwan after losing to the Chinese Communist Party, initially claiming to rule all of China uh, and maintaining martial law. Uh, it finally moved to a democracy in uh, 1996, the first presidential elections in Taiwan, and they gave up the pretense of having uh, controlling and ruling all of China. Uh, but there still was a one-child policy that everyone kind of uh, cooperatively agreed to as a way to have a fiction that would just keep things calm, and no one was much worrying about resolving it very quickly. Uh, but Xi Jinping uh, has been pushing for a much more immediate resolution, uh, and, and things have become much more tense. In the meantime, Taiwanese 
uh, very, very few now have a sense of Chinese identity in the way they would have had 40, 50 years ago. And very few, maybe 5%, actually want to be ruled by Beijing. So going in very, very different directions. Um, you know, the, the foundational question, I, I think, to ask is, why should we care about Taiwan? There's a lot at stake, uh, a lot of tactical questions, a lot of concerns. But what is it that, that drives the concern with Taiwan? Um, I can see questions about morality and freedom, democracy, philosophy, um, geopolitical ones, you know, alliances and credibility. I can see uh, economic ones, uh, you know, shipping lanes and chips. But I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with, with Hannah, Hannah's uh, talking about you know, the perspective from the Baltic. So you have a unique history with uh, some strong reaching out uh, to uh, Taiwan and, and a special relationship maybe with Taiwan. What is it that for you that makes Taiwan so important? I think the main concern or one of the, sort of the biggest concerns from the Beijing point of view uh, is that when we look at the region uh, in a little bit of a historic perspective, you know, Japan started as a very authoritarian state gradually, gradually with economy developing, uh, shifted into a democratic society. The same thing, again, through a very heavy authoritarian uh, phase, uh, South Korea, with economy developing, it became a, a competitive democratic uh, uh, country, and so did Taiwan. So I think it's uh, probably, in a way, like existential issue for the authoritarian China now, uh, because it's a role model, I think, a vibrant role model for many Chinese, you know, to look at. And uh, I think even the repressions that we have seen in Hong Kong may, may explain, you know, why China is so sensitive about showing mainlanders that the Chinese people can live in freedom and uh, democracy. So we, you know, after 50 years plus of Soviet occupation, of course, feel very strongly uh, emotionally about these sort of nations, these sort of uh, uh, people. Uh, we know what it means uh, ourselves. Yeah, so traditionally, I mean, I have been a member of parliament. You know, we, we have not had a parliament, I don't think, that where there's been no uh, friendship group for Taiwan. There is one uh, now also. And uh, now, uh, as a civil servant, as a government representative in China, of course, it's one of the issues that I'm often uh, called to MFA to explain. Again, uh, our members of parliament like to go to Taiwan, uh, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and what's particularly irritating for the Chinese is that three Baltic states often do these things uh, uh, together. So also the you know, Taiwanese foreign minister, Joseph Wu, was in, uh, in Tallinn and uh, Riga and in Vilnius uh, last year. So it's one of the irritants that is between our countries, but our people simply feel very strong uh, sympathy uh, to the types of situations such as, tai, uh, such as Taiwan. And of course, you know, uh, the Chinese, they will not, uh, not uh, understand and not appreciate. Um, Lithuania, uh, as you know, was actually expelled in diplomatic terms from China. There is no Lithuanian. Uh, the European Union, we have uh, monthly ambassadors uh, meetings, heads of missions meetings, so there's one country missing for several years now. Because Lithuanians allowed Taiwan to open an office in Vilnius, uh, the capital of Lithuania, under the name of Taiwan. And uh, Chinese reacted uh, really uh, crudely uh, by expelling Lithuanian diplomats. So the issue has not been resolved, even though there have been some attempts to do so, negotiate some sort of a way, uh, way out. But I think for the Chinese, it seems to be uh, the red line. As you know, international recognition of Taiwan is decreasing. You know, one, one or two countries, I think, this year or last year again, has switched the recognition uh, to the People's Republic, so I think China feels super sensitive about that the you know, trend might be reversed somewhere else, for example, uh, in, um, uh, in Europe. But yeah, I think Taiwan, you know, we, we do not support any sort of kinetic uh, resolution uh, to, uh, to this issue, even though geographically Taiwan is very far from us. Economically, we are not dependent in, uh, in any way, but there is an understanding I think that is very prevalent. Yeah. So it's a very personal, emotional kind of uh, uh, connection with the democracy and freedom 
of, of a small country facing... Particularly because of our own background. Yeah. So I'd like to turn to Dave and ask, uh, on a practical, in practical terms, in terms of economics, in terms of military, what, a, what would make you say we should care about what happens to Taiwan? Okay, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would highlight a, a couple of points, and, and I definitely think, you know, the, the moral element of it is, is also at play here. Uh, but, but, uh, but if you look at the kind of the arc of, of U.S. foreign policy, it, we tend to oscillate over time between values-based and real politic. And so I won't make any predictions on where we'll be on the, on the wave uh, at, at any particular time. But, but if you look at it from a values point of view, certainly uh, you're talking about a vibrant democracy. Uh, and uh, I think at times, uh, in times of crisis, uh, the, the U.S. population does kind of recall our role as a beacon on a hill. And uh, so uh, I would be, be hopeful as a private citizen that that would be the case uh, when the time came. Um, you know, our, our policy is obviously purposely ambiguous, uh, which uh, I think adds some value. Um, I, I um, will point to the last time we were in uh, ground combat uh, with China uh, in the origins of the, you know, the, the Korean War, uh, where the U.S. Uh, drew an Akis, that what was called the Akison Line that, that carved out and, and basically uh, highlighted the peninsula of Korea as outside U.S. interests. Uh, which then emboldened uh, the North Korean invasion with support from Mao Zedong and, and Stalin. And so uh, I think those red lines aren't always really helpful, and so understand the amb ambiguity aspect of it. Uh, if, you, if you flip it around and look at the real politic piece, uh, from an economic point of view, um, you know, we, we're very focused, I think, uh, on the economic and kind of technology security nexus. And, um, you know, there's a you know pretty frequently used uh, statement that semiconductors are kind of the new the new oil, and um, you know Taiwan TSMC, you know major producer of semiconductors uh, f for the planet. And so, uh, do we, does the United States want to have uh, that much reliance? You know, if if there was a, a unification between Taiwan and 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 PRC, particularly one that's forced upon the Taiwanese. Do we want to, you know, have a, a situation where we we are now fully, almost fully dependent on, on uh, on on the on the PRC for for semiconductors and advanced technologies? Certainly, there's moves afoot through industrial policy uh, steps to try to try to correct that, but that's not going to be a, you know, short term short term process to turn around. Uh, it certainly has some challenges ahead. I think from a military point of view, um, the the question. Uh, it really gets to how would we expect uh, China to uh, conduct an operation and, and how would they approach it. And, and I'll just turn to what they've written themselves. So if you look at uh, PLA writings and, and their military strategies, uh, they, they've been operating off, uh, to begin with, a doctrine um, uh, called the Three Warfares Doctrine that's about 20 years old now that starts with the idea of you know, really kind of winning, winning combat, you know, winning the war th uh, without any combat. It focuses on shaping public opinion, on lawfare, and psychological operations. And so I think the first step in what they're doing every day, and there's a you know a ongoing contest every day in this already, is the efforts that they're doing to run uh, uh, a range of influence operations, everything from covert to overt, to influence public opinion, uh, both in Taiwan and the United States, but really in the global south and abroad. Uh, to uh, to uh, they they couple that with. Uh, creating national security uh, legal mechanisms that, that tries to change, you know, give them an advantage. And then finally, I uh, do think that they would use psychological operations as part of, an oper part of a broader operation. So that's, I think, a basis for that. Uh, they, they are definitely watching um, the lessons learned, getting lessons learned from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the troubles the Russians are facing and, and how effective U Ukraine has been. <clears throat> Uh, in, in defending their, their territory, and happy to talk about that if time allows. But th that's an interesting element that China is definitely watching that and trying to adjust to that. Uh, but they, they clearly have it, uh, you know, described in their doctrine and strategy uh, intentions to um, have a, a very, very uh, various options available uh, for their leadership. Uh, everything from a coercive model, where they just try to coerce uh, Taiwan to uh, uh, to comply. Uh, to a blockade option, you know, kind of an air and maritime blockade cop, uh, coupled with uh, I.O. and uh, information operations campaign to, you know, what would be a really, really challenging military problem for them, uh, an amphibious landing, right? So a joint island, what they call it, a, a, a joint island landing campaign. Um, 
very difficult military problem for them to pull off. Um, but I think you know history's got many examples of uh, governments deciding to pursue uh, a, a, a policy that may may not even be in their self, best self interest, uh, and certainly uh, you know cases where uh, military victory isn't isn't guaranteed. Uh, could point to many examples of that. So, thanks for the question. All right. Thank you. Um, so, Mary, I'd like to turn to you for a moment and and think about. Um, do you sense any re dynamics politically internal to China that make it more likely or less likely that they might be more aggressive to force the issue militarily? Well, I agree definitely uh, with Dave that the Ukraine war has, has probably made um, at least the Chinese military and the Chinese leadership um, much less um, enthusiastic given um, the problems and the drawn out <coughs> nature of the war. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence that at the beginning, China in, in some ways gave Putin a pass because they believed it would end really quickly and it, and it obviously hasn't. The thing I worry most about um, domestically within China's nationalism, which Xi Jinping has, has ginned up quite a lot, very substantially, um, and as well as um, you know, the elite struggle. I, I, I do worry as we, as we go, through, go on into Xi Jinping's now third term, of course he removed term limits, uh, from his presidency in 2018, um, that doesn't el eliminate the problem of succession and who takes over after him. And um, even though he's surrounded himself by people who are very closely allied with him, um, as he gets into his, you know, the, the fourth and probably fifth term, um, I just can't imagine that we won't see some really significant elite struggle. Um, it wasn't that the problem had been solved previously um, under other administrations, but there had been um, a, you know, kind of a, a weekly um, institutionalized norm that there would be two terms um, and then there would be an administrative change. So all of those things being off the table now, it's very hard to predict when he will leave office, how he will leave office, and who the successor will be and how that successor will be chosen. So I just think that makes things unpredictable and Taiwan is, a, is, a, is, an, is an issue that um, could be used in a, in a domestic elite struggle. Um, the two things more externally that I wanna just point out is that you know the bedrock of Taiwan policy um, abroad has been strategic ambiguity on the part of the U.S. government and a desire for the status quo within Taiwan and, and probably also within the United States. Um, strategic ambiguity seems to be at risk um, in the sense that because of these dynamics and of heightened geopolitical competition with China, um, most presidents recently have shown, I think, a significant shift away from strategic ambiguity. I think uh, President Biden has done this, I believe, four times in his presidency, so it's not just a, a flub. Um, it's probably not just him uh, speaking off the cuff. It, it seems to be a significant shift. Um, I'm less confident that if President, if Trump is elected in the fall, that he will, um, that he will be as as um, as clearly on the side of uh, defending Taiwan that Biden has been, um, and I think that's that's an issue. I also want worry about U.S. public opinion in regards um, if if Trump is president, and we've seen that also with the debate about um, continuing to aid Ukraine, uh, particularly within the Republican Party. The other thing that I just want to point out about, about status quo, which is the Taiwan thing, um, is that the status quo is not static. I mean, it feels static in the sense that there's no change in the status of Taiwan. But from the PRC's perspective, Taiwan is changing quite rapidly, right, in terms of Taiwan identity, in terms of how the government talks about Taiwan, in terms of, as, as opposed to Republic of China, the use of passports and changes on the passport to signal um, a heightened um, separate identity. So we, we talk about the status quo as being something that would bring stability, but to the PRC's perspective, um, this is not something that um, is, is static. It's changing quite rapidly. Thanks. Thank you. So Andre, I'd like to turn to you because we started getting into issues of you know, how the U.S. would respond, their stance, and we have all the parties, um, uh, U.S., China, Taiwan, uh, trying to make calculations, and, and a lot of your work is on deterrence and how people think the other person is going to act and watching um, the behavior and interests of other side. So there's, there's a complex um, mesh of people interpreting signals. What are the signals that either have been sent out or need to be sent out to avoid war, or is that possible? 
I hope it's possible. I, I think it's possible. The conventional wisdom used to be that conflicts were won by the side with more capabilities. During the nuclear era, that shifted to the idea that conflicts were won by the side with higher resolve, who cared more about the issue. And to tie back to the points that David was making about Russia and Ukraine, what we're seeing there, and what I think China is watching there, is what happens when those two things clash. The one of the issues that has made the Russia-Ukraine conflict so challenging and hard to resolve is Russia thought, we have much higher capabilities, this means that we should win. And Ukraine thought, this is existential for us, our resolve is a lot higher, that means that we should win. And those two things were both genuine beliefs that each side held that clashed in a way that now we don't know what to do. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the things that China is looking at there because there's a parallel in the Taiwan situation where China has much more capabilities and for Taiwan, they might believe that this is existential. And so I think one of the things that all actors are looking at rightfully in that situation is how those two things, capabilities and resolve might change. Are there things that China can do to convey this is existential for us as well? And those are the discussions we see about this being a core issue of national identity, what it means to be China as a nation state, and things like that. And on the flip side, there's things that Taiwan is doing to say, we have more capabilities than you think because we have some friends. And that gets to the discussion that Mary was having about the role of the United States and strategic ambiguity and things like that. Uh, and so I think that as China and Taiwan and the United States continue to realize that there's more information that we should be providing about this conflict in ways that'll either make sure that it doesn't break out, or that if it does break out, it goes in our favor, is manipulating the beliefs about the capabilities and resolve that they themselves have and what they believe about that of the other side. Well, and then for, for Taiwan, China, it's as much Taiwan's friend, US, their resolve. And exactly. Perceptions there. Yes. And so that's where the elections come in, you know, wh who is in, in charge of the government, and what public opinion is. Um, I've heard many discussions over, you know, would we, you know, should we, would we go in and fight for Taiwan? Uh, and it would seem to the degree that you, the answer is no, then China would say, well, you know, that, right. that influences our, our actions. Yeah, and I think that, get, that gets a bit just really quick to the technology element that you mentioned. Uh, does China believe that the United States would spend X billion dollars in heavy pieces of metal to lob over the Taiwan Strait? Maybe some amount. How many body bags is the United States willing to risk returning back to the content to the United States to defend Taiwan? That's a very open question. That depends on the election. That depends on what the United States can credibly signal. That depends on what China believes. Uh, and I think that these things matter a lot. Yeah. Hannes? Uh, just a brief uh, comment. I think the Russia-Ukraine war is uh, an uh, important example here. China clearly is looking, but it's not uh, only about uh, Ukraine-Russia on a battlefield. Uh, it's also about the international reaction that followed Russia's aggression against Ukraine. I think it was unexpected for Russia. They really did not believe such a strong uh, reaction. Sanctions, cutting of energy supplies, uh, weapons deliveries uh, all across the board, uh, assistance. I think China is a trading nation. Its economy is completely dependent on uh, exports. So if we can convince People's Republic that its main trading partners, that will be Western countries, the European Union, North America, Australia, New Zealand, um, would take the same, similar, strong position. Uh, I think it would deter uh, China. Yeah. Um, and you know, thinking about you know domestic opinion and um, the idea of strategic ambiguity. Um, there, I've, I've seen debates about whether strategic ambiguity is good to maintain, uh, avoid the red lines or if in terms of signaling, that makes it fuzzy and makes it less clear. Um, is strategic ambiguity something that is time to go, really central? How would we think about that? I've kind of already, I think, said my piece on it, but I, I do agree with, with Andres on the point that, you know, the stakes are incredibly high. And, and um, it's been a long time since it, the United States fought a war that resulted in high levels, high numbers of casualties in a very short amount of time, a long time. 
And you know, Vietnam certainly very. You know, certainly we, we had we lost uh, souls in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, but those are spread out over long, a long period of time. And the numbers of that uh, in those periods, I mean, wouldn't come close to what we would probably see if we got in a full scale conflict with, with with the PLA. And so, uh, I think you really have to go back in terms of compressed loss of life to the Korean War. So I do think that plays into a role of question about U.S. resolve on this. But uh, the Atkinson line example I gave was one of. Uh, you know, uh, lack of ambiguity, uh, the adversary was convinced that we would not, you know, intervene, and we certainly did. So, um, so I, I think it's a, it, it's my view, you know, I, and I'm an intelligence officer, not a policymaker, and I, I'm glad I'm not a policymaker. It's actually a really hard job. <laughs> but um, but I, I can understand the, the benefit of that. But... Um, well, we started off talking about the yeah. domestic weakness economically, uh, socially, in, inside of China, and you can imagine that cutting, you know, two ways, either saying, you know, in times of desperation, you know, find an enemy outside or, you know, they, they need to f take care of, uh, you know, housing, uh, jobs and other things and, and wouldn't risk disrupting the economy further. Um, given, the, you know, the current stresses on the economy in China, does that, um, you know, enhance or diminish some the, the risks we see? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I guess I don't see, um, at least the way that, the, that, that Xi Jinping has been talking about the economy. Um, this is not so much about um, what he would be willing to risk for, uh, for war with Taiwan, but just in terms of what he's been saying about the economy recently and what the, the, the government and the party have been doing about the economy in the last year is they've done actually very little. Um, to revive, uh, you know, to get growth rates higher, to boost consumption, to uh, do more f to make the taxation system less regressive, to do more redistribution, to build up the social safety net. All very, very important things, um, not for, you know, not even really for things like equality, but but rather to, um, to put the Chinese economy on a sure footing, particularly as it's aging really quite rapidly. But they haven't done those things. Um, he has now come out after this announcement of common prosperity that he actually w believes that uh, the welfare state makes people lazy, right? That, that that's not the direction that China's going in. So, um, you know, I think the, the reason why you see this focus on um, what he calls new productive forces, which is really about these sectors where China is doing well, it's solar and semiconductors and electric vehicles, that um, he, he's very old fashioned in terms of how he thinks about the economy. It's really the, this kind of manufacturing base. It's keeping people employed um, in the real economy. And um, it's not about doing much to put it in a, in a, in a, in a different, on a different track. Um, and that makes me then, uh, this is to answer the question about Taiwan, this makes me feel that um, you know, he'd be willing to risk quite a lot. Um, if, it, if it came to um, if it came to uh, conflict with the United States over Taiwan, and just as a related aside about the importance of Taiwan and and U.S. showing resolve, one thing that we haven't mentioned, of course, is that, and this may be why strategic ambiguity is also, I think, less useful, is that um, it's signaling a lot to other allies in the region, right? It's signaling a lot to Japan, a lot to South Korea, and increasingly a lot to the Philippines, which is another. Um, you know, point of, of big contention. Of course, Biden last last week meeting with both and, and the Philippines. So it's not just about um, Taiwan. It's about a whole, you know, range of, of allies. Yeah. yeah. I can briefly add one thing that we haven't seen slow down is the pace of their military modernization. And so, despite the economic headwinds, uh, the PRC is executing a major modernization effort. Uh, they're starting construction of their fourth amphibious assault ship gives us some example of the options they're looking at. And they, they remain focused on a 2027 capabilities goal uh, that Xi kind of reaffirmed at the 20th Party Conference, uh, Congress to have a viable kind of credible military option uh, to force unification by 2027. It's a pretty, pretty ambitious goal, so I won't make your predictions on whether they hit it or not. Uh, but but I do, I, we've been noting that you, didn't, you don't see a slowdown on that or a major effort to, to bring in AI big data and innovation to change the nature of warfare uh, in their forces. All right, I have to end in the last minute with the big question, TikTok, thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> uh, what do we think about the uh, risks um, uh, present or not present in TikTok? 
I don't know about uh, TikTok that much, but uh, just uh, an anecdote. So, uh, you know, um, China is very concerned about the, you know, TikTok being discussed here in the United States and see, being, being seen as a, as a security threat and all this. And the MFA in China tweets about it when this discussion gone. They, they banned uh, Twitter in uh, 2012. So they, they banned US site Twitter on 2012. The MFA still uses it. And then they complain about uh, TikTok being uh, you know, persecuted here in, in the US. Isn't that a paradox? That's very much a paradox. <laughs> well, yeah, and, yeah. just about TikTok, I think the important thing about TikTok is the latent ability of TikTok to, to be used. I don't think it has been used in that regard yet. But, I, you know, the, the, the way in which the Chinese government and the party use social media, um, particularly in the Global South, is a really important thing to pay attention to. Um, my son, who is on TikTok, watched the congressional testimony of the CEO, and he said, that guy looked like a, such a, no, he said the con Congress looked like such jerks asking him questions. And I said, where did you watch the videos? And he said, on TikTok. So. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, thank you very much to, to Hannes, uh, Andre, Mary, and Dave. Thank you very much for your insights. Um, Great to have you here. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for a terrific panel. That was fascinating. And I think in many ways it's great that we actually ended on a specific question of TikTok because it's a nice segue to the next panel, which is going to look at the implications of what the panel has set out about the geostrategic situation for supply chains and the practical um, impact these tensions and these competition and these threats are having for companies and policymakers trying to navigate these supply chains. So before we have that panel, we're going to have a very quick break. Once again, please don't wander off too far because it would be good. Uh, we'd like to have you all back in your seats at 11.15. So we have 20 minutes of break. Please make sure you're back here a bit before 11.15. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, can you please take your seats? Thank you very much indeed for being so obedient, which is what I would expect from a partly military crowd. So, wonderful. Anyway, after that fascinating discussion on what's really happening in China, we're now going to turn, as I said before, from looking at the big picture geostrategic issues to the very practical question of supply chains um, and how those are changing and what it means for both businesses and investors and policymakers and, of course, military and security groups as well. I forgot to mention earlier that this entire session is being live streamed. So it is entirely on the record. So if you do want to record it, a couple of people have asked me if they can, that is absolutely fine. And I should also say, by the way, um, we've not had any beeping from cell phones, but do put your cell phone to silent if you are using one for any reason. So next session is about navigating global supply cha chain challenges, a US-China perspective. And the moderator is Kamal Sagi who is a professor of economics here at Vanderbilt, who spent much of his career looking at the question of trade and economic policy making. Over to you, Professor Sugi. Thank you, Professor Stant. Uh, it's a pleasure. Welcome, everyone, to our channel on global supply chains uh, and navigating those challenges, particularly from a US-China perspective. Uh, I'm an academic. Uh, academic people like roadmaps. Uh, let me give you one, even though it might be a little bit ambitious for what we plan to achieve, hope to achieve uh, in this panel. Uh, we'll begin uh, with a little bit of a discussion about what supply chains are all about and trade, uh, the efficiency that trade can give us versus the risks it can generate for us, uh, and then move on to some specific aspects of national supply chains uh, from a point of view of national security, uh, what risks can arise and how might we deal with them, and then move to a much more of a US-China perspective with those broader discussions and uh, questions in mind, how those, those issues arise in the US-China context, and what might we do about them? Uh, and then there will be some time also uh, for us to take questions from the floor. So I encourage you to participate uh, strongly. Uh, we have an extremely distinguished panel, uh, and they bring a rich experiences and diverse perspectives, which I think is going to be lovely. Uh, so let me introduce them briefly. I'll start at the far end uh, with Jim Desmond, who is the Chief Security Officer at Assurian, uh, right here in Music City. Previously, Jim was the Chief Security Officer at Elevate, a financial technology firm based in Forward, Texas. Jim has over 20 years of experience in technology and security leadership with a primary focus on financial services. Next to him, Jamil Jaffer, uh, who, if you watch YouTube at all, uh, must have uh, seen him multiple times. Okay? Uh, he's the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute and assistant professor of law at George Mason University. Jamil is also director of the National Security Law and Policy Program and the Cybersecurity Intelligence and National Security LLM at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason. Welcome, Jim, and welcome, uh, Jamil. Uh, next, Morgan Adamaski. She's director, Cybersecurity Collaboration Center at the National Security Agency. Morgan is responsible for leading complex and groundbreaking initiatives for NSA cybersecurity, specifically focused on co-creating cybersecurity tradecraft through collaboration with the industry to change the way we secure the nation. I would be remiss if I do not mention something key about Morgan, that like my daughter and wife, she's a Tar Heel. Go Heels. <laughs> yeah, yes, Vanderbilt's great too. Uh, next to me right here, Matt Hartman who is Deputy Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. Previously, Matt served as the Acting Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at CISA, and as an Associate Director who led CISA's Cybersecurity Services Portfolio, including, now this is a mouthful, Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation and the Quality Services Management Office. Welcome, Matt. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, as I said before, I would like to begin with sort of setting the stage about what national supply chains and global supply chains are all about. Why do we have them? So from a trade perspective, you know, this goes back to David Ricardo. Uh, we've always understood why we want to trade with other countries. You know, they produce certain goods at lower cost or more efficiently than we do. 
The traditional example that Ricardo gave was of wine and cloth. Well, we are far away from wine and cloth today. We have complex manufactured goods, but the logic remains the same. If you think about a modern complex manufactured good that has many different components, where do you locate those components, right? So you want to produce them at lowest cost, you find the most efficient locations. Now, as you spread this across the world, um, you open yourself to additional risks, right? So far off events, climactic changes, uh, you know, even COVID-19 taught us new lessons about that. Uh, geopolitical issues, military conflict arising in third countries from where we might source products, and so on. So one way of thinking about it from the economic perspective is this trade-off between efficiency versus risks that you might create, additional risks that you might create by spreading production globally. I'm going to ask Jamil um, to address a, product, a question specifically in this context, which is about, has our perspective on the value of global supply chains changed fundamentally, particularly when the involve trading partners that are thousands of miles away or have very different political systems and objectives compared to the United States. And if you could talk a little bit about the general framing of this issue about how do we think about this. Well, look, I mean, as, I think as a general matter, our, our view has changed, right? In the, in the 90s, right, we were all free traders, right? I'm still a free trader. I still think free trade has dramatically beneficial effects for the United States and for our allies. Um, but we have to recognize that that notion of free trade has to be contextualized by the national security imperatives that we face um, and our trading partners. For a long time, we thought that free trade would simply bring democracy and human rights and, and capitalism uh, of our variety to countries like China and other countries around the globe. And it turns out we were all wrong. I will admit to having been part of that movement. I mean, I was trained at the University of Chicago as a lawyer, right? Not as an economist, but as a lawyer. Uh, but we were still imbued with that notion of, of free markets and, and, and the idea that it's all going to work out if we just bring capitalism to everybody. And the Chinese one-upped us, right? They, uh, they figured out how to take all the benefits that we saw from it um, and then use the system to their advantage. Um, and I know we're going to get into China later, but they're obviously the biggest player in the space and they're the ones that animate our view of this today. And, I mean, let's be candid. It's fine. We don't need to talk about cutting ourselves off from global trade flows or even trade flows with China overnight. It's fine if they make t-shirts. It's fine if they make cloth or wine for that matter. Their wine isn't very good, but right, it's fine. But semiconductors, right, or critical minerals, if they have a stranglehold on those capabilities, that's dramatically problematic for our national security. And we allowed, we've allowed the situation to develop the way it has uh, because of our commitment to this space and simply taking Ricardo's view and running down the road with that. And now we're realizing the challenges of that. And there are solutions. There are free trade solutions to this problem. It's about engaging in free trade with our allies and people that are aligned with us and bringing people into our free trade network in order to bring them to our side. We have to recognize there are some countries and places in the world that, who strategically will never be part of that operation. And that's, I think, where this conversation about national security and trade comes into play. But look, I mean, I think the American people are finally coming to grips with that, right? The pandemic, I think, revealed the American people in a very stark way the supply chain dependencies that we have that can really affect their lives in a way that really matters to them. Right? It's one thing if you can't get your iPhones. It's one thing if you can't get the, the electric car you want because there's not enough chips of that of a particular variety. You can't get PPE or pharmaceutical precursors. You can't get vaccines. Now people are like, oh, this is a real problem. Now, have we fully sort of taken that on to the point where we're actually doing the things necessary? I don't think we're quite there yet. But we're on that path, and the American people are now awakened to this challenge, not just with China, but globally. The question is, how do we bring our allies on board with this as well? Because the Europeans continue to play footsie in a way that's not helpful. Um, and we need to sort of bring them on board with, we're not going to win this fight ourselves. They're going to lose it dramatically without us. So we've got to make common cause our allies across the Atlantic um, and, and, and our Pacific allies as well. But really, the Atlantic Alliance is, re is really where I think we have a real problem today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamil. Thank you. Uh, Anybody else want to chip in on this general question about whether we are in a new era with respect to how we view global supply chains? And Jim, I think you may have a different perspective, but, or you have the same. I don't necessarily have a different perspective, <laughs> yeah. but I do believe um, working in the private sector, we're, you know, I, I'm like Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry Maguire, show me the money, right? <laughs> so I, I've got to go where I can get my least cost stuff. And I'm thinking quarter to quarter, maybe year to year, maybe two, three years out. And I'm willing to sacrifice certain security, certain things. So without either a disincentive or an incentive from a government body or something like that, I'm likely not going to play ball with something like that. And I'm not saying every company would do that, but it's a difficult conversation for a CEO to have with a board of directors that I've lost margin because I don't want to do business in this country when the competitors are gaining advantage. 
And that's, that's a great point. Yeah, so the, this efficiency perspective that the private sector brings, which drives us into supply chains in the first place. Uh, but I think Jamil's response here sort of suggests that there could be a coordination issue, which we'll get into a little bit later. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I do, look, yeah. I do think there are long-term effects that, that suppliers and, and, and people in the marketplace have to take advantage of and take account of, right? The idea that simply it's just quarter to quarter and it's just my, my bottom line tomorrow, that's actually, markets don't operate purely that way. That's a huge driver, right? I was in a company that IPO'd and had its own challenges after IPO, right? But the, but the reality is that you have to look, take a long-term view of your economics as well. And if you can be cut off from your supply, if you become so reliant on one nation, one supplier, you wouldn't do that in your supply chain for your suppliers. Why would you do that with respect to a country, particularly when, when you know that the political system is going the other way and potentially militarily, right, or economically, you're going to end up in a, in a world of hurt, right? So you've got to account for that. Your board will account for it. Your CEO should account for it. And if they're simply saying, well, it's quarter to quarter and I've got to make my, 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 my VIG for that quarter, right, you're not doing right by your long-term stockholders as well. That, that's great. I'll let you have a rejoinder later. And I agree <laughs> with everything you say <laughs> until we're behind numbers, yeah. right? And then I won't say all bets are off. There are very strategic thinking companies, just like you say, and then there are others that will take the expedient route. But I agree with what you're saying, Joe. Okay, excellent. I, I, this, is, this is exactly what we were hoping for, to have these perspectives, the private sector versus sort of more coordination policy perspective. We'll get more into it. It's going to get, I think it'll get more interesting as we go along. Okay. So Matt, I'm going to turn to you. Um, so this is, so supply chain is kind of a particular kind of trade, right? Trade is broader than that, right? We don't always, trade on supply chains. We could trade on key intermediate or key commodities, for example, that don't necessarily have anything with supply chains, or key you know, minerals that we might need for certain technologies and so on and so forth. So, or we can think about medicines that we might want to procure from the rest of the world, that you know, India, for example, has become a pharmacy of the world, so is China and so on. So the question there becomes that, well, trade is beneficial. I don't think people dispute that. But there's also this question about a trade-off. Are we becoming too dependent on our trading partners uh, for certain key things that we might need for our health, our economic well-being, our national security overall? So how does one get this balance right between trading with countries, gaining from the trade, mutually beneficial, but not yet creating a dependency situation where our national security might be compromised? It's a great question. I think, you know, one way to achieve this balance is to let my two peers here go back and forth uh, with their varying <laughs> perspectives and, and sort of work their way forward. toward the middle. Um, but I think, you know, balance is the key. Um, our focus, our aim is to ensure that we are addressing national security threats while not impeding U.S. policy commitment to uh, free international trade and free markets. I think, you know, to answer your question specifically, I think there are two framing points that, that I think we all should think about. The first is the recognition that my colleagues have already started to talk through that we are part of an increasingly global economy. Mm -hmm. um, our supply chain, the products that we purchase, that we rely upon, that our critical infrastructure relies upon, the software, the hardware, the services, are riddled with interdependencies. Mm -hmm. That is not unique to the US. I think the second framing element before we you know, sort of get into how we want to try to achieve that balance from a, both a private sector and government perspective um, is to recognize that uh, we do have adversaries, the, the PRC among those adversaries who are not simply seeking to, uh, to close the technology gap but really are seeking to disrupt it mm -hmm. and seeking to invert it. Um, so I think those are two important framing elements. Um, now, how do we achieve the balance? What are the elements that we look at when considering mm -hmm. what products we can buy from whom and what we want to invest in domestically? Um, the first is the what. What are the technical aspects of this specific product or hard, piece of hardware or software? Uh, what functions does it perform? How does it operate? Uh, what level of trust or access does it inherently allow based on its function or how it operates? Uh, as we are considering within the US federal government uh, what hardware and software we are comfortable running on our systems, that is something that is top of mind to us. The second is the where, and this is really sort of the atmospherics uh, we should be asking questions about the country of origin. 
uh, to what extent do laws exist uh, or policies permit uh, foreign governments to compel companies to cooperate in uh, their intelligence activities. The third element uh, is really the who, and that is the specifics. Uh, what is the relationship between that company and the foreign government? Uh, is there, does the foreign government have a financial stake in that company? What is the extent to which they can uh, compel or that company is susceptible to coercion? So I think, as, as Jamil noted, you know, there are many types of goods and services that we should continue to feel comfortable purchasing uh, from, you know, all of our foreign partners, to include China. Uh, there are others that, that pose a bit more concern from a national security perspective that we really want to look at through that lens and consider whether we need to continue to invest in domestic production. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. Um, Can I jump in here yes, real quick? Yes, please, Morgan. Um, so yeah. one thing I would just comment on, and Matt did a great job about kind of outlining all the things that have to take into consideration with achieving balance is there's the ideal state and then there's the practical state. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about national security or the defense community, the People's Republic of China is really good at understanding how we're interconnected, but also our gaps. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, is from an acquisition perspective, we're not built essentially to be able to have all these different redundancies or reliance. We rely on single products because that's the way our acquisition cycle is set up. We have contracts, people bid on contracts, we award contracts, then we have multi-year contracts, and that's the capability we have, right? There's a lot of conversations around this right now as it relates to cybersecurity. And the Chinese understand that. So when they understand what product we're relying on and they understand that we're now into a five-year contract with that, <coughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Jamal, uh, I would just say that that's a, that's a vulnerability that we have to understand our dependency in terms of technology that now we've built an entire ecosystem on. And the fact of the matter is, is that the public, you know, the PRC knows that. Yeah. And they're taking advantage of it, and it's, there's no simple solution. I'm not going to have a solution here on stage. But I will say it is something we have to be very aware of and really understand where those dependencies are and start to build a plan where we have redundancy in place so that if we can no longer rely on a technology or a company or we're cut off from a specific place in the world, we saw this in Russia, Ukraine, right. how are we going to react? And that's planning, and that's a lot of the conversation we need to have. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Morgan. I'm going to come back to you further on this national security and supply chain question a little bit. But Matt, can I have a follow-up to your big, very comprehensive and very useful answer, which is sort of like, how do we, there's a long and the short of it, right? I mean, go back in history enough, we've had a war with someone or the other, right? So, you know, we, you know, go back to World War II, you know, Japan was on the other side of the equation, but now Japan is an ally. When we're building on economic relationships, how, how does a country think about balancing the long and the short? Not just about which products today, but am I developing key industries or key partnerships in other countries where, I see risks, not, not today, but potentially tomorrow. Um, and how, how, do you, how do you balance that? You know, if, if, if you want to speak to that a little bit, it would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll open it up to, to my colleagues, particularly uh, from, from industry, if they want to speak to this. I think, you know, noting that I am here representing yeah. the, the, the US government, but also specifically the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, sure. uh, we are not as focused on uh, foreign policy, economic trade. Sure. We are really focused on securing and ensuring the resilience of uh, U.S. critical infrastructure. Um, so we are really looking at both, you know, near-term risks and long-term risks and, and balancing those equally. Uh, we do not get as much into the space of, uh, you know, what, what our partners at Treasury and our partners at Commerce might uh, yeah. be focused on with respect to uh, international trade. Uh, but, you know, I think one area that we remain extraordinarily focused, which I think we'll get into a bit later in this conversation, is what are the risks uh, really stemming from the People's Republic of China. Uh, we are in a new era where, uh, for the first time, we can say in an unclassified setting like this that the PRC is targeting our critical infrastructure for the purpose of gaining access for to uh, you know conduct disruptive or disruptive attacks in the future. That is not something that we've been able to say previously in a setting like this, and it is really uh, just an interesting dynamic in sort of pivot as we think about what work can we collectively do between government and industry over the next really critical several years to make sure that we do understand where technologies may exist in critical infrastructure um, that may present risk to the services that Americans rely upon every day. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, also for clarifying. Uh, <clears throat> Morgan, I'm going to come back to the question we had raised a little bit earlier about global supply chains. And you know, here, um, you know, we talked about the general 
trade-offs involved, you know, risk versus efficiency. But what about the particularities? You know, what are specific industries, products? And I think you, you hinted that a little bit, Matt, in your answer earlier. Uh, product, what are some of the leading case studies, if you like, that we should be concerned with? You know, I'm thinking in particular here about a little bit about the semiconductor industry, the CHIPS Act, and if you can speak to that about what are the touch points here that are really critical for national security on the, national, on the supply chains. So semiconductors is critical to national defense, right? It is big in everything that we do from radars to communication to navigation systems. Um, the fact of the matter is, and General Hawk commented on it earlier, when you think about a weapon system or a platform, it is a flying, floating, driving computer system. And so you think about just how broad that is across DOD, the Department of Defense, and U.S. national security. And the fact of the matter is, is that when you look at it a couple years ago, 16% of that technology was actually created domestically. 16%. I mean, that's huge when you think about how impactful that is for DOD, and right, that's down from 37% in the 1990s, and so that's a dramatic shift. And so the CHIPS Act, right, in 2022 was impactful in the fact that we're talking about $280 billion infused into research, into an investment, and really incentivizing the semiconductor industry to build that capability over 10 years. But 10 years, I mean, that takes time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're thinking about, okay, the U.S. military needs to modernize their capabilities, their weapons platforms, how do we do this quickly? I mean, the good news is, is that I think the year report from the White House said that there was like a 166 million investment from companies in semiconductor technology. There are colleges, community colleges that have stood up a workforce to specifically support that surge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But well, as we do that work, it's the bottom line. People are going to want to exploit those companies. They're going to exploit that industry. It comes back to the conversation that we're kind of having across the board is, you know, how fast can we get it while also ensuring that security is baked in? Functionality over speed. Right. And so how do you have both? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that gets really difficult. And so I think there are some really good things um, that have happened, right? National Defense Authorization Act, most recently, Department of Defense actually tasked NSA, my organization, to work with semiconductor, semiconductor companies on all of their cybersecurity, so that's something that we're doing. But it, it is gonna be a huge reliance for us in like, how do we close the gap while we're still building the capacity over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. let alone all the weapon systems, right? Semiconductors are critical and GPUs are critical for AI. And that's not specifically what the CHIPS Act is all about, but it is talked about. And so as everyone is looking at how do we take artificial intelligence and infuse it into national security systems, national security, national defense, help us to do our work faster, um, there's not enough actual chips to be able to do that. And so it is a huge industry for us and something that's critical to national security. Yeah, well, fantastic. I think this also dovetails with a question that came up earlier. And Jamil, I may pull you into this if you're willing yeah. to do so. Uh, the Taiwan question. Right. Uh, why do we care about Taiwan? One of the questions that came up, right? Clearly, they've been an important supplier of semiconductors uh, in the world. You know, they're one of the leading firms are Taiwanese based. And this question of reshoring production back to the United States through some industrial policy on semiconductors obviously is motivated by lowering some of those risks that Morgan was just mentioning. You want to speak to that a little bit about how this fits in together? Look, I mean, the idea that we're going to onshore and even a significant percentage of our semiconductor production is laughable, right? The $280 billion is a hugely important investment and one that was critical we needed to make, but it's not even scratching the surface, right? We need to invest tremendous amounts more if we're gonna really uh, create some amount of independence from, uh, from China and it's, and it's near abroad. Uh, but the reality is we don't actually need to do that. Yeah. What we need to do is be very clear about where we are on Taiwan that any threat to Taiwan is unacceptable to the United States, and we will pick a fight over it if need be. The president has been clear three times. Three times on national television, the president of the United States has said, if Taiwan is attacked by China, we will use our military to defend it. Three times, Jake Sullivan has come out on stage, immediately following the president, said, well, what the president really meant was we'll send weapons. So it's not surprising the Chinese are confused about where we are. It's not surprising the Taiwanese are confused about where we are. And we can say nine times out of 10, well, the Taiwanese don't really want to defend themselves. And so we're not going to be there if they're not going to be there. But the reality is, whether the Taiwanese want to defend themselves or not, we are reliant upon them, period, full stop. And we can spend a decade trying to get better, and we will get better. And this investment's important. But it's not just Taiwan. It's we've got to be, we've got to be able to invest overseas. We've got to get other allies on board. We've got to, uh, got to get the Europeans on board with investing in, in semiconductors as well. We cannot do it all ourselves. We cannot onshore it. We're, it's just too expensive to do that, constru that construction and that, and that capability in America. And frankly, all these factories we're building in the United States, you know who's going to run all of them and, and where, the, where the STEM talent is? It's not in this country. It's in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, over a decade, a decade and a half, we'll build out the STEM capability. But today, 
That STEM talent is overseas. And by the way, we bring a lot of the world's smartest, most capable engineers to the United States. We train them in our PhD programs. You know what we tell them? You gotta go home to your home country to build your capability, build your startup, because we're not gonna let you stay here because our immigration laws are so stupid as to say, you know what, let's have an immigration system that forces the smartest that we train here in our best universities, force them to go overseas, and then, by the way, the people we do let in, we'll let them in on a lottery basis. It's almost like you take a stupid system and you make it random. Yeah, Jamil, I should, I should point out that the system is not terrible, it did let me in. Just no, saying. You, you, no, no, you, know, you and me both, right? My parents, my parents came here, right? We're ethnically Indian, but my parents came here from East Africa, but we came in at a time when the immigration was a lot, wide, a lot more wide open in the 70s, right? Today, how do, how, do, how do smart Indian scientists get in the United States? It's either a lottery, it's family, or they, they get on an H-1B. H-1B, yeah. That's right? right. Yeah. But how many H-1B? There's the, H-1B is a tiny percentage. Yeah. We should be taking every smart engineer who we train in our PhD programs All and right. having them stay here. Build your companies here. Become part of the American dream. And by the way, if we vet people the right way, we can let Chinese PhDs in here too because they don't want to build in China. They want to build here. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that impassioned plea for better immigration <laughs> policy. Yeah, that deserves so the hand. I'm excited to sit next to him. <laughs> Jim, do you have any different view on this sourcing question that, you know, we, we have, we are relying Absolutely on Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd have a different view yeah. after a standing applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to trade seats? No. Just, <laughs> <laughs> okay, just kidding. Okay. So this is great. Uh, thank you so much. So we've talked about the risks that supply chains create for us, right? What might happen if we can't source critical things that we really need? Semiconductors is a great example. Morgan talked very clearly about that and you know, what we might do to create other sources, bring production back and so on and so forth. But what about deliberately using supply chains as a tool? Think of it in the other perspective, right? Not the risk it creates for us, but the leverage it gives us, right? And does it. So uh, Matt and Morgan, I'm gonna ask you to jump in here a little bit. Um, in what ways can supply chains, although like the solar winds incident in 2020 is an example, in what this incident was largely attributed to the Russians, but what is to say that it can't happen from China or somewhere else? Um, can you talk a little bit about how we might think of this as a tool as opposed to just being worried about what it might do to us? Sure. So um, happy to start. Um, to your initial point, yeah. just because solar winds was, uh, you know, the the cyber attack colloquially referred to as solar winds, sorry, solar winds, was a, uh, at the hands of the Russians does not in any means uh, lead us to believe that other adversaries, China, cyber criminals, Iran, et cetera, could not be leveraging similar tactics. I think what makes this type of attack so attractive to our adversaries is that it allows you to compromise one and then achieve results at a, a very significant scale. And that is what Russia was attempting to do uh, with the solar wind supply chain compromise. Since you asked about solar, uh, solar wind specifically, I will dimension my response specifically to software supply chain attacks. Um, I think it's important to note again up front that modern software is not generally written from scratch. It contains uh, open source code, proprietary code, third party APIs, literally hundreds of dependencies. Um, and this is what makes it uh, such an attractive target for our adversaries to again, gain a foothold uh, and sometimes unwittingly gain access to customers, third party environments from that in initial foothold. Uh, what we are doing across the U.S. government, uh, and a lot of this was from uh, the Biden-Harris administration's executive order 14028 that came out uh, at the beginning of this administration, immediately following solar winds, is really a few things. Uh, first, within, within CISA and more broadly across the, the U.S. government, across industry, and with our international partners, we are pushing a message of secure by design and secure by default. We are pushing a message of radical transparency. We need to have software bills of material. We need to know what are the components of the software that uh, our governments, uh, that our critical industries are relying upon every day so we can quickly understand if we are seeing an attack, if we are seeing a campaign. Uh, it took us more time than it needed to uh, in the days that ensued following solar winds to understand the breadth of impact across the community. And that is an area that we need to continue to get better. 
Another area that we're driving out of uh, Executive Order 14028 is a focus on really dimensioning what are categories, what are characteristics of critical software that we need to pay uh, additional attention to and, and further safeguard. That is something that we are doing for government, but that we publish uh, publicly to ensure that critical industri industries, uh, private sector, owners and operators are able to benefit from it. Uh, we recently, re uh, in close partnership with our friends at the White House, uh, uh, launched an effort to ensure that anybody who is doing business with the federal government in selling software to the federal government is submitting a secure software attestation form. Uh, this is just self-attestation. It, no, it is not the panacea, but it is a start. Uh, so again, these are areas that we're really focused on in just in terms of transparency uh, in you know, what, what components exist in software so we can help better understand and dimension the problem. The other thing that we learned from SolarWinds was just that there was a, there were some basic challenges that persisted across fairly sophisticated federal civilian departments and agencies and fairly mature and sophisticated private sector partners uh, where we weren't doing enough of the basics. We didn't have sufficient logging in place. We didn't have sufficient uh, focus on identity and access management. We didn't have sufficiently implemented MFA, uh, phishing resistant MFA across all services. So there is work that we have done in the wake of SolarWinds uh, in part of the American Rescue Plan Act to work across the 102 civilian executive branch agencies. I know NSA is working this similarly. DOD has similar efforts to gain really additional granular visibility at the host level so we are able to see if an intrusion does occur uh, on a system or network, has the uh, adversary been able to move laterally? Has the adversary been able to gain a foothold to elevate privileges, to leverage living off the land techniques? We are really focused on these types of techniques that we see the PRC and other sophisticated adversaries, and quite frankly, cyber criminals and ransomware gangs beginning to use to really blend in and make it harder for uh, adversary or for defenders to detect their uh, activity. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, we learned a lot, it seems like. <laughs> the, Morgan, do you want to chip in there? Yeah, I'll just yeah. add a little bit. Matt did yeah. a great job of characterizing a bunch of different efforts and things that we learned from solar winds. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do you know your supply chain risk, your supply chain risk better than the Chinese? Because at the end of the day, they understand what the vulnerabilities are. And so if you do not understand where you're getting specific components, software, technology, and you are putting it into your network, the Chinese know where those vulnerabilities are, they're gonna take advantage of it if it is in their choosing or to their advantage. And we've seen them been able to do that rapidly. It's not a year type plan, they are discovering it and they are moving as quickly as possible. And so that's what we've learned is, we've had to have some really hard conversations from SolarWinds of like, okay, wait, what open source software, what open source libraries do we actually rely on? Where are they in the US government? What could be exploited? Um, and I know Matt talked about some of the things from um, SBOM all the way to understanding just what technology is in place, what logging is in place. But I would also offer, when it comes to open source code and things that these things are based on, one of the conversations that I know we're trying to drive at NSA, and General Hawk alluded to it this morning when it comes to curriculum, is the value of having secure coding classes in the curriculum in college, right? How do we build it from the ground up? How do we do secure by design, secure by default? We really have to start a lot of investment earlier on in the pipeline when it comes to our talent on how do we secure this technology. So when we put into our networks, we don't have to have the same conversations. Um, I will also say the continuous monitoring when it comes from a supply chain perspective is really valuable because we oftentimes hear that a specific technology or specific capability is exploited and people are like, well, wait a second, we validated that and it looks great and we put in national security systems. We should be good. Okay, well, the way that it was implemented and put into the network, people actually turned a few things off <laughs> and that wasn't great and the Chinese actively exploited it and we didn't know that. And so how do we just have a constant, continuous evaluation of what we're doing in terms of our networks that we care the most about from a supply chain perspective? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Jim, I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind, and love everything I just said, I'm, I'm more please and faster would be amazing, right? Um, a lot of the things that you talk about, uh, S-bombs, right, getting that software bill of materials, which is where you know everything that's coming into your environment and all that stuff, those cost money. And I, now I sound like the guy who's like, you know, I don't have any money, you got to make it happen. Um, but we need to be able to have our competitors 
under that same thing. Now, there is a competitive advantage to being secure, and don't get me wrong, and that's what we do, but we play a game of reasonably secure in the private sector, right? I gotta get to a point uh, where I'm reasonably secure, where I protect the investment, my shareholders, my customers, and all that, um, and that's where we focus. If I start expanding that, I start eating into our bottom line, and, and by and large, at least my investor, our board of directors and, and leadership are good with that, but we have to be careful where that is. It's one of the reasons I love what you said about secured code by design and teaching those who are coming out of college, that's the kind of skill set that I can leverage. The other part is when I said to you is that we need incentives and disincentives and maybe even regulations. I'd love to see something like a, a NERC SIP for cloud security providers, right? Like, if we'd done that to Microsoft Exchange Online at the end of last year, maybe some of the things that they had done, uh, and I think it was the Cyber Safety Review Board came out on that one, it at least held accountable, but maybe they would have had a better attention towards the security because of how instrumental they are. Yeah, I mean, I want to say a yeah, couple please. things. Yeah, one, um, can we stop calling SolarWinds SolarWinds and just call it Microsoft? Okay. Right? I mean, let's be real, right? It's, it's hard to at argue with heart, you. I'm what I'm just taking. <laughs> at the heart of solar winds, and, and I think the CSRB report demonstrated this in the exchange context, but it's true across the board, right? We have a dominant supply player that has not kept up its security where it needs to be, right? This is a problem for the federal government because 90 plus percent of our collaboration software is built on that capability. And I'm not saying we need to stop using Microsoft. We need to hold them more accountable to do a better job, as the CSRB laid out in, in, in excruciating detail. Um, and that's true across a lot of our suppliers. It's not exclusive to them. Um, and I think the CSRB made some interesting recommendations. But I think more importantly, it's important for public companies and companies that trade, that, that are in the public markets to, to have to be, meet their bottom line and, and, and deal with investors. But it's also incumbent upon investors so in addition to my, my, my job at, at Mason, I'm a venture capital investor at Paladin Capital. We just made a decision with nine other venture capital investors to make clear that we're not going to invest in adversary technology. We're going to invest in American capabilities, American technology, and we're going to build, we're going to show our companies build secure by design, build resilient by design. We've committed publicly to a set of commitments around these ideas. And I think we need to expect more from our investment community because at the end of the day, truth be told, those investments are better investments. Those investments return, have a better return profile for our limited partners, right? They, if, if you have a, lot, a huge investment in intellectual property, and that intellectual property is defended against adversaries, that's going to return better returns. We demonstrate that across the board, time and time again. And so you can benefit your investors by doing it the right way and by ensuring you're building secure by design, by building resilient by design, these long-term plays, and I get it, you're in, you're in the markets, you've got to deal with the reality of what your investors hold you accountable to. But in the startup environment, as venture investors, we can hold our companies accountable for the return prof profile we want. And so you can both do good and, and make money doing it. They, they, there is no dichotomy between the two. Yeah. That's a great point. I think, Jim, I heard you sort of raise the question about, you know, how does the private sector mitigation mitigate risk? Because it's expensive. It's going to yeah. cost a lot of money. So, but, so if you want to speak a little bit more to that, I think Jimmy will kind of pointed an outlet there that the private sector can help each other. It isn't individual enterprise's responsibility, but the investors and the angel investors and all of that, Al Group, can step in and mitigate some of those problems. Is that something you would agree with? Yeah, 100%. As a matter yeah. of fact, we, we've started partnering with, with CISA and other groups, and then the, FA, I'm sorry, the ISAC, FSI SAC is one more part of amazing stuff. We've been working against a threat actor called Scattered Spider. Some of you guys might have heard of it. Um, We've been working with them, and the private sector cooperation that we've built, the intelligence that we've been able to pull together has been outstanding, right? And if we can harness that together, I think we could really make a dent in some of this supply chain attacks, right, because they're really attacking that trust, and being able to help each other detect it and then move faster. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have one final question on this uh, security and cybersecurity business, and I think, Morgan, this is going to go to you. So sort of a general question, what is the importance and role of cybersecurity standards, right, for emerging technologies and U.S.-China tensions in that space? So speaking yeah, specifically Yeah, this is something that. I'm really passionate about, maybe not as yeah. passionate as some of my other panelists, but um, <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so what I would offer is that when you talk about cybersecurity standards, the role is, the fact of the matter is, is that the People's Republic of China is coming out in a big way when it becomes in, becoming involved in the standard development organizations, right? That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. We don't want to have a bifurcated standard strategy. We want to make sure that all countries are following the same type of cybersecurity standards. But we are seeing that the People's Republic of China, they are really having malign influence and in putting in specific standards proposals that are potentially jeopardizing emerging technology, like 5G and 6G and IoT and smart cities. And this is the technology we're going to rely on in the next five to 10 years, right? I would point to a PRC publication 
which we call the standard strategy of 2035, I believe, for the PRC, where it specifically states that they want standards with Chinese characteristics. Right, and that should tell you where the priority is from a security perspective. And so we want to ensure with industry, with US government and our allies across the world that we are really have an active presence in these standard development organizations because I don't wanna sit on stage, I mean I love these guys dearly, but I don't wanna sit on stage in five years saying, having the same conversations about the same technology with the same problems because we haven't addressed it in the future space. And so I think that is one really key element when we talk about cybersecurity and how we are countering PRC influence in the technology domain is how actively involved we are in these standards bodies and ensuring that future technology is secure, it has the right security evaluations, it's in place, and we can trust it from day one. Yeah, great. So these bodies you're talking about, these are basically private sector initiatives that are international. What is the scope Some of these of bodies? Some of the standard development organizations are private sector run, so uh -huh. 3GPP, right, IETF. Um, but when you talk about, there are other government run standards bodies. There are a ton of them as they rate, relate to specific um, technology, there are working groups that underpin them. You can find a lot of information about it publicly, but some of these bodies are not one country, one vote. It's one person, one vote, yeah, and right? And we see our adversaries actually incentivizing individuals to attend these standard development organizations, these, wor these working groups, just to vote on their behalf. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and they don't necessarily yeah. have the technical background to be able to speak to it. Yeah. So good standards, technical talent, let's put them forward and let's secure that technology. And, and this is why it's so important, the work that Morgan and the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center is doing at NSA because, um, and the work that CISA does with industry as well, because it, it can't just be the private sector on its own in these standards bodies or the government on its own, right? You've heard a lot recently about the need for the US government to get more engaged in these standards bodies. That's certainly true, but we gotta get our private sector with us as well, okay. seeing from the same songbook. Right, that's the key is we gotta be on the same page and recognize the adversary is not the industry and government, the adversary is the other side, right? And they are making a concerted effort to undermine global standards and, and insert their things. And the nice thing about the Chinese to be candid is they've told us what their plan is. You don't have to figure it out, right? They are very clear in their doctrine and their actions about where they are and the efforts they're trying to make. We're just not paying attention. Thanks, Jim. Jim, did you have anything to add there? Or I thought yeah, you were Yeah, I'm yeah. an echo of this, but we're in a, yeah. um, significantly asymmetric fight, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the That's coordination, the central push, the command level function that the, the PRC has is amazing. I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm not a fan of theirs, but I, I can appreciate what they've done. We've got to get our act together and figure out how we're getting our allies together, our own, our own people together, and build the necessary mechanisms to combat it and win. And incentives are the key, right? You talked about incentives earlier, right? We often, you know, in the government, right? I was in the government for a long time. We tend to think in terms of how can we force people to do what we want, right? The better play every time is to, is to align your incentives with the others, with, the, with, the, with private industry. And why do I say that? It's because I'm a recovering lawyer, yeah. right? And yeah. lawyers, as soon as you I'm, provide- I'm a practicing economist and I agree with that. There you go. <laughs> right, so you know this, right? Because, because as, soon as, you put, as soon as you put a disincentive on a private sector company, yeah. the first thing to do is call their lawyer and say, what do we do? And the lawyer says, do as little as possible, as late as possible. Yeah. And even if the government says 72 hours and tell us everything, all right, we'll do it right the 71st hour and 59 minutes, and we'll tell you everything that we have to, but not a single thing more. On the opposite side, if you say, hey, if you tell us everything within 72 hours, you can tell us every single thing, we'll give you liability protection, we'll give you regulatory protection, now all of a sudden, the lawyer's like, tell them everything, tell them it all in the third hour, yeah. right? Because they wanna get that liability protection that, and, that, and that care, and I get there are reasons why we don't do that all the time, but we have got to, if we wanna be real about public-private partnerships, we gotta stop talking about disincentives and start talking about incentives. Yeah. 100% agree with that. I think that's absolutely spot on. So let's get to, uh, I love that. Look, look what happened. <laughs> so we've been dancing around this question a little bit. I think in my own research too, I've thought a lot about this question of intellectual property protection and the frictions that has created between US and China, right? Um, so there's a long history on this. It's not the first time the US has talked about it. Since the 80s, the US government has been producing documents, you know, documenting abuse of intellectual property of US businesses abroad. China was a big one, India was another one, Brazil, some of the other countries, but China certainly was one of the bigger ones. And so we had, we had a strange phenomenon at play in the 90s, and you know, China opens up in the 1978, um, slowly, and then market starts growing. And then for a long time, for several decades in a row, China is the biggest recipient of foreign direct investment, particularly from the United States, right? In an era when intellectual property was basically unprotected or very weakly protected, such as even the case today. So there's a sort of a strange dichotomy there where we talk about the, the, the importance of 
intellectual property protection for American business. But at the same time, it seemed to me as an economist that American business was tripping over itself to get into the Chinese market. Um, and in an era which they very well knew that this is not a secure intellectual property regime. So did this issue came up before about what can the private sector do? Is the private sector acting too much in isolation uh, and is not properly coordinated? Did they concede too much on the technology transfer angle? For example, China today is requiring that US businesses want to have major presence should share technology with local companies if they want to operate their wholly owned subsidiaries are being curtailed or taxed at a higher rate and so on and so forth. So where's the private sector in all of this? Has it got it wrong? I, I don't know if I could say if we've got it wrong or not, yeah. right? That feels like a career limiting move, so I'm gonna move <laughs> away from that. Um, I, I, I do a lot of that. <laughs> what I can say is I, I've got a friend who's a patent attorney in a, in a big law firm and when you file a patent in China and somebody violates that patent and you go to litigate in China on it, there's an above 90% chance, well into the 99% chance, you're going to lose, right? And also, if you don't use your patent for a certain amount of time in China, they take it. The government takes on the ownership of that patent, so you lose. The game is rigged over there. That being said, my friend, the patent attorney, still has lots of clients that are filing patents in China in a bid to break open that market. There is still a belief, and whether it's true or not, that this will become a free market, that we will prevail and we will be able to, I know, I can see your head shaking, that we will be able to open that market. I, I, I'm going to stop there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you chime in. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. look, I think, I think the challenge is that we know, we, we all know the IP problems in China. We've known them since, you know, yeah. music and videos are stolen right now. It's, right. Now it's core intellectual property, right? And, 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 and I don't mean to beat up. I look, I'm, I'm, I use Microsoft Word, Excel, all the, all the, all the, all the apps. I have, I'm an Apple, I have an Apple obsession, right? Um, and yet, those companies have decided that the trade-off to sell their wares and to build their wares at a cheap cost is worth putting their IP in, and making their IP subject to, you know, Access by the by the Chinese government, yeah. right? Yeah. IP is stored in China. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, crazy. Stored there. Yeah. Stored there, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Core intellectual property. Um, and so and so so, but you got to ask yourself, right? From an economic perspective, they see a massive market. Yeah. We see a massive market, always have, right? The question is, is that market really going to be accessible to us? Or are they simply playing Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football, where they keep setting it up, we keep running up, and they pull the ball, and we fall down? And we never learned the lesson. Mm -hmm. I mean, how long is it going to be before we learn the lesson? The Chinese market is never going to open up. Yeah. It's never going to be open the way we want it to be open. And they've been fooling us for decades. Yeah, no, th this is a great point. I mean, so the US is a market based competitive system where businesses go it alone, compete against each other heavily, not just against other businesses, but within the country, outside abroad. So the, it could suggest a coordination problem from the US perspective that it's not in the national interest to be sharing technology so easily and so quickly because you can make a quick buck. But it's in the interest of the private sector individual firm to do so. They are worried somebody else will do it if they don't do it, right? So, so you know, I'm not sure I have an answer, but it requires some kind of cooperation, I think, between the private sector and the public sector in the United States to get this right. And um, Jim, did you have any thoughts about that kind of cooperation? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna echo what he says. We gotta get yeah. our partners and our allies together, and we've gotta commit to doing this in the right way, right? The, I said it before, and I'll say it again, the game is rigged. Right? We play anyways because we might still win a QP dollar, whatever it is, or might win a stuffed animal, because we have to, right? Yeah. But I do believe that we need to get in there, and as you've said multiple times, we need to help rig the game a little bit back in our favor. Yeah. Can, I, can I be the devil's advocate here a little bit further? So 1995, the World Trade Organization formally comes into existence. Along with it comes into existence the intellectual property agreement called TRIPS where the US was obviously heavily involved, along with the Europeans and the Japanese, getting those rules designed and making sure developing countries adopted rules and regulations in par, on par at least on paper, uh, with those in the United States, right? Uh, what, what's been the result of that effort? How do you assess that? What, has it failed entirely to get intellectual property where it needs to be in countries where it was supposed to be weak? No, I, mean, I think, look, I think, I think WIPO and, and WTO have been, have been relative successes for us on the free trade agenda and the IP agenda. I think there are, there are real, real benefits and gains. I think we have not been clear-eyed about the threat that certain players play in this space, right? Um, when, 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 when our adversaries be, behave in, in um, extortative ways, right, requiring us to enter into joint, uh, joint venture agreements with Chinese providers, requiring us to transfer IP, requiring us to hold IP in China, right? At some point, as a, as, a, as a rational economic actor, 
even one that responds on a quarterly basis to mar market pressure. You have to say, does it make sense for me to put my core IP in a safe room in China and let the Chinese government have access to it? Mm -hmm. And if it does, does it make sense for the US government to say, okay, we're not buying your products anymore because we can't trust them. Yeah. Right? When you leave your encryption keys open and accessible and get them owned and you do it over and over again, at some point the US government should say, maybe we gotta change our procurement ideas, right? Otherwise, the incentive is to not do anything because this is a rational market actor. You're like, look, they keep telling me they're gonna do something about it, but they're, they're still buying my products. I'll just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the individual incentives are along those lines. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay, so I hinted at this already earlier, right? So the US business is investing in China, right? Uh, over decades of billions of dollars flowing into China on a regular basis has led to trillions of US stock of foreign investment in China, okay? So when we talk about walking away from China or whatever the word might be, decoupling or divorcing to some degree, you know, divorce is never easy. But in this case, it's particularly hard, right? So look at what we have at stake. Uh, so the flip side, of course, is the Chinese hold tons of US debt, right? Now we can inflate our way out of it. You know, we can say, okay, this debt is worthless, but that hurts all of us too, right? So can the panel in general, I'm gonna begin with you too, talk about this situation where we have locked in investment and debt in two directions, and yet we are talking about as if we need to break this up somewhat. Shocking that I have a hot take on this. Okay. Um, <laughs> look, uh, if you're, and I can only speak as a venture capital investor, right? Yeah. But if you're an investor that benefits from the free flow of capital and the ability to allocate capital freely, you have a responsibility to defend that system, that political and economic system. And if you're investing in China, you're undermining that system. So I don't accept that, there are, that U.S. investors should say, well, you know, it's a really good deal and I really need to make money over there. Because frankly, the evidence shows investments in China, including in AI companies, is actually a bad bet. It's been a bad bet for decades. It's still a bad bet today. But even if it wasn't a bad bet, if you're going to benefit from this system and you're going to be able to, and you're going to incorporate here and you're going to have your LP agreements here and you're going to do all that here, then you should recognize the system only works when you have a free political system and a free market economic system. And you, when you invest in systems that are, that, are, that, are, um, that are autocratic and unfree, you're undermining the ability of this system. It doesn't have to be in the US, it can be our allies as well. But if you're investing in non-free market economies and autocratic societies, you're undermining the system and you're undermining your own capability to make returns for your investors. So you would actually advocate at reducing those investments going forward? We've a, committed to that. Yeah, we, yeah. Our firm and nine other venture capital investors publicly have committed to that because that it is not, first of all, it's not a good bet. Second of all, it undermines the very system that allows us to make those bets. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other take on that? Larger question, debt and investment with China? Okay, because you know, quite often the conversation is only about trade, particularly when one thinks about supply chains, you get locked into a trading perspective. But a lot more is at stake in this economic relationship than just trade. So you know, that being the point. Um, uh, so I want to move quickly now, uh, given our time here, uh, to a couple of recent episodes, flashpoints in U.S.-China relationships, which illustrate the deeper issues at stake, which you know all of you have spoken ele very eloquently about. Morgan, I'm going to start with you. It's, you know, it's on conference on cybersecurity. It's funny that we have not yet mentioned artificial intelligence whatsoever. <laughs> but let, let's let me pitch that question to you. So what about in the AI domain? How should what should we be doing in terms of a national security perspective with respect to China? Yeah, so from a national security perspective, I'll bring it back to protecting IP, mm -hmm. right? We want mm -hmm. to maintain and encourage and can take that U.S. competitive advantage in the artificial intelligence realm. And so when we look at, from a national security perspective, we look at the companies that are creating this unique technology. It's a technology that we want to infuse in the Department of Defense and in the national security community. We want to ensure that these companies who are moving fast, got great technology, are working with international partners, are quite honestly protected from things like cyber adversaries who are going to look to steal that technology and use it to their benefit. And so how do we ensure they have the basic cyber hygiene that Matt talked about? They understand the threat, the adversaries, what their capabilities are, both sophisticated but rudimentary, that's going to take advantage of the fact that they're new, they're shiny, and they have things that people want. And so I think that's a key focus for us in the national security community is how do we protect these companies and ensure they have the same protections that we're trying to provide to all else of critical infrastructure are the Department of Defense and the Defense Industrial Base. Um, secondly, when we look at artificial intelligence from a national security sp perspective, we want to understand how our adversaries are going to use it. Right? We don't think it's some massive hype where it's going to change the game overnight, but we do believe that they're going to be able to leverage that technology to move faster. 
right? When we talk about the People's Republic of China, we know that when it came to the Hafnium Compromise, the Microsoft Exchange Compromise, or the vulnerability that they had, the Chinese were able to essentially see that vulnerability. And when we talked about it publicly and called them out for it, they doubled down. They went faster. They exploited more entities. Right? If they're able to use artificial intelligence to be able to do that at scale, which they're you know, able to do at scale already, like, that's daunting. But the good news is that artificial intelligence will also help us as cyber defenders. Right? It's going to be able to determine what is our tech debt, what is our networks, where are all of our vulnerable devices, how do we patch this at scale? There's a lot of cyber defenders right now that are terrified of Patch Tuesday because they're exhausted. And so how do we leverage the technology on the defensive aspect as well? And then lastly, how are advocacies going to exploit AI technology in terms of an AI network, all the yeah. way from data collection to deployment? There are unique and novel techniques that are going to be created that are being thought of. Um, and so how do we protect the AI networks and systems from those type of attacks? Yeah, fantastic. I want to let anybody else weigh in on that question on AI. Yeah I'd, yeah, I'd love to. The thing that scares me about AI, right, except for that I can't wait for Skynet to come in and take care of everything, right? Um, it scares me is, is that traditionally when we think about technology systems, I have, a, I have a client in a database, right? And I go and I do some computation and I get my data back and I, I do my thing with it. Using generative AI and large language models, where that answer you got came from is much more obscure, and you've got to get a team of wizards that sort of have to do a psychoanalyze your LLM, and I'm, I'm being tongue in cheek, but they really have to do some deep analysis to figure out what was broken. There is a significant threat vector here in poisoning our large language models, hmm. right? And, and if I'm an insidious, persistent attacker, like the PRC or some of their threat actor groups, I look for ways to affect the degenerative AIs that are not only running my adversary, but also the ones that are defending, especially in the cyber side. So don't look for this IP address, and I'm being a little ham-handed about that or a little blatant about it, but I would look to poison those things in such a way that I would become undetected for the, the thing that I wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, we could, this is such an interesting panel. I could talk to you guys all day, but I don't have all day. Uh, neither do you. Uh, I have one final question I want to put to you from the floor, um, which uh, you know, any of you uh, should be happy to take, or if not, uh, we you know, can move on to some other question. I have several of them. Uh, the first, I think, that's really got my attention is the healthcare industry accounts for about 25% of government spending, which is true. You know, uh, we spend a lot on health. Are there any concerns that adversaries might target their industry by proxies as a mechanism of increasing economic strain on us? Are we concerned about that? Attacks on our healthcare system, given how much how locked in the economy is on that particular sector. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start quickly. We, we are very concerned, um, not necessarily, not solely on the fact that our nation state adversaries may be locking in on this particular sector uh, right for economic now. reasons. <laughs> right now. Right now. Uh, but what we are seeing right now is just a tremendous uh, focus on this sector from ransomware gangs and cyber criminals that is extraordinarily concerning um, and is work that, you know, between Morgan's team, between CISA, uh, the FBI, and our friends at HHS, we're focused on every day to ensure that we are getting information out about these actors, about the, uh, the, the techniques and tactics that they are using, about how they are gaining access to these systems, which is really a, a national security and a public health emergency. Great. Anybody else want to add to that? The healthcare side? Okay. I think I can squeak one question in, <laughs> a final one. Um, are there specific areas that China is engaging in lawfare against the US that they're successful in? I'm not sure what lawfare myself means, but maybe Jamil, you can help us. Yeah, I mean, the lawfare is the use of the legal system to achieve national security and foreign policy objectives uh, by a nation state or other or economic objectives, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, I mean, the Chinese engage in lawfare across the board with us, right? They uh, they're exploiting our IP system, uh, they're exploiting our uh, they're exploiting the international system that we brought them into, the WTO and the like, uh, to their benefit, and and they're exploiting the the standards bodies to their benefit, right? They're they are literally taking the architecture we built. By the way, we built it to help ourselves. Right? The whole theory of the case was well, the way we built the world telecommunication system, right? Benefited us, right? As, as Morgan can tell you, right? But the, the real challenge is that they are now figured that out and they're going to one up us. And we are not playing equal ball. We've forgotten that we're a superpower in a million different ways, but in this way in particular, economically. And we need to leverage that capability and work collaboratively with our private sector to do that. We got to get on the same page and we're just not there today, not, with, not internally and not with our allies. Okay, great. Any one final word for anyone? 
Um, Jim, no? Okay. System is rigged. Yeah. Okay. It's rigged. You heard it here first. <laughs> okay, well, this has been a scintillating and invigorating discussion for me at least. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for their comments. Well, thank you very much indeed for that um, fascinating and very sobering discussion. As someone who's got a friend who was due to have incredibly important surgery recently to save her life, life-saving surgery, and it got cancelled at the last minute because of a ransomware attack on the healthcare provider, I am keenly aware of the seriousness of what's going on right now in the healthcare sector. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting indeed to hear the discussion about what can hopefully be done to counter it, but certainly the public awareness of this issue yet is not anywhere near where it should be. We're now going to have a very, very quick break again to go and grab some lunch. I think there are brown bags through there. And then bring them back straight here if you can, because we're going to start again at 12.30 with a keynote from the Assistant Director um, of the CIA, um, Shithal Patel, who's going to be talking us, to us about the CIA's perspective on this. So grab some lunch and then come back. Thank you.
Well, thank you everyone for getting back to your seat so quickly with your lunch, um, which is terrific. So thank you for supplying that. Um, and having had food for the stomach, we now have food for the mind, inspiration, with a keynote address from Shital Patel, who's the Assistant Director of Transnational and Technology Mission Center at the CIA. She's had a very interesting, very highly regarded career, um, served in Afghanistan, served at length in different roles in Washington um, and at the CIA and other agencies, and is going to be talking us, to us now about the question of how to manage the rising security challenges. And then after that, we're going to have a far side chat between her and Doug Adams, who's also from Vanderbilt University, who's the executive director of the Institute for National Defense and Global Security. So, over to you. Okay, I'm going to make sure. Can everybody hear me? All right. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction, and thank you to Vanderbilt University for inviting me here to speak at lunchtime. So I hope you guys all enjoy your lunch. Um, if I am the assistant director for what is known as the Transnational and Technology Mission Center at CIA. And I am here to talk to you about, you guessed it, transnational and technology issues, specifically emerging technology. But before I get into that, I wanted to take a moment to pull back the curtain a bit and demystify what it is we do at CIA. So our mission is to be what we call the nation's first line of defense. We do that by collecting and analyzing foreign intelligence. U.S. policymakers, including the president, rely on the intelligence community and the CIA to make to provide the intelligence that they need to make informed policy decisions. So our four key mission areas are foreign intelligence, which is the collection of information on foreign plans and intentions, and it's done through various different means. Counterintelligence, which is neutralizing adversaries' abilities to affect our people, security, facilities, and our ability to operate overseas. Covert action, which is done at the order of the President of the United States, and all source analysis. CIA's core focus, truly, our bread and butter, is in foreign intelligence. Foreign intelligence takes form in many forms, as I mentioned. What we do in CIA is called human intelligence, or the recruitment of foreign spies. There are other agencies that have specialties in other INTs, as we call them, intelligence. And you heard from uh, General Hawk this morning, his organization is uh, predominantly involved in signals intelligence as well as cyber. And then you have open source intelligence. You have the National Geospatial Ag Agency, which does uh, GEOINT, as we call it. And our analysts conduct what we call all source analysis. They draw from all the different ints to put a picture together of what is going on or their best assessment of what is going on around the world. On a more personal level for me, I would say the experience working at CIA has been outstanding. Right? There is never a dull day. There is always something going on in the world or some crisis or something that, that needs to be um, written about, collected on, analyzed. There are a multitude of opportunities available to officers that want to do something new. You can go to a new country, you can learn a new language, you can deal with new crises. You, there are new intelligence challenges, and especially in such a complex world, there's never a lack of some intelligence problem to solve. There is enough to do at the CIA to feed anybody that has any kind of intellectual or cultural curiosity. For example, I have served overseas. I have served in conflict zones. I have written products for the president. I have served at the National Security Council. 
I have run human operations and I have run two mission centers. I, I don't know of a career where I could have gotten something as broad as that in one place. But at the end of the day, while every administration's approach to the intelligence community is different and their national security staffing focuses are different, Everyone relies on the CIA and the intelligence community, every administration, regardless of whom they are, for unbiased intelligence and the best assessment possible. And that is truly the mission. So now what I'd like to do, since I've set the stage, is take you back a little bit and tell you about the story of how the Transnational and Technology Mission Center came to be and how I came to lead it. So travel back in time with me to the bygone days of spring 2021. You might want to bring a mask. Bill Burns was sworn in as the director in March 2021. And while he was settling into his new office, enjoying his view overlooking the Potomac River and getting his first taste of the food from the agency dining room, he also was taking a fresh look at how we were organized and he wasn't fully satisfied. He wasn't satisfied with the organization. The food at the agency is decidedly satisfactory. Uh, so just a few months after he started, he commissioned a review. And the review, of, the review group's goals were twofold. One was to identify our most pressing national security challenges. And the second one was to ensure that the agency was properly resourced and aligned to address those challenges. So from the outputs of these working groups, it quickly became clear, not just to him, but to the rest of us, that we needed to ramp up our efforts on technology and China. So to that end, in October 2021, the Director Burns took um, three actions. <coughs> One was he appointed CIA's first chief technology officer. Believe it or not, we had never had one who was just solely there for the agency. The second was he created the China Mission Center. And the third was he created the Transnational and Technology Mission Center, which we call T2MC because, I, as you can imagine, I did not want a mission center that was called TTMC. It just didn't kind of flow. So we are T2MC. Note that it is not the Technology Mission Center, and it's, it's very deliberate as to why we are not and why Transnational is also part of our mission center, and I will get a little bit more into that later. So Director Burns tasked me to launch this new mission center, and three months later, we launched it. So from October to January, everybody was scrambling to create the China Mission Center and the T2 Mission Center. We have two primary mission uh, focus areas. First is to understand the ecosystems of emerging technologies. And we've heard a lot about these technologies. I sat through the, the panels and the talks this morning and they were phenomenal. And I think you'll find a lot of similarities in what our focus areas are and what everybody is kind of gearing around. So we need to understand the ecosystems of these techs, where are their vulnerabilities, how are foreign adversaries taking advantage of these vulnerabilities, and second, we need to use these emerging technology and other transnational threats to drive closer CIA private sector partnership to advance our national security mission. This is the first time CIA has treated technology as an intelligence domain. We are very good at looking at it for like weapons and what else can be done and how to use it and how to exploit it. But looking at technology for technology's sake and what that means was new. And so what we have been able to do in our mission center is better identify the foreign intelligence gaps, task collection against it, and use the full range of the agency's capabilities to uh, get answers to these gaps. So now, and the other part of our, um, before I get into the tech landscape, another part of our role is to identify what I call is a team sport way of approaching these challenges. So we are, we have tended to be very siloed in how we look at things. And so part of our mission center is 
that how do we bring all the experts, and by all the experts, it's all the experts in the intelligence community as well as all the experts in the building against these technology topics because we have some phenomenally smart, deep experts on different technology areas, and they've been focused on the technology for different reasons, but they still understand that technology and what it means. So bringing everybody together is part and parcel of also what we're doing in our mission center. So now let's look at the current tech landscape. We've come a long way in the two years since we were stood up. It's actually almost three now since T2MC was stood up, and the technology landscape has also evolved a lot. All of you well know that we are living in extremely complicated times, facing challenges of strategic competition from a rising and ambitious People's Republic of China and from Russia. And Russia just demonstrates that even diminish, declining powers can have an incredibly disruptive effect around the world. But at the same time, we are confronted with Israel, Hamas, Iran, North Korea. There's just an endless um, array of challenges going on globally. At the same time, there's a revolution in technology which is changing the way we live our lives, the way we fight wars, the way we participate in trade, and the way we're going to operate our militaries. The importance of the tech industry has turned it into the modern day battlefield for global strategic competition. And this revolution in technology is central in the strategic competition with the People's Re Republic of China. So perhaps the most notable tech advancement, and we've heard a lot about it earlier today, is the rise of artificial intelligence. The landmark release of ChatGPT in late 2022 brought the power of AI into the public sphere. There is a lot of excitement in the private sector and in government about the transformative potential of AI-enabled systems. But as you can imagine, and I'm sure many of you also share, there is a lot of confusion, some uncertainty, and concerns about the potential risks of AI. For one, AI has the ability to create and spread disinformation. Publicly available generative AI applications could be used by our adversaries to develop synthetic content and influence public opinion in ways that undermine US interests. We expect foreign states' malicious use of digital information will become more pervasive, more targeted, more automated, and more complex as we go on. We are already seeing signs of this happening. So presidential candidates in Argentina earlier this year used AI to influence their own electorate, suggesting that Using generative AI for influence operations might just become the new norm going forward. The broad availability of this technology also means that AI can act as a great equalizer. And it has the potential to give asymmetrically equipped adversaries outsized digital capabilities. So what do I mean by that? So for example, we have observed that Al-Qaeda ISIS and Hamas have all disseminated propaganda media that was either generated or enhanced using publicly available AI tools. What is also concerning about AI is that a lot of the risks that come with this new technology cannot be mitigated unilaterally. So I agree wholeheartedly with my NSA colleague who talks about the standards uh, boards around the world. and joining those boards and being present at those boards. And the danger of us not, like we could build the guardrails for AI and how to use it and we are going to build it and make sure we use it ethically. But the People's Republic of China and our other adversaries don't have to follow suit. So one of our jobs in T2MC is to understand how our adversaries are developing and using AI. Less consumer facing and possibly more important have been the advances in high performance computing. The ability to leverage large amounts of computing power is a key driver of innovation. And it's 
a driver of innovation in nearly every critical and emerging technology. Surging demand for critical edge semiconductors that enable high performance computing highlights to us why access to these systems is a critical strategic resource. It has also become clear to us that our adversaries and competitors view access to the same high performance computing systems as essential to meeting their own national security objectives. The pandemic also taught us, which was also mentioned earlier today, that it's not just the high end technology we have to worry about. Semiconductors and microchips of all types are used in more places and larger quantities than ever from consumer electronics to cars and everything in between. Supply chain disruptions therefore represent a significant vulnerability. We have made understanding these global supply chains a priority and a core part of our program. We're also tracking developments in financial technologies, or fintech as we call it, the way in which money is used and transferred among people, businesses, and countries continues to change through new payment systems and the use of digital assets such as cryptocurrencies. These alternatives often provide lower costs, faster transfers to the traditional financial institutions. And policies and regulations such as consumer protection sometimes are lagging behind, however. So we look at how fintech can enable illicit activity ranging from fraud to sanctions evasion and how it may disrupt financial stability by altering countries' monetary systems. And there is much more on the horizon. We are anticipating the arrival of next generation communications such as 6G and open radio area networks and we don't want to be caught flat-footed like we were with 5G and Huawei. In the past, we were not treating advances in telecommunications with the same focus that we treat advances in military technology. We've learned that lesson. We are monitoring emerging technologies across the spectrum and considering how they might be relevant to competition with our adversaries in not only the economic and military spheres, but also in the technical areas. Biotechnology is another one, and it is already here in many, many ways. The biotechnology space is massive, ranging from research studies to manufacturing processes, from biological weapons to precision medicine but it is on the cusp of becoming even more ubiquitous. When it does, it will unveil a whole host of privacy and security concerns related to genetic and genomic data. What we want to know and what we focus on in T2 is what are our adversaries doing in this space, what data do they have, and how do they intend to exploit that data, and what does that data mean for U.S. consumer information? For next generation power, that's another area that we've been looking at, especially batteries and nuclear power. The global energy transition and global future energy needs hinge upon the rapid deployment of batteries in applications such as electric vehicles and grid level storage. With this fast pivot toward expanding battery deployment, the mineral supply chains of battery precursor materials such as lithium and graphite are also critical. We are seeking to understand the battery sector better, not just for global economic competitive reasons, but also because of the many potential implications for military operations. Nuclear power is having a bit of a renaissance as well <clears throat> um, around its role in grid decarbonization. We are focused on tracking and understanding the role of next generation of nuclear power plants, especially those that are the small modular nuclear reactors. Some of these technologies are still under development and it's not clear they will be cost competitive with current established technologies like solar and wind. But we are highly interested in their unique capabilities for the same reasons we are interested in batteries for the economic competitiveness and military usefulness. 
So these areas that I just went over make up the six key tech areas that we see as the most critical subjects of global technology competition. And just to quickly recap, they are high performance computing, which covers AI and quantum technology, microelectronics, which includes semiconductors, fintech, which includes crypto as well as central bank digital currencies, next generation com uh, communications, which is 5G, 6G, ORAN, biotech to include DNA forensics, genomics, neuroscience, and synthetic biology, and next generation power, like advanced batteries and nuclear power. So now that I set the stage, I can um, talk a little bit about how we see the People's Republic of China and how they are doing in these technology areas. Director Burns has often said that China and technology are his twin priorities. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap between the China Mission Center and the Transnational and Technology Mission Center. Both of us look at technology, both of us have a China focus. China's rise as a technologi uh, technology competitor has been striking. So in the 90s, China was not a technology leader in any way. Fast forward 30 years, and yes, okay, high-waisted jeans are back, so it might feel like it's the 90s, but it's really not. Um, the tech landscape is unrecognizable. China is now a peer or near peer to the United States in AI, high-performance computing, communications, hypersonics, and more. Beijing is also implementing a whole-of-government effort to boost indigenous innovation and promise self-reliance, and is trying to fast-track its science and technology development through investments, intellectual property acquisition and or theft, cyber operations, talent recruitment, science, scientific and academic collaboration, and illicit procurement. Going through our key technology areas again, you'll see that China is highly competitive in all six. So starting with next generation communications, China is a global leader in 5G technology and got a leg up on us in deploying it around the world and at home. The jury is still out on 6G and beyond. Next up in advanced computing and AI, the United States is currently the leader in AI. We've got strong talent, access to more cutting edge hardware and better software but it is not an insurmountable lead. And the intelligence community's responsibility is to help policymakers understand the current and future threats from abroad. In the race toward quantum computing, the key milestones will be the construction of a large quantum computer with enough computing power. It will probably before this is realized, and I do not anticipate that China will beat us there. But that isn't to say that they are not trying. And once this technology arrives, it has the potential to change the nature of our competition substantially, especially when it comes to data security. Third up is biotech. While the US and Europe currently have the lead in cutting edge research and technology, China's activity in the bioeconomy is primarily in low cost, lower complexity, and higher volume commodities, such as chemicals used to produce drug ingredients. However, there are signs that China is striving to move up the technology ladder in areas such as gene editing technology. China now rivals the United States in DNA sequencing equipment and some foundational research. Beijing's large volume of genetic data potentially positions it to lead on precision medicine and agricultural biote biotechnology applications. China also doesn't have the same concerns about data privacy as we do in the United States. On fintech, the United States continues to, to be central to global trade and financial networks, but China is looking to play a greater role or even dominant, have a dominant role in the international financial infrastructure. China is setting up its own cross-border payment system, which avoids the current SWIFT network, and it's leveraging its commercial influence to gain partners. 
China has also created a central bank digital currency, the ECNY, and is making progress on expanding adoption across the country. So we're going to keep going into next generation power. China dominates the manufacturing of batteries and the supply chain of the materials that go into them. We have seen this story before with solar panels, and it's now repeating with new, uh, other new techno energy technologies. China is the sole or primary supplier for numerous battery components and precursor chemis chemicals, and it controls half of the refining capacity for key battery materials. PRC battery companies are doing more than just manufacturing. They have gotten really good at designing new battery chemistries as well. U.S. battery scientists are still leaders in many areas, but the gaps are closing fast. On nuclear, China has made rapid progress building out its fleet of conventional domestic nuclear power plants. Over half of the reactors completed worldwide during the last decade were built in China. The U.S. and others still have an edge on the design internationally, on the design side, but China is attempting to make progress as well in that area. On microelectronics, I'm sure you all know, uh, China has made rapid progress in advancing their chip-making capacity and sophistication. China is producing advanced chips for cryptocurrency mining, cellular devices, and AI training using existing equipment. By 2025, 40% of all the 28 nanometer legacy chips are projected to be produced in Ch China, just by looking at the number of factories that they intend to start operating in the next several years. We expect China to continue to make advancements in chip design and manufacturing, but we expect them also to face challenges in achieving high quality high volume production of cutting edge chips like those that are produced in the United States and in Taiwan, especially if they do not have access to state of the art extreme ultraviolet lithography tools. So what I want to just leave this section with before I go into the transnational area is the PRC is the most important geopolitical challenge we face for the foreseeable future. China seeks to become a world science and tech superpower and to use its technological superiority for economic, political, and military gain. In the years ahead, nothing will matter more to our success as an organization and to U.S. national security than how well we compete with the PRC. We need to understand the current and future threats from abroad to help us ensure that policymakers are well informed, but also to ensure that the CIA can continue to operate securely around the world and do what we need to, which is recruit foreign spies. Now, I've talked a lot about technology, and I really want to just touch on the other T in our name a little bit. So we cover, in T2MC, we cover a whole host of transnational topics, health security, energy markets, climate security, global supply chain, humanitarian issues, and more. And if you've been paying attention to the news in the past three years, you can imagine that our people have been pretty busy answering policymakers' questions on all of the above. Even still, we sometimes get asked, why does CIA care about these topics? usually with the implication that some of the issues I just mentioned are somehow out of scope for our national security mission. We don't take offense at the question. In fact, it's a question uh, we try to ask ourselves as often as we can. Because although these are obviously important topics, it's critical that we keep our focus on what actually is very critical to national security. Otherwise, we could end up with a very broad portfolio and the entire United States population wouldn't be enough to cover all the, the challenges in the transnational space. But the one reason we do get that question is that folks see security as narrowly focused on if, like, issues with foreign military or political elements. But what we found, especially in T2MC, is that these transnational and technology topics can no longer be siloed. 
either from more traditional, what we call national security concerns, or from each other. And that's why it's so useful to have both of these under one umbrella. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's imagine that there's a crop failure somewhere around in South Asia, and there's a whole lot more to consider than just what actually happened then and there. It is, what are the implications of this failure for the country and the region? What does it mean for the country's upcoming elections? Is there going to be a food shortage? Maybe the country will be able to make up with it with other imports. What does that mean for the global market, especially when markets are already short because of lost output from Ukraine? How could this have been prevented? Maybe farmers could switch to drought-resistant crops. Maybe new AI tools could help better predict damaging weather patterns and resulting crop failures. The bottom line is policymakers are going to want to know what caused this and what can be done about it and how it can be prevented in the future. And we can't fully answer those questions without a multidisciplinary approach. Another example is, let's say a new disease emerges overseas. The same types of questions are going to be asked. And what we would do is work with outside experts and other government agencies to get answers to questions such as, is foreign equipment being used to diagnose this disease, potentially, which would allow potentially bad actors to hoover up medical and genetic data on persons from that country. We rely on, you know, is there going to be, uh, in addition to disease facts, like what happened in this, what are the characteristics, where did it emerge, we're going to be looking at, is it going to create an environment where the disease could spread from populations where their government is not ready to deal with it or where they might not expect to find it? So these are all the types of questions that go on, and we work with all our partners to come up with these answers. And the same principle applies to technology as well. Even when issues on the surface appear purely technological in nature, more often than not, there's a transnational issue at stake, global economic trends, cyber exploitation that impact our core national security um, interests. Foreign foreign example, we know AI has the potential to be an incredible disruptor in many spaces. What, the, what might this mean for national security and world affairs? Automation of common service sector tasks could cause major shifts in the global market for labor. If it is severe enough, it could put additional pressure on people to leave countries that rely on that work and migrate elsewhere. AI is already being used in the biotech space to identify new molecules and help accelerate the development of medicine. But could it just as easily be used to develop new biological and chemical weapons? And as AI gets deployed more readily into the commercial applications, we have to think even more about the potential and risk that comes from it. Imagine what will happen when generative AI is unleashed on financial data or energy market data. Finally, we know that like, to get generative AI and the computing requirements for high performance computing are just increasing. And the, to do that, we will need a lot more data centers. So to start, where will these data centers be located? Will they be highly centralized? Will they be distributed? Which companies will operate them? What level of access will our adversaries have to those data centers? There's also implications for energy demand. Water is needed to cool these facilities, potentially exacerbating water shortages in parts of the world. And we're only going to see more variable rainfall patterns. So what does that mean for where you put a data center? And what can be done about it? So there's a lot of questions that come up that that are in the transnational domain, but are linked to technology. So this growing nexus is the reason why we exist in T2. But I also know that the government isn't the only one thinking about things in this new way. And so I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about what we're doing, but also uh, give you a sense of why we are, want to work so closely with the private sector on some of these topics. Events such as this one at Vanderbilt uh, allow us to come out and speak to people. I mean, for good security reasons, we generally are cloistered away in our building and don't 
talk to the public, and probably the public's very happy we don't either. But, um, but we don't want to, to not talk to people at the cost of losing access to incredible insights that are in the academic and private sectors. There was a time when the US government was the key driver in most major technological innovations. But the balance has shifted, and the pace has shifted. So nowadays, just keeping up with the innovations and the consequences of the emerging technologies is a huge task. But our job is even harder, because we have to get ahead of the curve and see around the corner in order to avoid strategic surprise. We must understand and predict how the technology will influence the most pressing global issues we face. And while CIA's mission may be unique, just like the private sector and academia, we aggressively adapt commercial and open source technologies and continuously monitor the market for technological breakthroughs. We must anticipate how technology will interact with and influence the national security landscape. We also recognize that the technology challenges today are too complicated for CIA to take, tackle solely in-house. The only way for us to keep up with this technology advancements and how our adversaries are leveraging them is through our partnerships with academia and the private sector, as well as with our allies and partners around the world. And this is the only way we're gonna be able to enhance our understanding of global tech trends and applications. So I am here today as part of CIA's effort to deepen and expand in those types of partnerships. And before I conclude, I just wanna leave you with one thought, and it has been said earlier today, so I'm just going to reinforce it. Our national security is directly tied to our economic security. And at the heart of economic security is the health and protection of technological innovation. Since advances in technology, especially those of national security concern, continue at an unprecedented rate, largely in the private sector, ensuring we continue to lead in this domain is a national imperative. So thank you so much for your time today. I think everybody made it through. Um, we all survived the after lunch malaise. But thank you so much, it's been a pleasure. All right, thank you so much, Sheethal, that was, that was tremendous. Uh, I was taking notes, uh, I'm not doing email here. High performance computing, semiconductors, genomics, neuroscience, power, I mean, we have 20, 20 minutes here to talk about a number of things. So uh, I came from a farming community uh, in the Midwest. Your agricultural example, the scenario, kind of a doomsday scenario you talked about resonated with me. And you made me think about an Oppenheimer reference that our chancellor made earlier. Uh, and here, here's kind of the setting up the question. I think the US demonstrates a tremendous um, speed and intent when our back is against the wall to do the hard things that need to be done. And you, you closed with this. How, how do we put ourselves in a position where we're not having to respond so quickly and be reactive, how, how do we become more proactive on those really hard challenges like the ones you laid out? So I think uh, you have hit on something that I have raised internally a lot in, in my office and with my colleagues. We do extremely well as a nation in rowing in the same direction when faced with something we need to respond to. And generally, it is a, a instance where you can see, touch, and feel it. Technology is a little bit more fluid, has no barriers, it's not going to hit us in the face. It is, it is something that's going to come up on us. And to row in that same direction and counter and be proactive is a little harder. I think what we are seeing, though, is you see all of us in government coming out and talking, reaching out to private sector partners, reaching out to, to the academia to say this is a collective. 
And since uh, Russia, Ukraine, I think the private sector also has been much more forward leaning in wanting to work with government as well as academia. So pub public private partnerships, and we heard that in the previous. Uh, I think that's the only way to do it. Panel as well. Okay, no, thank you. Um, uh, you, you also talked a bit about uh, obviously your, your technology focus, but also the, the, the human talent that you've got. Uh, I think you said you have some of the most talented people on the planet who are tackling these challenges. Uh, you made me think of a former student of mine who just uh, linked in me um, a message this morning that she just went to NVIDIA and she had been at Intel. I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, and it made me think about a talk recently by someone who was talking about the competitive landscape in generative AI and the fact that there are, there's a lot of competition over the algorithms in generative AI, but there's no competition at the, at the hardware level. Uh, so in terms of the stack that you think of. So how, how do you think about that? Uh, because I, I can imagine with technology and transnational in your mission center focus, uh, you, you confront that challenge potentially a lot where you have technologies where parts of the technology are competed globally and other parts are not. So do you want to talk to that? So I can, what I can say about that is part of the reason of understanding the ecosystems of the technology will get us to that because I don't think there was a complete understanding of which parts of the, the technology stack or the vertical which parts do we already have a really good hold on the supply chain or there's uh, diversity in it and which ones are single threaded? Once we know that, then you can focus on how to do it. So that's what we have people looking at and working with experts. Yeah, and I, th I, yeah, I think it's interesting, back to your point about the private sector, the fact that you're seeing more partnership, it, it feels like that affords you the opportunity to start to identify proactively maybe where some of those challenges may lie 10, 15 years from now. Definitely. It's, it's not just understanding that, but understanding where that technology is going to go and the potential for that technology and what is needed in terms of what is, what is being developed in the research side that five years from now could be deployed, which allows us to kind of look around that corner and say, can we be positioned to be ready to deal with that when it happens, right? Because when we're looking at things, we're looking at not just for national security and writing for policymakers, but also for our ability to operate overseas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you said it was a team sport, uh, the things that you do in this mission. Um, and that made me think about our, our student population uh, and the talent pipeline. Shout out to our students back there in the corner. Uh, uh, from Vanderbilt, um, and the, the thing that struck me as you described this, the, the CIA mission, you talked a lot about really human development uh, in, in terms of gathering foreign intelligence, and then you pivoted and talked about technology. And a, a colleague of mine teaches a course on autonomy, and he says 30 is a magic number. Um, folks under 30 are very versed in the use of chat GPT and all large language model uh, type technologies. Folks over 30, not so much. And I'm curious, like, how does that, do you see that dynamic, number one? And number two, what, what are the ways in which you're thinking about addressing that? So I don't, I, I don't see that dynamic. I, I think because if there's enough intellectual curiosity, everybody's going to learn. Um, so I haven't seen this, this difference of, I, I don't, I don't want to use ChatGPT or others. I know a lot of people who use ChatGPT. I taught my 80-year-old father to use ChatGPT, and he loves it. Um, not quite sure he knows how to deal with any hallucinations or anything in it, but, you know, it's, perf it's, it's a great tool to do in understanding it until we actually put these large language models and generative AI on data, we don't know how it works. And until, and you gotta get a feel for it, you've gotta be able to use it. But I haven't seen that divide. In oh, okay, in okay, so you shot my anecdotal evidence really, uh, really to the ground. I appreciate that. I thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for destroying my premise and my question. I, I guess, you know, CIA, uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, enough said, not a fair fight, not a fair fight up here. Okay, so back to, back to your, your weighty yes. topics, uh, high-performance computing, semiconductors, genomics, neuroscience. I mean, you, 
you really did cover a lot of thought-provoking, I'm going to say doomsday scenarios, at least in my mind. And so you made me think about the previous panel and the discussion they had around economic uh, partnership with China. Uh, and you yourself said that you can't think about what we're doing in national security with, without thinking about economics. And so my question is, how do you have a productive relationship with China when the People's Republic of China in every transaction, on every, per on every purchase, are potentially gathering and utilizing data uh, to act as an adversary? How do, how do you think about that? Let me see if I can answer this one in a way. I would say from CIA's perspective, that is a risk that we need to keep in mind in every thing that we do and how we operate. It is also one of those that is a, um, we have to warn policymakers, right, of, of implications of certain things and what that means for abilities to, to do certain things. But in terms of consumer policy, we're not going to get involved in that. Okay, okay. But does that, that make sense? That makes, that makes yeah. total sense. And kind of keeping, keeping along the thread, uh, we got a question from the participants here around kind of technological competition in, in areas that you mentioned, including energy storage. Mm -hmm. um, actually, a, a little known fact up the road from us about an hour and a half next to Fort Campbell is one of the largest lithium recovery plants in the nation. No one knows it's up there but it's really critical uh, when it comes to that particular industry, so in terms of you know, batteries right. for EVs. So what are your thoughts on uh, Chinese control of critical minerals and rare earth elements, the, the types of things that are critical to these battery systems, in other countries across the globe and its impact on US-led R&D product development? That was a long question. Right, um, let's see if I got this right. So what does it mean for the US Worldwide, right? That's right. Okay. So I would say the one thing that the United States has and the West has that the PRC does not are friends and allies. And so there has been a growing recognition around the world about the importance of these critical minerals. And there are countries around the world that are also getting a handle of the critical minerals in their countries and working together and jointly to ensure that we have, we are not held hostage, basically, to one country for critical minerals. Right, so comp competition. Competition, but, but doing it on a global scale. Yeah, is, is healthy and, mm -hmm. and leads to robustness and resilience. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that, that makes me think of something else you and I were talking about at a break, which is a, a, a recurring theme, I think we heard General Hawk speak about it, I, I know that you referenced this, which is, uh, well, as the nation's first line of defense, as you described CIA, you talked about the fact that w with the use of technologies that are rapidly evolving like AI comes a responsibility that the U.S. doesn't take lightly. You know, it exercises ethical, legal principles uh, in operating these advanced technologies. Um, our adversaries, I think, as you pointed out, do not do not all do that, and specifically uh, PRC. Um, and so can you talk about not how that weakens the U.S. position and strengthens theirs? I mean, you can certainly see how it would make them more dangerous. But can you talk about how it actually strengthens the U.S. position? Does it have something to do with the fact that it garners us allies in a way that, that China would not? I think it absolutely garners us allies because if you look at standards and guardrails and the ethics of use of data and how we protect, just if you look at the, the HIPAA laws, right? All of those are intended to protect people's privacies. The laws that we abide by, by as intelligence community members, those all ultimately make us stronger when, it, when you're dealing with a country that has no rules because you, you can't get friends and allies, right? There's no like-mindedness. But also, we're not a country that is worried about technology being put on our own data to, to on what's going on. 
the PRC is going to be very worried about AI being put on data inside their country because your whole focus is on protecting the regime. That, that, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the, the risk aversion that would come with. You don't want to put it on, mm -hmm. on your own internal domestic data. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to um, talk a little bit more about the, the technological focus. And again, this, this linkage between technology and transnational Really interesting. Obviously, the CIA had just thought of it because they stood up this mission center, and you're leading <laughs> it. It took us a while to get there. Uh, so, can you can you say more about? So, I've always thought of, of of mathematics, you know, as an engineer, as kind of a universal language in the sense that we we can all speak it and understand it and understand each other mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Is technology like that, or 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 does the fact that we're from different places uh, around the globe does it, does it make technology different? Or is technology somewhat similar to mathematics in the sense that it, it's kind of something that builds a bridge? I think technology is, is similar to mathematics in building a bridge. It has no boundaries. The, the, the technology, the basics of it are going to be the same no matter which language you're speaking in. So I think it is a great unifier. It is also a transnational issue. It's just separate for us because we wanted to put a, a specific focus on technology. So I have, I have two more questions. Um, and one I'm going to take from our previous, uh, our previous panel. There, there was certainly a, a, a passionate uh, description of <laughs> a number of different topics on our supply chain panel. Shout out to, to Kamal Sagi for, for leading such a robust panel. Um, one topic in, in particular that came up uh, is the topic of, you know, let's not just train, I'm going to paraphrase it in my own words, let's not just train the best talent worldwide, let's, let's have them see their future here, uh, you know, working, working here with us uh, uh, in support of, uh, of freedom of the United States, of the way of life here. So how does, how does the CIA think about that? I mean, again, I'm, I'm referring back to your transnational uh, you know, emphasis in your mission. I feel like that would have come up and that you all would have thought about that. I think the way CIA would look at this, the way we look at pretty much anything, is what gives us an advantage and what puts an adversary at a disadvantage. You take an adversary's talent away, you're putting them at a disadvantage. But that would, that would be how we would look at it. Yeah. So you would be in uh, agreement with the, uh, some of the previous sentiments. I'm not saying anything on any policy. <laughs> I'm just saying how I would look at it. OK. But nice try. Again, <laughs> again, I just, oh, it's well done. For, for the participants, <laughs> I want to point out, CIA engineering professor. It's, it's not a fair fight, not even close. Oh, wait, what? No, I work with an engineer on a day-to-day -day basis. He runs circles around me constantly. OK, so it's just me then. Well, thank you. Maybe. Yes. So yes. She thought, I thought we were becoming fast friends. We had that great exchange during the break. We are great friends. And, and now it's just all going engineers. in the wrong direction. All right, so last question. Uh, I think. Everybody's going to hear this question a lot this week. This is a fantastic question. I love ending with this question. So, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, uh, something stirs you in your sleep. Um, what, what are the wicked problems that keep you up at night that wake you up at night? So there, there is one that keeps me up at night, and it has been keeping me up at night since generative AI came out, which is there is a race to get generative AI onto intelligence data. So while the PRC might not want it on its domestic data, every intelligence service worldwide vacuums up data. And I think the first intelligence organization country, not like, won't be a competition internally, but which country's intelligence service puts generative AI on their data first will win. And I want it to be us. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so it's that dream where it wakes you up one night in a race, but then the next night it's it's a pleasant dream because we're because first. We've won. Yes, it's because I'm going to stick won. to that dream that we have won. But it is actually something that 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 we talk about and worry about a lot. That this this is an, a race actually, and we do need to win. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Sheethal, uh, Assistant Director uh, Patal, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Just really appreciate you being here. Great discussion. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for being here. Can we have a round of applause for the director? Well, thank you for that truly fascinating discussion. Um, we now have an hour for networking, which means you can either go and eat a bit more food or make a few calls or talk to each other and be social. Um, and we're then going to reconvene here in an hour's time. And we have a couple of really fantastic, we have a panel to discuss um, questions around the changing face of modern conflict and cyber. And then we have a closing speech from Peter Singer which I've seen a preview of. It's about how to tell effective stories linked to um, security issues. I've seen a preview of it, and I can tell you, you certainly do not want to miss it. It's very thought-provoking. So free to go now and come back in an hour's time. Thank you.
cut and then Awesome. And then the very end is going to be a cap for the end of your name. Okay. Um, and that slide, there'll be a final slide that's like your name and Jillian's name. And it's being asked like email questions. That's the end of it. And Jillian will have her iPad with her questions on it. Um, and you can see at the very, very end. There you go. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Nah, we're... Let's go back. Or no, so two cuts, four cuts. Let's go back, uh, back, one more, back, one more. There we go. Awesome. Um, let's leave it up here, um, and we're good. And then uh, I don't need a, a lapel mic. And then how are we doing?
Well, welcome back, everybody. And I hope you had a chance to refresh yourselves, both in mind and spirit, and also to catch up and chat and meet new people um, and do all the networking that's so valuable at these events. Um, I found the last few discussions absolutely compelling. Um, very, very interesting indeed. And we're now going to continue this theme talking about cyber and the changing face of modern conflict, which is going to be moderated by Nilufa Razi Hao, who is also from Vanderbilt, a distinguished um, visiting professor, but whose own career, if you look in the biography, um, exemplifies the type of public-private partnerships that have been so much at the center of the discussions today. So over to you, Nilufa. I'm used to being mic'd. Um, thank you so much, Jillian. I'm so thrilled to be having this conversation today about cyber and the changing face um, of modern conflict. You guys have heard it today. It's just not possible to talk about China or strategic competition without talking about the different elements of cyber and how it impl impacts that relationship. And we're going to cover some of the topics that you may have heard about already today. But we're going to talk, talk about them in a little bit more in depth with this incredible panel of experts who we have. So I'd like to first introduce them. Mo Khalil, um, sitting at the end, is the Associate Laboratory, Laboratory Director for the National Security Sciences at Oak Ridge National Labs. And he guides the research and development of science-based solutions to counter critical threats to public safety, national defense, energy infrastructure, and the economy. So that's a pretty big <laughs> and important portfolio. Next to him, we have Robin Klein, who is Dr. Robin Klein, who's the Director of Cyber Policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where she leads the development and implementation of US DOD strategy and guidance to address foreign militia cyber threats, enabling military campaigns and contingency planning. Previously, Dr. Klein served as, on the National Security Council as a Director of Weapons of Mass Destruction and Terrorism Threats. Next to Robin, we have Major General Lorna Malik who assumed her current duties as commander of the, of the Cyber National Mission Force in January of this year. Prior to her current assignment, she served as the National Security Agency's Cybersecurity uh, Directorate, Deputy Director for Combat Support. Um, uh, Major General uh, Malak was born in J uh, Kingston, Jamaica, immigrated to Brooklyn, and enlisted in the Marine Corps. She was selected for the Marine Corps Enlisted Commissioning Education Program in 1991, and uh, the rest, so to speak, is history. And finally, we have Thompson Payne, who leads product management strategy business operations for Anthropic, uh, a frontier AI research lab with safety research and deployment at scale as its core mission. He's also a member of the adjunct faculty here at Vanderbilt. So I think we have a great representation of cross-section of uh, Department of Defense, National Labs, intelligence community, and the private sector. So I want to start by turning into the title of this panel, which is Cyber and the Future of Conflict. In the early days of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, many pundits posited that cyber war was simply not playing an important role in the conflict. Of course, that point of view ignored the months of sleepless nights that Ukrainian cyber defenders, together with their coalition partners, their hunt forward operators, as well as the private sector incident, uh, incident responders and tech companies spent defending against Russian cyber operations, starting long before Russian soldiers set foot on the ground in February 2022. As the extent of these cyber operations became better understood, the perspective shifted. So Robin, starting with you, can you set the context for us? As you look at these recent conflicts, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, or Israel, Hamas, how has cyber impacted modern conflict? Sure, thanks, uh, Nilu. Um, first, a personal point of privilege. Um, I always caveat when I talk about Russia, Ukraine, uh, the lessons that we can learn from it. Um, you know, the, the public reporting indicated that uh, Putin believed this would be a very short-term uh, conflict, and, and the uh, Ukrainians, uh, you know, to, to the degree uh, leading up to the conflict, um, uh, you know, expected uh, the the invasion that was to to follow that was on a shorter timeline, according to public reporting. So, the degree to which going into conflict, cyber, uh, cyber was integrated into war planning on, on either side. I think we um, should, should 
caveat um, our, our expectations is how this would play out for a different type of conflict, perhaps that wasn't um, uh, potentially uh, let, you know, long, longer term uh, in duration and subject to, to more planning. Um, I also want to make clear that when we talk about cyber and conflict, we're talking about a variety of different things. We could be talking about cyber espionage, cyber attacks, so cyber effects, um, and we could be talking about cyber-enabled uh, information warfare. Um, but to Nilu's point, um, I think that uh, despite the predictions of cyber war, what we are seeing is cyber in a conflict. And so how we judge uh, the role of, of cyber in this conflict, I think, provides some interesting insights. Um, one that I would suggest is uh, there is no cyber silver, silver bullet. We haven't seen that play out. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't impactful cyber operations that are conducted, uh, but I think some of the predictions, uh, maybe looking back 10 years ago, uh, are not uh, bearing fruit in the conflict uh, that, that there will be a cyber, a cyber silver bullet. Um, I also would point out that cyber, cyber is hard. So cyber uh, options, uh, opportunities, uh, they don't fall off a conveyor belt the same way that ammunition uh, can be produced. So we have to, we have to consider um, what we're talking about, whether it's from an espionage standpoint, cyber attack uh, standpoint, or other. Um, but when I look at Russia, um, I think about uh, how their use of cyber in this conflict demonstrates that they don't care about blowback. Uh, to me, what we see uh, is, a, is a country unlike ours where we promote uh, uh, the voluntary uh, peacetime norm of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Um, the, the Russians we've seen, whether it's kinetic attacks, but certainly also involving cyber, uh, they are conducting attacks against distinctly, exclusively public uh, 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 targets, services to the public uh, in, in particular, um, which is not uh, how I think uh, yeah, from a war planning standpoint, that is not how the Department of Defense uh, focuses its efforts. Um, so that's an interesting insight about a country like Russia, how they are willing to use cyber. On the Ukraine side, um, I think what we have seen is a tech-savvy workforce, um, not just limited to cyber, but certainly also including cyber, that um, where they lack the production scale uh, on the Russian side, um, they have come up with innovative solutions to technical, technological uh, problems, um, which has benefited them um, in cyberspace and beyond. Um, I think for the Ukrainians as well, what we've seen play out is excellent resilience on, on their part. I think that that is the, a reflection not only of the Ukrainians' commitment to enhancing their cyber uh, resilience, but the work of commercial firms working with the Ukrainians, U.S. and partner countries, um, and so they have been able to weather and continue the fight uh, despite uh, Russian efforts. Um, a few other quick points. Um, I think in the conflict, we have seen the role of non-state uh, actors or entities uh, playing out um, on both sides, which introduces some interesting dynamics into the, the role of cyber in conflict. And I think the, the additional point of um, uh, judging the success of uh, the, the uh, success of the integration of cyber with other tools of national uh, power um, in the war context, the question remains whether we've got the cocktail mixed right, whether it's on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side, and the importance of being able to do that so that it's not just a one and done uh, kind of uh, uh, employment of cyber in wartime, but it is integrated in a fashion where together with other uh, aspects of, of power uh, makes sense and produces a result that um, is measurable and distinct. Thank you, Robin. You touched on a lot of points that we're going to dig into in a little bit. 
Uh, General Maylock, uh, you're the commander of the Cyber National Mission Force, and while you took over in January, which is only a few months ago, you were with the Cybersecurity Directorate. What about for the folks who are actually running these uh, hunt forward missions and um, supporting our allies in times of conflict? Uh, what's the reality, uh, the ground truth, in terms of the role of cyber in warfare? So, Nilu, and, and frankly, the entire Vanderbilt team that put this together, I just want to say thanks. Um, what you're going to hear from me is, you know, a commander who's really, really excited about the mission that we have and the warfighters and civilians that help us and, frankly, you know, our industry partners that helped us uh, position our, our uh, ally, Ukraine, uh, to succeed a against the Russians, at least to continue to persist against the, Russian, the Russians. Um, what we did earlier, you heard General Hawk talk about it, was how intelligence drove some of the successes that you're hearing about, uh, for, at least on the Ukrainian side. What we're learning from a Russia-Ukraine perspective is the power that, we don't talk a lot about that, but the power of the work that we did early on on the defensive side, where re Ukraine built that resilient uh, uh, ecosystem, working with commercial partners, right, working uh, with some of the company, I mean, non-traditional partners and working with the United States. So from a Cyber National Mission Force perspective, we have uh, what we call Defend Forward, where we're building trust with partners, right, so we can operate in, in crisis at the speed of trust. We send, and I'll give you an anecdote, at the onset of Russia-Ukraine, we had young men and women on the ground in Russia. I'm sorry, in, in uh, Ukraine. I hope they, they weren't in Russia. If they were, they didn't tell me. But they were on the ground in, in Ukraine. Um, they were on the ground in Ukraine, and uh, one, a young, you know, young officers and some civilians that we sent forward. And what they did was they identified indicator, indicators of compromise. And throughout the war, we've shared thousands of indicators, and we found and shared thousands of indications of compromise with industry partners, right? So we found them in, in, in uh, Ukraine. And what we're able to do is work with industry and then protect, you heard General Hawk talk about this this morning, the entire global ecosystem. And so we share this with partners who have apertures that see this threat in a different way than we do, right? And then we work with them to create the anecdote, right? Or the solution to the problem space, and then we again we make uh, we lift the ecosystem for ourselves and our allies. So it's you know what we're learning from Russia Ukraine is you're going to see I/O influence operations. You're going to see cyber used to enable those operations. You're going to see dis disinformation, and we're also seeing the rise of hacktivism. And so t the technology has been democratized. The barrier to entry is really low. So everybody is going to come to the fight on both sides of the equation, folks that are, are with us or against us. And so how do we you know, build, whether it's commercial industry with our universities, uh, with our partners and allies, build partnerships now, share technology with, uh, uh, based on our shared values to be able to operate at the speed of trust. And so for us, that, that's what we mean when we say we're doing uh, campaigning with partners and allies and the US government. It's about integrated deterrence. How do we stitch the mosaic together where we've got the entire fabric of our, art, our partners and allies using their authorities and our authorities to impose costs on our adversaries? Thank you. And I just want to remind the audience that you can send in questions um, to the email address above. And I have my phone here that I'll check every once in a while. Um, Thompson, you not only co-authored a paper on U.S.-China uh, tech race um, for this other university <laughs> on the West Coast that we won't name, um, but you also spent time uh, as an exchange student studying law at Peking University. Um, and so you have finger feel for how the Chinese think and the Chinese culture. What are the Chinese taking away from, from the recent conflicts? What are they learning? I'm glad you mentioned my law school days. If anyone wants to talk about the connection between Marxist-Leninism and uh, uh, tort law, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, 
I, I think uh, I, I'm really going to echo a lot of what's already been said here. I love, actually love this idea of uh, cyber weapons don't fall off the conveyor belt and just the democratization of, of technology that we've seen in the, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, I mean, just to couch this in the larger arc of uh, the China uh, uh, CCP development model over the last several decades, uh, China has a visceral, visceral, visceral connection, understanding of the connection between uh, technological supremacy and national security. This goes back to the century of humiliation that they experienced from the opium wars up till 1949. And if you look back at, I'll, I'll plagiarize Egan, Evan uh, Fagenbaum's research on China techno warriors, going back to the earlier nuclear program they had in the 1950s, they deeply, deeply understood this connection between economic development, national security, military security, and uh, uh, technological development. Um, that was then uh, accelerated even, or even more emphasized in the Gulf, first Gulf War, uh, 1989, 1990, where they saw just how far out ahead the U.S. was to where China was militarily. And so China, you, you can bet that China is following the Russia-Ukraine conflict war, not closely just from a sanctions perspective in terms of how it might impact China if they take some somewhat analogous action, uh, uh, but also they are certainly following the technological developments here as well. And I do think the most interesting thing we are seeing is the, the cheap availability, it's almost like the first hackers war, the cheap availability of, of um, cheap technology that you can fold into a number of different kind of asymmetric uh, uh, investments. And I think asymmetric investments would be a word that would characterize a lot of China's uh, military investments since 1989. So touching on technology and innovation, Mo, our national labs are on the front line of really doing the deep research for next generation innovation. How are we adapting as we're learning from uh, these conflicts and from what's going on on the battlefield? So a lot of um, you know, the work at the national labs uh, focus both on IT security and also cyber physical security. And in the, nas the US national labs, we focus a lot on the electrical grid. Uh, the electrical grid is a fairly complex machine uh, you know, there's about 3,000 companies operate the electrical grid, uh, 55,000 uh, substations. And then we added more complexity to it just recently with, uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, Build Back Better, right, with all of the clean energy that we're trying uh, to deploy. Uh, and so that actually increases the attack vector. So the U.S. national labs are focusing with the industry, working with the industry, focusing a lot on the back door, not the front door. I think our utilities are really pretty good at the IT security. We, we, we know about like the colonial pipeline, you know, it was an IT type thing, but it's because of financial type uh, issues, you know, we in, you know, ran into the problems we ran into. So we're focusing a lot on the, on the back door. And so there is a lot of work we're doing in terms of, um, you know, standing up centers to look at the energy threat assessment, you know, be able to detect uh, malware or threat, cyber threats, share information with the utilities, and build mitigation strategies. Uh, we also, like at Oak Ridge, we're doing something in the south, southeast, the Southeast Regional Cyber Security Center, because a lot of times you can actually camouflage certain things, uh, depending on, say, weather issues you have with hurricanes, etc. So we're doing something like that in the south, southeast, what we're hoping that will actually be expanded else, elsewhere. But there is a lot of other research activities that we're trying to do. I think earlier in the day, folks talk about you know, cybersecurity by, by design, uh, you know, resiliency by design, a lot of the automated detection and mitigation uh, of cyber threats or also vulnerabilities. And also we're looking at post-quantum era and you know, quantum key distribution. There's some really examples that the national labs are working together on it. And I think you know, one of the important thing is with these kind of threats, we need to think differently and work with each other different than the past. Because we need to accelerate our technology development cycle and deployment of our efforts. As you talk about IT networks, General Hawk this morning um, referenced the recent Chinese cyber operation Volt Typhoon, uh, which targeted uh, US critical infrastructure. Um, the NSA, CISA, FBI put out a joint advisory in, in February describing this operation as one where the People's Republic of China's state-sponsored cyber actors are seeking to pre-position themselves on IT networks for disruptive or destructive cyber attacks against US critical infrastructure 
in the event of a major crisis or conflict with the US. So essentially, the PRC is, is prepping the battlefield um, with these types of operations. Um, how vulnerable are we? And I'm just going to put this out to the whole group to see who wants to jump in and, and answer this question. Um, so, I mean, I'll start. I was a CIO for the United States Marine Corps, um, and then, you know, my time at uh, the, the Cybersecurity um, Directorate. I think we're, we've got a ton of work to do, and that's what the Volt Typhoon activity highlighted for us, is that, you know, you heard General Hawk talk about it this morning, the fabric along some of the IT, the OT, the ICS SCADA, it's aged. And what this full typhoon activity, I don't know if um, our adversaries wanted this or not, but it has been a call to action across the United States government, and frankly, the US writ, writ large to move. And so, I mean, we can, you know, some of these, um, these sector risk management areas, I mean, even energy, we're doing things now in terms of thinking about what do we do with the fabric that we have to become more resilient, right? And so the answer, the solution space is not just, you know, buy new tech and more, and, and more cyber, but how do we, you know, if the power grid goes down, what is our, you know, what is our, what is our, what is our alternative? And so you, you're seeing that across a lot of these sectors um, as we think about how we respond, because the, the objective of this full typhoon and all the activity that we're seeing from the PRC is to really to create, you know, foment terror inside the United States as a part of their three strategies, right? Um, to do information operations, to make sure that we never leave the shores of the of the of the United States. And so I think, you know, how, you know, there has been a ton of good work going on in terms of let's get our, our, our act in gear with industry partners. These partnerships that you're seeing that are coming out of this full typhoon activity would have never happened a year ago or, or more, right? Where industry partners coming forward and saying, hey, look, we share data with them, not what we know, not how we know it, but what we know, and they provide us their intel because I will tell you, um, there are companies out there that have mapped the globe and have data that we could not uh, even begin to understand because that's not our remit. And so when we when we put these our data sets together with their data sets, we are being a, we're a better able to see our vulnerabilities. The other piece, Nilo, is now we know, right? We a year ago, two years ago, we didn't know what the Chinese were doing in our in, in, in our infrastructure. So now that we know, what do we do? And that's build the right partnerships, build the right resilience to be able to persist against the, because again, it's, it's, you know, we've talked about, Chancellor talked about this morning at breakfast, this idea of game, game theory of warfare. We've got to play to play, it's checkers and chess. We've got to play to play, we've got to play to win, right, but we've got to continue to play. So the game is both, um, you know, I, I'm, another author has said, it's both finite and infinite. We, we have to do both. Do we have a great sense of what the Chinese have remote access to, especially within the energy sector, and how has the energy sector responded to Volt Typhoon? So I think, first of all, uh, uh, maybe we don't. You know, it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of hidden things when it comes to the operational uh, technologies. So I think one can look at this from the utilities uh, point of view. So our utilities, as I mentioned earlier, they posted their uh, activities when it comes to IT front door. They put a lot of effort there. But in terms of OT systems, a lot of the controllers, you know, the SCADA system has a lot of, you know, copyrights and so on, and that's fairly vulnerable. Uh, so, you know, backdoor stuff is, is very important. There's a lot of things communicated through satellite, uh, wireless communication, and also we need really to factor insider threat when we think about that. Somebody can camouflage, you know, the control of you or, you know, plug a thumb drive into, into a controller and something like that. An important really thing uh, that I really believe we're vulnerable quite a bit uh, to it when it comes to um, you know equipment that we put on the electrical grid. Uh, now a lot of the equipment suppliers are willing you know for you know us collectively to look at their at their uh, software and hardware. I think earlier in the day somebody talked about the bill of materials for software and hardware. I think that's fairly important to be able to look at the provenance and the origin of every bit of code and every bit of, of hardware. 
especially, you know, when we look at what we deployed, you know, in the electric grid, five, we're, we're going to put 500,000 EV chargers on the electrical grid. I think that, to me, is a, a huge, uh, you know, vulnerability for us. Now, in terms of, I think, a public-private part partnership, the Department of Energy has been doing really a great job in trying to work with the utilities. I mentioned the example of ETEC, but in terms of pushing research into real, real things. So out-of-band sensors is, is one of the areas we're working on at Oak Ridge and the side, side channel type thing. So being able you know, to look at all of these signatures and detect if there is a malware or not. Likewise, you know, in terms of a, a heartbeat of some of these electronics, you know, if you inject a signal on the in, you know, on one side, on the outside, on the output, you look at it, is it changing, is it not changing? The, I'm proud of the national labs working together with the utilities on being able to predict anomalies and things like that. So there's a lot of that that, that is, is happening, but in, in all honesty, I think a big issue is the supply chain and our lack of understanding of everything about we're putting in our devices and so on. And again, you know, the kind of what we have at the edge with our fridges, with all of the stuff we're putting on the edge, so that also increases the attack vector, and we really don't have a lot of solutions yet there. I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into tech and innovation. General Hawk this morning had a great um, sentence. He said, the fast will eat the slow which I thought was exactly right, and it's just getting faster. And we've learned over the past decade that as the rate of tech innovation increases and accelerates, it's gonna have a compounding effect. It's not just linear. And, um, and it's gonna impact modern warfare. Uh, Peter Singer, who's our closing keynote speaker today, uh, recently published an article um, in which he wrote, in just the last few months, the battlefield has undergone a transformation like never before, with visions from science fiction finally coming true. Robotic systems have been set free, authorized to destroy targets on their own. AI systems are determining which individual humans are to be killed in war, and even how many civilians are to die along with them. And of course, in the article, he talks about Ukraine's use of the Saker uh, Scout uh, quadcopters, um, which can find, identify, and attack Russian military objects on their own, as well as Israel's AI platform, which has three elements to it, the gospel, um, which considers millions of data items from everything from drone footage to seismic data, um, and marks buildings in Gaza for destruction from airstrikes. Lavender, which is another system, does the same thing for people, ingesting everything from cell phone to WhatsApp data, um, and group membership to set rankings about how likely someone is to be a Hamas member or a Hamas leader. And all of this is tracked by a system called Where's Daddy, which sends a signal when they return to their homes where they can be bombed. So um, depending on the seniority of the particular Hamas leader uh, uh, determines the parameters that are set for acceptable uh, casualty rates. So um, Thompson, you, you've written about the U.S. tech, uh, U.S.-China tech innovation challenge. Can you set the, a context for us in terms of what's at what's at stake here? Yeah, um, it's it's hard it's hard to answer this question with not kind of talking about the AI space and where it's going. I don't know if you're ready for me to jump there, but I can I can maybe hold off a little bit. Uh, we'll go there. I promise. Okay, um, <laughs> but. I, again, back, uh, not to be repetitive here, but I do think there is this visceral connection you see in the CCP between technological supremacy and national security. And um, uh, whoever leads in next generation technologies will often lead not just economically, uh, which, as we know, is a country that has had, you know, at times a quarter of the world economy and 5% of the population, but has in, uh, influence across the world that's more com commensurate with the size of our economy than our population. If China's economy grows and they can lead technologically as well, that their influence across the world will grow too. And that's not even talking about military investments. Now, when your military reflects uh, the latest advances in technology, you also have a leverage uh, and an influence in the world that I think China wants uh, to uh, advance its interests in the same way that the U.S. has, or different way, but in, this, uh, in the same vein that other countries do as well, including the U.S. And so I do think that's why this is so central to the competition today, and especially 
and again, I'm biased here because I'm in this world with AI, it does feel like we are on the cusp of a generational change in technology. Uh, that we are moving into a new era with uh, technologies like quantum, like AI, and so being at the forefront of that will determine who leads in the next chapter. I just wanted to jump in on, on that point. Uh, I think it might have been the 2018 National Defense Strategy, if my memory is serving me correctly, but uh, that said something to the effect of uh, success will go not to the country that innovates technology, but to the country that is able to integrate the technology to its ability to fight. And so I would just know that tech, you know, technology innovation is happening all around us and at a rapid clip and you know it is exciting and scary and all of that at the same time. Um, but I think you know our ability to uh, integrate it from a DOD standpoint, um, but you know it, it would apply uh, across other sectors, economic sectors, et cetera. Um, into our processes and our ability to, you know, um, prosecute uh, whatever form the fight is taking place in is an important consideration. It's, it is not available to every actor, every entity, every state that they can integrate effectively. It's interesting that our allies are integrating and operationalizing these platforms uh, before we have a need um, to do that. Do we have an asymmetric advantage? And if, if we do, what is our asymmetric advantage when it comes to innovation and technology? So one of the things you heard from our boss, my boss this morning is, you know, this idea of the partnerships that we've been developing with industry, that's our superpower, right? Our people are superpower too, but the technical brains that we have that this nation insources into the companies and the industry that we have is, is, is really our advantage. And so that's why you see the National Security Agency and Cybercom looking to where industry does technology development well. We're gonna look to insource that technology to give us that first mover, that asymmetric advantage. Because that's what we're seeing um, across, you know, as you look at Russia, Ukraine, and Israel, Hamas. It's, how do you, it's, a, it's kind of a David and Goliath scenario in, in terms of Russia, Ukraine. How do you create an asymmetric advantage over an adversary who at, on the surface appears to have a, you know, a better war fighting position, more, a, a more superior equipped army than you do? And so it's not fighting on the battlefield, it's fighting around all the other instruments of national power to be able to deliver, um, the, to deliver the victory that, it, however we define victory today, right? Uh, because it really is, um, it, it really has changed, I mean, uh, over time as to what we think victory is. It's interesting because when, you know, five years ago, if we talked about non-state entities, we would be, or non-state actors would be talking about terrorists. Today, there are non-state entities that we run operations on and non-state entities we run operations with. And those entities can be individuals, billionaires who maybe have next-gen comms uh, capabilities that they can deploy in wartime faster than large satellite companies can, or they can be our private sector, whether it's our tech companies, our incident responders, et cetera. Um, how good are we um, in terms of partnering? The, the, we talk about public-private partnership Probably every panel has talked about the importance of public-private partnership. It's becoming even more important as private sector is, develop is delivering war-like capabilities and doing things that used to be uniquely in the purview of governments to do. Yeah, so just from our perspective, Morgan was up here today and just, you know, from my time over on the agency side, all the weapon systems that we build today are a computer, right? You know, a submarine is a computer underwater. An airplane is a computer in the air. You know, everything has a computer. So understanding that, we think it's really, really we know it's really important to be able to get in a, really, a relationship with some of these companies. For example, I mean, you, you use the satellite analogy, but it's all the capabilities that we send to, to Ukraine. It's getting into a relationship with that company to help that company understand its vulnerabilities, you know, left of the threat. So when we are on the battlefield, 
we are intimately familiar with the vulnerabilities of that system because we know the adversary is going to exploit it. And so that's the relationship that we see in either building new capability, but if the capability is aged, we get uh, in a relationship with that partner to go, how do we protect? What are the vulnerabilities in your system? So when we're using it on the battlefield, like Russia, there's a number of systems of partners, of companies that we've you know, entered into relationships with you know, enable the partner to one, protect, you know, their company in terms of you're not seeing that company being exploited because we're sharing what we know, um, but also it protects our warfighters on the battlefield. So it's this virtuous cycle of a relationship with the company back here, left of the threat, so when we deploy, we're not, um, we're not living with those vulnerabilities in reality. One thing I was going to mention, uh, you know, over the years we at Oak Ridge National Lab and the U.S. Department of Energy partnered with uh, mainly the chip manufacturers. And in 2019, you know, Secretary Perry came to Oak Ridge with uh, Jensen Hong, the CEO of NVIDIA. And Jensen said uh, he actually had four bets uh, on the company at that time. I'm sure he had more now. But uh, two of them were with Oak Ridge National Lab at the time. One of them to do double precision on, on the GPUs, and the other one to do error correction. So I think we, you know, like the government or its labs and, and, and our universities, we're good really at partnering because we're really innovators and we can actually transition, you know, these solutions to the, to the companies. We do the same thing today with the, with the utilities. But I, I really believe, you know, the sense of urgency and the size of a scope that we're facing today requires a little different thinking about partnerships and how do we create new ecosystems for innovations and the role of our universities and the role of our labs, the role of the government and the role of the companies. I think if we continue on the same path, we will not be able to outpace the adversaries. We need a new framework of thinking about these partnerships. Hey, so, uh, please go ahead. No, go ahead. Just to underscore what Mo said, and that's what we're thinking, we've thought about at Cybercom. Inside of the Cyber National Mission Force, we have an organization that is focused on just that. So you, talk, you heard Morgan talk about, and General Hawk talk about the, ten th the thousands of companies that we're partnered with. On the military side, we have um, partnerships with, with specific con companies discreetly to get after, hey, how do we do this differently? one with the companies. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think there's probably a meme or a myth out there that um, there are people in the government who don't really understand new technologies and that's a barrier to adoption here. And I don't think that has been anyone's experience in the area I'm in. Uh, I think people feel like a lot of people in the government nationally really get the new technologies. Um, that being said, I'd be lying if it was, and I'm not speaking for my company, I'm speaking for kind of the tech industry more broadly. I'd be lying if I said it's just as easy to work with the uh, national security uh, customers as it is to work with Walmart. Um, and I think that uh, that's not just because of bureaucracy, that's not just because of sales cycles, there's bespoke technology requirements uh, for a, a, a tech or SaaS company to work with a government customer. And so I do think those are, um, that might be an area where an adversary might have an asymmetrical advantage where they can work uh, more swiftly to integrate, uh, as Robin said, new technologies into what they do. I think this is a great pivot to AI, um, which is a place where private sector is, um, you know, it, we talk about the geopolitics of AI all the time, but the truth is that it's gonna be driven by private sector. It is, the advances in AI are not gonna be driven by governments. Um, Thompson, this is what you do for a living. Um, can, from your, what are the core concepts for thinking about AI risk and opportunities, especially with respect to cyber warfare? I think there's a few concepts that I'd really lean into here. One is an idea, the concept of scaling laws. And uh, scaling laws refers to a research paper that was put out four years ago, uh, January 2020, actually authored by a few of the co-founders of, of Anthropic, where I work. And it's this idea that even without any kind of targeted additional innovation, if you just throw compute, uh, more compute, more data, and into a bigger model, those models become exponentially more intelligent. And when they become more intelligent, we actually don't know how intelligent they will be or in what new ways they will be intelligent. Those new capabilities reveal themselves to us once the model is trained, which is pretty scary. Um, uh, the, and I'll add on top of this, the, um, 
scaling laws are, uh, are accelerating even more so because we are adding targeted innovations on top of those model trainings. So hardware is getting better. Algorithms are getting better. We're getting smarter in how to use data. So you're just adding these multiplier effects. Neil, you mentioned compounding effects of technology earlier. That is happening aggressively in uh, frontier large language models. And so I, I think about, uh, just to get a sense of how fast this is progressing, I think about a uh, legal tech CEO I was having lunch with recently. He was trying to get a sense of what to expect from how fast these models are improving in terms of intelligence. And I said, imagine you know, last year's models being like a college intern, and this year's models being like a 1L or a 2L at law school. Maybe next year or the year after, the model will be like a fourth year associate at a law firm, and maybe in a couple years, it'll be a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell. <laughs> And, and human intelligence is not the limit on these models. So it just keeps going upwards after that. And this is happening very, very rapidly. In terms of what these models are good at, they're good at knowledge work. So anything a human can do at a computer. And that doesn't mean just at a laptop. If computers control a helicopter, then they'd be good at that too, right? But it's any, anything a human can do at a computer. One of the first areas of knowledge work that appears to be taking off, and one of the first areas we saw product market fit in LM technology in the market was coding. Right? It was GitHub Copilot that really took off as, as very clean, clear product market fit. And so as you think about cyber warfare, this is an area where models are getting better, faster, sooner on this exponential curve that we're seeing. And so I think there's a lot of issues to grapple with there, and we don't have a lot of time to grapple with them. How do we deal with the defensive and offensive implications of this, right? So how do we get as good at, at anticipating the counter threats and how do we ensure responsible deployment? I may look to you all for that. <laughs> so so I, I would say uh, on the defensive and offensive uh, capabilities utilizing AI, it's really a cat and mouse thing, right? Okay, so both are advancing. And to Tom's point, uh, you know, uh, with AI, you know, you're able to do a lot bigger scales and larger scales. And so you're improving on the accuracy and so on. But I think the big, the, big, the big thing in my mind is being a, if you want to deploy something in the field, you want to make it operational, you need to have assurances that actually it works, it's responsible, it's explainable, trustworthy, right? And so there's a lot of research that needs to be done and a lot of work that needs to be done to get to, get to that stage. And I, I realize, you know, the discussion we had earlier saying, well, China would do A, we'll deploy B. But I think in our case, I think it behooves us, you know, to put our minds together and look at assured AI. So we need to do a lot of testing, evaluation, and be able to explain, you know, the results. I think uh, our soldiers or whoever is not going to use these capabilities in the field uh, unless they trust, actually, that, that we're going to do the right thing. And I think that's important. So, so Mo to your point about operating at the speed of trust, I think it's yes, and we have to do both, right? Right now, you can use an AI large language model and troll the internet, and you can find, look for zero days, and you can employ them. That's what, um, you know, that's what we're seeing on the malicious cyberspace, right? There's so many ways where, um, uh, these ransomware brokers can find exploits and, and detonate them, or nation states can use them. And so the question for us is, how do we fight the now now, which is enable or our defenders and our operators to leverage the technology to, um, to be able to defend against these, uh, these capabilities that, have, um, that, that our adversaries are using now, and at the same time, we need to be able to, to think how do we make that, you know, kind of, you know, next generation leap in the technologies uh, and let the industry help us do that. So at the end of the day, you've got to be able to do both. We've got to, for us, we've got to protect civil liberties. We've got to, yes. you know, um, operate in accordance to our norms and values. But at the same time, the expectation is that, you know, we should be able to, um, as, if you think about, you know, ransomware, Echo, the ransomware ecosystem, if you think about the exploits that you can generate using this technology, we have to be able to um, contest this kind of activity from malicious cyber actors. And so I think the answer is twofold. You've got to move now, but you've also got to make sure that we balance against the things that we hold value, we, we value. 
I was just going to add that you know one thing that really worries me is the you know potential for uh, uh, generative AI to create uh, information operations capabilities for adversaries and and you know I live in a world where uh, the the more cowbell uh, ring is is happening uh, constantly and uh, there's just not enough folks on uh, you know working in government who will be able to scour you know the uh, the uh, internet for or and and analyze all of the potential uh, uh, nor, nor do we want the government to be doing that, I think. But, uh, you know, potential uh, disinformation uh, models that may be generated covertly by a foreign nation. And I really think um, I would encourage uh, Vanderbilt and, and other uh, uh, academic private sector entities um, that hold uh, public trust uh, to become centers of excellence for providing uh, that kind of analysis, trusted analysis to the American public, to the, uh, to, you know, the global community in, in some respects, uh, to be able to fill in uh, those gaps. It's not really a public-private partnership issue as much as we're all, we're all living in the same uh, informational ecosystem. Um, government can't uh, do everything, and these models uh, and capabilities will offer opportunity for malevolent use uh, by some and, and the ability to uh, assess that and provide um, trusted information to the public on a timely basis is just a critical uh, capability that I think the private sector and academia is uh, well positioned to, to support. Could, Nila, can I just say, I mean, so I talked about a little bit about the dark side, but this enables us to also move fast. And so there is a lot of capability where we're looking at using this to enable our workforce to, you know, the mundane tasks, let's, you know, let's, Let's let the technology do the mundane tasks so we can do the varsity level work. And so it's a balanced conversation that we're trying to have about how do we leverage, you know, everything, there's a dark side to everything. So how do we optimize around the opportunities and where the technology also are, offers us opportunities to get after the bad actors? We're gonna take those too. But again, we're not, we, right now at least, we're not in the corner in a fetal position with an abacus, right? There's opportunity here, and it's, it's partnerships like this that enables us to be able to, up, not just this, but with our allies and partners who are thinking the same thoughts. They share the same values we do, and, and my money is on us that we're going to come up with a solution. I think that's extremely well said from where I sit as well. Um, with the introduction of any new powerful technology, there, there are benefits and adverse impacts too, right? And I think the, uh, the opportunities of this technology are extremely exciting to leverage in national security and elsewhere, of course, drug discovery, scientific research. There's so many applications where instead of one postdoc or clinician working on something, you can have 100 and working <laughs> faster, right, uh, uh, with AI. Um, I think another piece to be optimistic about is America is in the lead right now. And that actually gives us some breathing room to figure out how to do this responsibly and to how to, how to uh, kind of prevent the worst outcomes of this. Uh, we're not neck and neck with an adversary right now. And we should take advantage of this lead to do it right. All right, we've been getting some questions in, so I want to honor the audience and um, throw these questions out to anyone who wants to answer them. Uh, first one's on Volt Typhoon, was a demonstration of PRC cyber capabilities. The panel members also described how it was a galvanizing call to action for the U.S. cybersecurity apparatus. Because of this, do you think Volt Typhoon was counterproductive for the PRC? In this vignette, is there such a thing as cyber strategic deterrence as traditionally defined? What a great question. Who asked that? No. <laughs> yeah, from our perspective, um, Volt Typhoon was galvanizing, not just inside the U.S. government, but you know, as we worked with partners, not only inside the United States, but our allies. Um, with regard to the second part of the question, um, you know, did you know, did they fire this this capability too early? I, I who knows, right? But what we do know, and you heard earlier today from Morgan. They're doubled down, right? China's doubled down. Um, they're developing new capabilities. And so it's incumbent upon us, you know, to in ensure that they don't have the advantage. 
It's what can we collectively do to make sure our systems, you know, we do, the defense work is, it's not cool, it's not easy. But what are the things that we have, we can do now, knowing what we know, because we'll give you the IOCs, the indicators of compromise, we'll tell you what we know as soon as we know it, we'll make sure that those, those TTPs um, are, are, are shared at the unclass level. Um, it's, I don't know that we have the mechanisms to Mo's point uh, to be able to share where it matters in some of these um, sector risk management areas that are like in the ICS space and the IOT space, right? So we're, we've got a ton of work to do there. So, so maybe just a, a quick, a quick comment. Sometimes I, I tend to think about collateral damage, you know, associated with with uh, events like this, and you know, you may intend to do something, you release something in the wild, you're going to get something unintended, target something unintended, and I'm not sure, you know, with China, what's their tolerance to you know collateral collateral damage, given what we know about about their infrastructure and, and things of that nature. So that's maybe. Another I was going to push on that a little bit because, Robin, you said earlier that the Russians don't really care about collateral damage. And, you know, historically their cyber operations were kind of like drunken sailors leaving fingerprints everywhere. Um, I, I may not use a sailor analogy, but <laughs> the, the Chinese... <laughs> I take no offense, I'm a Marine, but I hang with sailors. <laughs> it's like dr drunken infantry people leaving fingerprints everywhere. Um, at uh, Thompson, you, you spent time there. What is the Chinese mindset? Like, how are they likely to react to being discovered? You know, it'll be really interesting to see how history reflects on, on the Xi Jinping era in CCP politics. There's, there's three really compelling dates in the arc of U.S.-China relations, really from the Chinese side. 1972, they shift to a more pro-engagement, and then 1980, reform and opening uh, uh, posture where they want friendly relations with the U.S. so that they can develop their economy, get technology, get investment, and so on, have access to the international ec economic order. Um, in 1989, there's another pivot. I'm, I'm citing Rush Doshi's research, by the way, who's on the, a panel tomorrow. 1999, there's another pivot where the Soviet Union falls, which was kind of earth-shattering to the CCP leadership. They see the Gulf War and how far ahead the U.S. is, and the Tiananmen massacre happens, and they start to view the U.S. as kind of an existential threat to CCP leadership. And then fast forward, and, but again, they continue, they start this kind of blunting strategy against U.S. power, but they're still very friendly. And so well, we're just a developing country, we want to be friends with everyone, including the U.S., and it's kind of this hide, hide your shrinks and bide one's time approach that Deng Xiaoping championed. In 2009, we see another shift with the financial crisis. And suddenly, some hubris starts to sneak in. Wow, U.S. doesn't know that much. These Western experts don't know so much. And this kind of bravado comes into Chinese foreign policy. Uh, and I think we continue to see that. And it, it, it feels like it's led to a lot of unforced errors, frankly. Because I think it's tougher for China to get what they want in international relations the more they show this aggressive behavior and kind of anger uh, uh, potential or their, uh, international partners. Just to just to add on the you know the erudite questioner you know mentioned deterrence theory. You know, I think the what other panelists have said about this motivating um, increased U.S. government uh, collaboration uh, amongst ourselves and with uh, the private sector. You know, it enhances deterrence by denial um, as we continue to shore up our our uh, cybersecurity. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but shining a public spotlight on uh, what they have done uh, to the extent you know, I, I am not able to measure how that affects the Chinese uh, leadership's calculus, um, but I can say what it has done on our side, and uh, I think there is a cost that they are paying for that in, in so far as you know, the investments that we're making and, and the collaboration that it's further generating. We have a question about open source that I'd like to pose to the panel. The world ducked a catastrophic bullet when a Microsoft engineer accidentally detected an implant in a ubiquitously deployed component of Linux. Do you view open source software as an ongoing attack vector in spite of assurances that eyes on make it more secure than closed source alternatives? And a corollary to that is, what about open source LLM models? Do they have a leveling effect? Are we worried about them? So either side of that. Should I start? Um, an LLM in its rawest form is what we call helpful only. 
which means it'll help you do anything, good or bad. It will help you, you know, write a paper, a uh, news article. It will help you research cancer uh, 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 cures. It will also help you cheat on your homework. It will help you develop a bioweapon, right? It's called helpful only. And so a lot of what we do when we are building in safety measures these models is we're making them harmless as well. So helpful and harmless. With an open source model, you can fine tune that harmlessness out of the model, right? And I think that's what a lot of con uh, the concerns people have about open source models are. On top of that, it can help a company or some other organization accelerate their LLM development because they have access to an open source model that they have not developed themselves. So I do think there's an acceleration effect uh, in, in with companies or adversaries that might not be uh, uh, as far ahead. And there's also this risk we inject with um, more risky models out there. I would yeah. say AI can be a great tool to try and to scan these open source codes and to figure out if we have any vulnerabilities in them. And I think that's, you know, the area of cognitive cyber where you have AI and cybersecurity together to look at codes and what is implanted in these codes and what not. I think it's really dangerous to use an open source code these days without knowing what's in it. Yeah, I think there's a value proposition. Uh, well, there's an argument to be made that, you know, that that development ecosystem has to be thriving and well, right, to be able to enable us to move fast. But we've got to develop constructs to be able to assure, um, you know, the, the to, to gain a surety on the code, right? So, you know, if you go into an Apple environment, you've got an SDK, and you know that there's, there's a level of se security around that. Um, when you think about modern conflict, if there's a code that's built on open source ar um, uh, architecture, uh, you know, just just think about you know whether it's Russia, Ukraine, or, or Israel, Hamas. Some of those applications are used to notify a nation about whether it's a a uh, weapon strike that's coming their way. So, how do you understand the efficacy of that software that it's not exploited by an adversary? So, we've just got to be able to figure out the mechanisms. Like, if you own the repository. Do you have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the code that's uploaded is, is there's a mechanism to assure security? I think that's just work that we can do, again, with the smart minds around this to, to be able to assure the environment. Uh, one last question: Can the U.S. leverage information operations to counter Chinese influence? To counter Chinese influence, is it a priority today? What are the risks of doing I/O against a near peer adversary? So um, what we're seeing is today, information operations is a part of the lexicon. It's a part of um, you know modern uh, modern life, right? Um, it's not isolated to what we saw in Russia, Ukraine. Every day on social media, we have nation-state actors who own personas who are who whose sole intent is to influence domestic audiences. And so, you know, the question becomes, how do we deter or den uh, deny them the capability to do that? Um, there is, and that's a ton of work that we have to do across the US government to understand where those actors are, whether it's nation state or otherwise, uh, where those actors are influencing us, and, and how do we build the resilience in our people to be able to understand how and where they're, influ they're being influenced. And that starts not just you know, in, an, in the adult population. It has to start really early you know, at elementary, middle, and high school as we're beginning to consume the technologies and consume um, uh, you know, these, these uh, we're being influenced by these constructs. So uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, I want to end on a positive note and ask uh, each of you uh, the same question. What are we doing well? What do we need everyone out here to do to support the mission? And w what role do academic institutions like Vanderbilt have in developing the right talent, the right technology, and contributing to the mission from a broader perspective? I think, first of all, Vanderbilt is a great university. Uh, it's one of the core universities, you know, running Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, 
Uh, so we're looking forward to partnering with, uh, with Vanderbilt, but I think like the general earlier this morning talked about, Vanderbilt can lead the way in building a new curricula that actually is relevant you know, to, the, to the armed uh, forces, to, to cybersecurity. I, I think you know, trying to educate you know, US citizens uh, about cybersecurity, building the right programs for them, it's, it's extremely important. I think we need to always worry about you know, insider threats. And, uh, and I think to Jamal's uh, earlier point, let's bring everybody, but I think we really need to work hard on trying to train and put the right curricula in place, right? And excite people about mission. And I think that's important to start early and I think Vanderbilt can lead the way. I agree with everything Mo said. I, um, I would say that um, all technology creates uh, opportunities and challenges. And I think the, the, individual, the individual human unit of analysis is actually, um, you know, we talk about uh, weapon systems and, and critical infrastructure and whatnot, but the individual also is very important in the, in the equation. And so all of us, um, are part of, you know, something you can do is to minimize the vulnerabilities that we collectively uh, need to uh, potentially address. Um, I think uh, to, to Mo's point, just building on, uh, I, I've been in uh, federal service as a career civilian now for my 14th uh, year, and before that I was at a national lab, but there's no competition here on this stage. Um, but the, the, um, I would encourage uh, students and would look forward to, you know, um, throughout my career I have engaged with uh, students. Government is an exciting place to be where you are living history uh, on the day to day and we need the best minds, uh, the best people, whether you're wearing a uniform or you're a civilian uh, like me, or you're working with uh, government at an academic institution or in a private sector company, um, we need to work together um, to win the century. So for me, uh, two things. Um, we all have battle space, right? At home, you have a battle space and cyberspace that's terrain that you need to defend. Um, I'll leave you with an anecdote. I was talking, I was um, with one of our young officers talking to a group of young, young folks and you know, uh, about the importance of the people that we have in the United States and as we work with our allies and the righteousness of, you know, how do you get motivated because we can't pay you enough to do this mission. And he said to this group of folks, he's of young people, he's like, look, you know, this mission, where else do I get to hack on behalf of my nation and don't end up in jail? <laughs> so. You know, you can come to the Cyber National Mission Force. We're looking for a few good men. But again, the point there is everybody has a fiduciary responsibility to protect your battle space. And then when you're done doing that, come help us protect the collective, right? I'm sold. Uh, I, I'll, I'll double down this mesh is that we're in the lead right now. And this, this is all moving extremely fast, but we have more time because we're winning than we were that if we were losing to figure out how to get this right. And I think it's gonna take a very multidisciplinary approach. And I love, especially as a Nashville native, that Vanderbilt is, is leading in that here. Um, but it's gonna take a very multidisciplinary approach in universities, in government, in industry. We're recruiting people from national security to, to our company, right? Like we wanna get this right, but it's gonna- Don't recruit too many. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of different disciplines and uh, kinds of expertise to get this right, and we don't have a lot of time. Thank you. Um, Thank you all for, for engaging in this conversation. We could go on for another hour or two. There's a whole bunch of topics we didn't hit. But I, why don't we just give a round of applause to our panelists. Well, thank you very much indeed for that fascinating panel which was both very sobering and also very inspiring. Um, we're gonna have a quick change of set at the moment and take away some of the chairs. And while we'll do that, I'm just gonna share a couple of thoughts about the discussions we've had so far from my perspective. Um, when I was um, in an earlier part of my career running the Lex column at the Financial Times, we used to try and 
always summarize whatever the topic of the day was in three bullet points or three paragraphs. And if I had to summarize what I've heard today, I'd put it down into three key points. Firstly, to cite General Tim Hawke, we've moved from a world where the US thought it made the waves to one where it has to surf the waves. And by that I mean the nature of power is shifting. Um, no longer can we assume that big countries can crush small ones. It's really about speed and agility and flexibility. And we really are seeing the rise of asymmetric power. And we've been discussing how and why that matters. The second point that we just heard a lot from Major General Marlock is that the only way to cope with that world is to stress partnerships, second bullet point, that partnerships are really emerging as crucial, not just across government, not just between countries and allies, but also between the public and private sector. And the question of how you do that is going to be one of the defining questions going forward, because I don't think that many people in the private sector who I speak to, be that investors or CEOs, have fully appreciated how that's changing. And the third point is that we are essentially, as Patel said, in a race against time. I think one of the most chilling comments of the day has been that what she keeps her up at night is a question of whichever intelligence service works how to deploy AI, Gen AI, on its own data will end up winning. And who wins that race is not yet clear. So those are the points that I personally take away from the discussion today. I think it's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. But what we're going to do now is have a change of gear and move from talking about the actual tangible realities of tech revolution, geopolitical conflict, and the military hardware and software, to talking about some of the issues around information, and particularly around communication. It's a topic I love because I've been in the communication business as a journalist and columnist and editor um, for all my life. Um, before I did that, I was an anthropologist, and so I was also fascinated by cultural patterns of information. But the person you're going to hear from now who's going to talk about this is extremely well qualified to discuss it. It's Peter Singer, who is officially a strategist at New America, a professor of practice at Arizona State University, and founder of Useful Fiction, a company specializing in strategic narrative. The description of him that I love, though, is that he's also officially a, quote, mad scientist for the US Army's Training and Doctrine Command. And he's written a number of books, both nonfiction books talking about the military, but also um, a, a number of, sorry, a number of um, nonfiction books, but also several novels talking about military and geopolitical themes as well, including one that some of you may have read, Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war, and his latest is Burnin, a novel of the real robotic revolution. So what Peter is going to do is to talk to us about what the military and security um, leaders are getting wrong about how they communicate their message to the wider public and the world. And then we'll have a quick fireside chat about some of the key questions that I've got. And also, if you have questions, do please send them over as well. Thank you. Peter, the stage is yours. So thank you uh, both for that very kind introduction and also to the organizers. Uh, first, um, I want to uh, thank them for the opportunity to come down to Nashville, escape DC. Um, I got the requisite uh, hot chicken last night. Um, but also, we've been able to have some really uh, rich conversations about a variety of topics, um, as, as was referenced, uh, that I've worked on in the past, whether it's new technologies, AI, rise of China, um, that you know, it'd be fantastic to jump into with my, my .edu hat on. But what the organizers asked me to speak to is a problem that we all face, which is in the, the what next. Um, and the way to think about this is that there is a double challenge that every organization faces, whether it is a military, government agency, a business, a university, including a university with a, a bold new initiative. Um, and the double challenge is this. The first is understanding. 
you have to be able to identify and frame the new, the new ideas, the new technologies, the new processes, the new opportunities, or what we've heard a lot about today, the new threats. But there's a second part, which is um, frankly something that we don't spend enough time thinking about, working on, training for, which is how do we communicate this new and therefore disruptive to our key target audiences? That is, how do we not just explain it, but how do we gain and retain the attention of those target audiences when so much else is competing for it in terms of both the media space, but also their mind space. That is, you're in competition with these ideas in terms of you know, everything from what's out there in the media to what's on their mind to what's in their uh, inbox. Now, most of us um, know what doesn't work and yet what we keep using. It's the strategy paper that leaves us stupefied. It's the PowerPoint that leaves us mystified. And these are both real examples. Um, and we also have something else that um, does work, which is what they asked me to speak to you today about, which is interesting because how do you wrestle with the new? A good approach is to use what is literally the oldest communication technology of all, which is story. Now, we've been added in a project that uh, we call Useful Fiction, and we've worked with organizations that range from Congress to uh, Fortune 100 companies to the Marine Corps, and what we do is we blend together nonfiction research and analysis uh, with the power of narrative. A different way of thinking about it is what we do is create smoothies. So um, at one end of the spectrum, you have uh, science fiction. You've got techno thrillers, and I, I love them. But they're like milkshakes, right? They're designed for entertainment. Now, sometimes we'll say, yeah, but you know, they've got good stuff in there, you know, and they've influenced the world. Uh, you know, Star Trek has created so many good things. But it's a lot like saying um, you know, there's strawberries in the strawberry milkshake. That's not why they were put in there, right? At the other end of the spectrum, we have the kale of the academic and policy world, right? It's the journal articles. It's the 100-page strategy report. What we're after is that thing in the middle. Let's start with those vegetables, those fruits, but bring in narrative and create something, as I'll get to later on, that's not only more likely to be consumed, but um, more likely to stick with you. And whatever, um, now I'm gonna get back to being wonky. Um, we're in an academic setting. Um, and whatever uh, form that narrative is in, and I think it's very important to foot stomp, when we say narrative, we don't always mean made up story. We don't always mean fiction. Narrative can be a true story. There was that time when I was in Nashville, dot, dot, dot. But the point is, um, there are six key attributes for why using narrative, why using story is so important, so valuable. The first is um, the science from fields that range from, uh, as you see here, uh, international relations studies to cognitive science have repeatedly found that um, such synthetic experiences are a more effective means of conveying new and or complex information. Uh, in fact, if they hook your brain up to a monitor and you read a journal article, you read Field Manual 3.0, one part of your brain will light up. If you read a story, four parts of your brain will light up. The reason why is it's basically evolution at work. As I referenced before, we've been using story to share new ideas, to share things that might be useful going back to when we were gathered in caves. By contrast, um, PowerPoint, as you can see there, was created in 1987. And yet, um, I'm gonna do a quick question of the um, government and military folks in the room. How many of you have spent over 100 hours of your life using, training, getting good at PowerPoint? 
Interesting. Now, um, this idea of a, of a new uh, complex information, a, a project here it illustrates is um, something that was done uh, by uh, DSTL, which is the British government's version of doing some important defense research. Uh, they identified um, eight key issues that are key to the future of Britain. A lot of the topics that we've talked about today, uh, AI, robotics, quantum, et cetera, and their scientists and analysts um, spent six months, they created created an incredible 138-page uh, document on it, and you can guess you know, how that landed on their target audience of flag officers, defense ministers, and the like. And so what was done is um, let's take those eight key topics and let's create a series of short stories that don't predict the future, but rather help you understand, help you visualize the key nonfiction points of it. Um, they were, in fact, the theme cutting through all of them was uh, grounding them in prominent moments from 20th century British history, but as if they were playing out in a world with these new technologies. So as an example, the one on the bottom right there was from the chapter on um, an issue that we've talked about a little bit, in fact, in the last session, which is how are changes in energy, um, new energy resources, uh, rare earth, um, new energy networks from clean energy, uh, what does that mean for the future of geopolitics? And the way that was in the original report, and the way it was shared in the narrative is through what you see there, which is an obituary for an imagined young officer who's just died in a motorcycle accident. It goes back to tell the story of their life on how they served in insurgencies in locations that had not been strategically significant, but because of a new energy find had become incredibly important. They then wrote a memoir about their life lessons it's the story of Lawrence of Arabia, but as if taking place in the 2030s. Second value of um, narrative is it brings in emotion. And while we like to think that we are rational beings, again, studies of everything from um, decisions made in cabinet meetings on whether to go to war or not, to what kind of car to buy are driven by emotion. Um, it might be a positive emotion that you can be strategic. Uh, the one on the left there is a project that the Naval Expeditionary Combat Command did on visualizing its future in the Pacific as a way of seeing what success would look like. Um, or it could be a negative one. Uh, on the right, you see a project that we did that envisions a outcome in the Pacific that we never ever want to see happen. And so you can say, I don't want that. What am I going to do to prevent it? What were some of the causes of it? Third value, change management. Now, um, in business, over 70% of organizational change efforts fail. Uh, I won't ask our friends from government and military what percent of government reform uh, fail, but it's more than 70%. And um, when they look at the reasons behind those failures, it consistently comes back to narrative. And um, narrative in, in three different ways. The first is um, a failure to communicate the need for change. Second is a failure to communicate the vision for the future, the destination that we're headed towards. But the third is most often what happens is the leaders, the strategy team lays out a vision of change, everyone gets excited about it, and then after a couple of months, the frozen middle, the middle managers basically sink it in sort of playing out an insurgency. And the reason why is um, either they don't see themselves as characters in the story of change, what's in it for me, what's in it for people like me, or worse, they see themselves as characters in the story of change, and they're the character of the victim. And so they'll just wait it out. 
And again, I, I'm sure that never happens in universities, never happens in business, never happens in militaries. Um, so an example of how to uh, potentially battle this was undertaken um, with uh, General Brown back when he was head of the U.S. Air Force. He's now um, chief of staff of, uh, sorry, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And basically it transformed his strategic vision into what you see here, which is the what if, what would success look like and the important date for our friends um, in the room here from the Air Force is it envision what it might look like in the year 2047, which is the 100 year birthday of the US Air Force. And so it was a way of both communicating the strategy, what success would look like, but it also going back to that idea of emotion, it created the sense of, hey, if we want our Air Force to look this way on its 100 year birthday, we kind of have to start acting right now. Another um, value proposition of um, narrative is uh, studies from everything from uh, Harvard Business Review to the Journal of Be Behavioral Decision Making have found is that it aids with innovation and forecasting. In fact, um, percentage wise, it creates roughly a 30% more innovative outcome. Um, there's a lot of different reasons behind this, but basically it comes down to how narratives help the mind um, envision new environments. Uh, the characters in them help the mind look at um, different perspectives. Um, plot lines, so to speak, help the mind envision possible actions, reactions, causes, and effects. One of the other things that um, I think very important and goes back to the last couple panels is that um, this is one of the areas where AI is not very good at it. It's not good at being creative, and the human mind is, so it's one of our competitive advantages for us to utilize. Uh, example very relevant to this meeting um, is a project that was originally for Special Operations Command and um, then used in testimony to the House Armed Services Committee, which um, basically looked at the question of what would winning look like vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, now, most of the discussion uh, was about, you know, how could we defeat China on the beaches of Taiwan? How we came at it instead is we said, what does victory look like? It looks like China deciding never to invade Taiwan. And that's deterrence, as you heard from some of the past questions. The important part from research, but also story, is that deterrence is not about your actions only, it's actually about the perceptions and decisions of your adversary. So the goal is a world, which we envisioned, where a PLA general looking back explains why they never ever decided to invade Taiwan and all the dastardly things that America and its allies did such that it was never the right time to invade China. Fifth is um, the ask. There is only one scarce resource, time. And so you have to figure out a way to pierce that. And um, whether it is a, again, a white paper or a proposal, um, you are making an ask of the reader's time and attention. Story, though, is a different kind of ask of their time and attention. Um, in business terms, it has a lower barrier to entry. It's an easier way to reach people. Uh, example here, um, on the left uh, was an Australian government report, 21 pages, on the future of education reform related to national security. Pretty important topic. Uh, team worked on it. Um, very important, um, but you know, didn't land with the, the targeted effect. And so working um, with them, we identified the three key themes in the report. Uh, it's 37 nonfiction nuggets, the vitamins in it that they wanted readers to know. And that report was transformed into um, what you see on the right, Eye for a Storm. Eye for a Storm is a story that follows a young officer uh, on an exciting mission. It's an embassy evacuation in the wake of a tsunami. And then there's flashbacks to their time in college and the lessons that they learned in college and how they play out in that, that imagined future. Um, you read it, 
you also get the three themes, you get the 37 nuggets. Why do I share that? Um, one, if you can make the topic of education reform interesting, you can make any topic interesting. Um, second, uh, the metrics. Um, it was made into an Australian government document. It has so far had over 15,000 downloads. That's two orders of magnitude more than the original government document. It was also um, turned into an article for Task and Purpose, which is one of the more popular um, online military magazines for young members of the military and security community. But sometimes it's not about numbers, it's about the individual who. Uh, among the readers of Eye for a Storm that we can confirm is the Chief of Defense of all of Australia and seven US four-star admirals and generals. Story reached them. The sixth and final value of story is um, connection and distribution. And it goes back to who we are as people. As humans, we connect over story. When we meet someone new, when we see an old friend or family member, we very quickly turn to stories of what we just did or what we just enjoyed, uh, a movie that we saw, a TV that we saw, a, a book that we read that we enjoyed. Um, it is very rare to find someone that said, you know, I was on uh, spring break and I read the best article in the Journal of Obscure No One Reads It Studies and you would love it too. That's very rare, but we will do that about stories. We don't tell our partners this, but we actually can't help ourselves but to share bad stories. So, um, for example, uh, I cannot stop myself from telling you how bad Rebel Moon is on Netflix. It is horrific. It is terrible. And then there's a bunch of you in the room who are going, no, it can't be that bad. I got to check it out. So that's the point uh, of all of this. Um, Rebel Moon's bad, your one takeaway. Uh, I'll give you an example of this applied to some of the topics that we've been wrestling with today. Special Operations Command um, has been at the forefront of warfare and counterinsurgency and counterterrorism over the last generation. It's wrestling with what is its role in the topics that we've talked about of competition and conflict with China. And so its strategy was transformed into a series of narratives, as you see here, that envision what are the role that special operators might play in the topics that we've talked about today. Um, it was originally designed for members of SOCOM to utilize instead of just their strategy paper, their partners in um, other parts of the military, Congress, et cetera. What's interesting going back to this sort of viral effect is um, we got this email from a professor at West Point, as you see, they're the head of their um, Defense and Strategic Studies uh, Department, and no one ordered them. They're already using it in the West Point curricula, and as you can see, the students are liking it better than some of their other stuff. So it went viral on its own. Okay, um, last part of the conversation. Uh, how can we do this? Now, there's a couple ways when it comes to story. Um, one, you can be a natural. You know, you can be born, a natural born storyteller, a Mark Twain or whatnot. Um, or you have to learn it. It's the same thing when it comes to um, jokes. Some people are natural born comedians. Some people have to learn the basics of it. I, for example, have seen Bill Gates effectively tell a joke and he very clearly worked at it, but it worked. So what are these elements of a good story? And I'm gonna foot stomp it again. When you're building a story, whether it's a true story, a fictionalized scenario, the next time you're writing an article, um, you're doing a brief, you're building a speech, what are the elements that you really have to have? What are the boxes that you have to check? First, you begin by asking yourself, who is my audience? What is my ask of them? But also, what can I do to show that I understand their world, their needs? What are the emotions that I want to trigger within them? If you can't answer that, you're not doing your job as a storyteller. Um, examples here uh, that are comparable. Um, 
on the left is a project uh, for the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Um, it was the U.S. Uh, bipartisan, one of the last bipartisan um, commissions left, looked at U.S. cyber strategy. The executive summary of it was a narrative, but what was key is it not only shared the key points of it, but it was written specifically to go after their most important target audience. It's not the public, it's not the media, it's not even the senators and representatives. It's the congressional staffers, because they're the ones that actually write the legislation. So the narrative shared the key points, but went after them. A different one um, is on the right. It's from uh, the Pentagon's AI office. Uh, they have a strategy, very important strategy. They don't have budget authority to make sure other people follow their strategy. So what you see here is um, the nightmare scenario for a program manager in the Pentagon. It's not, hey, if we don't get AI rights, we heard here, we could lose a war with China. The real nightmare scenario is Congress might do an investigation on your office. The boss might read that report over the weekend uh, while they're having coffee and they're red highlighting and say, come in. Um, and so what it is, is it's an imagined GAO report from the future, but the key points share the key points of the real world strategy. Next, every good story has a setting. It drops us into a place that is imagined, because you're not there, but it has to feel real, recognizable. And importantly, your setting has to serve a purpose. Um, think of these seven words. It was a dark and stormy night. It is a cliche of storytelling, right? But think how efficiently it was a dark and stormy night accomplishes a certain mission. We can all imagine it. It gives you a certain kind of feel. So, you know, my, my recommendation is not to begin with it was a dark and stormy night, but rather, again, to think about the purpose that setting can be utilized. Here we see the work of one of the master strategic communicators out there right now. And you see how the setting of his communication does so much of the work, right? Third, do you have not just a character, but characters? And the characters that are needed for drama. Every story, whether it's the story of your life to what China is trying to accomplish has heroes, victims, villains. Now what's interesting is that often they're aligned. So if you think about um, your life history to um, China's uh, wolf warrior messaging or messaging in the South China Sea, they're always both the hero and somehow the victim of the story, right? But think about your own life. You're almost always the hero and the victim. If you don't think character matters in story and policy, think for a minute how the story of Gaza and now US policy has been transformed not by the raw numbers of thousands of civilian casualties, but crystallized in one voice, one character. Jose Andres of World Food Kitchen. Fourth and final, whether it's in character, whether it's in setting, tiny details do the work and you have to be strategic about it. You cannot tell everything about the character, everything about the scene. And again, whether it's a true story or made up story. So you have to be strategic with details. And the best illustration of this John Wick and his dog. John Wick, over the course of his movies, has killed 439 people through everything from gunshots to um, books. Uh, again, that is probably the one takeaway from uh, this entire event that you will remember. Um, 
But the point is, by all measures, John Wick is a mass murderer. And he kind of mumbles his way. Also, he doesn't really you know, say things that make you think much different. However, this one moment, John Wick likes his dog, but even more importantly, the dog likes John Wick, and it completely transforms the way we think about this mass murder. So we've talked about um, information environments. We've talked about China. Um, think about how we could focus on all the different elements of their policy. We could throw data points, et cetera. Or we could find singular examples that crystallize the story of a nation violating international norms and bullying its neighbors, which is more effective. Now, there's obviously a much, much more to um, uh, tell when it comes to crafting story, but there's one thing that, that every good story has, which is an ending, um, and ideally an ending that brings it all together. And the best, I think, at this uh, was the old Twilight Zone uh, TV series. And of all the episodes, there was one um, that really stands out. It was called All the Time in the World. And if you'll permit me, I'll tell the story of All the Time in the World. So in it, there is this guy. He's um, this nerdy guy who works in a bank. He loves books, and he just can't help himself. He's always sneaking away to read books. He's not very interactive with um, his colleagues. Basically, he should have been an academic. Um, but the point is that uh, he does it again. Can't help himself. He sneaks down into the bank vault, and he's reading. But while he's in there, suddenly it all shakes, and dust comes from the ceiling. And he goes upstairs, and nuclear Armageddon has happened. Everything's destroyed. His city is in ruins. And he's walking through the, the rubble of it. And he's, you know, this, this academic, this nerdy guy is now literally the, the last man standing. He's alone. And then he passes a library. And there's pile upon pile of books there. And he gets a smile on his face because it may be dystopia, but he has found his utopia. He has all the time in the world to do what he wants to do, which is just to be alone and read. And so he reaches down to pick up a book, and his glasses slide off, and he frantically searches for them, and then crunch. He stepped on his glasses. So now he has all the time in the world to read, but he can't. I don't have all the time in the world to keep talking to you, so I will leave you with this. Um, story is not a replacement for data, for research, for white papers, but it can be a powerful tool to enhance white papers, data, research, if we're just willing to deploy this technology that resides in all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, I am admittedly quite biased because I've been a journalist for the last 30 years, apart from being a cultural anthropologist. Um, and so I've been trained to tell stories in all kinds of forms, and I've written various books myself. Um, but I must say, I absolutely relish and welcome the comments you make, because since I've been on the receiving end of all manner of ghastly press releases um, from government bodies, um, if they could only become slightly less ghastly, I would be absolutely delighted. Um, so we will have a chance for any of you to ask questions who'd like to. Do please email them into that um, 
that email address at the bottom uh, up there. Um, but before we do get, uh, get any questions, I've got a couple of questions myself. Um, the first is, what grade would you give most of the national security institutions and military institutions that we see in Washington that have been represented on the stage today in terms of their ability to do storytelling? I mean, are they getting an A, B, C, and which direction are they going in at the moment? Well, we're, we're, you're really, you put your journalist hat on there. Um, well, so uh, I... You can think of me as a college, yeah, um, yeah, college, yeah. college head if you want instead, but, but, giving but students grades. The, the key is that we can parse out. You said the organizations, not the individuals. So yep. we're, we're clarifying this is not about any of the individuals that stepped onto this stage, but rather the national security community. Um, or to put it uh, another way, who's doing it well? Who would you give a, a better than average grade to and who's doing it really badly? So, uh, I, you know, I'm a professor as well, but um, I do not believe in the grade inflation issues. Um, and so for the most part, I think we are in the C's and D's range in um, effectively telling the story of whether it is um, new challenges um, whether it is new technologies, whether it is new threats, whether it is um, new opportunities. Uh, and you know, it's, it's quite easy to identify a topic, uh, sorry, it's quite easy on any topic to look at it and say, you know what, um, how could we better tell that story? Uh, and, and, and I don't think I'm saying anything um, novel if you go to almost any organization and say, are there parts of your story that you don't think you're um, telling effectively? Uh, are there groups that you're not reaching or groups that you're reaching but they're not acting in the way that you hope to achieve? Um, did you spend a lot of time on a report and it didn't resonate to reflect the amount of time that you did? Um, I think that's, you know, almost every organization would probably say, yeah, that's us. Um, I think in particular, as you've, uh, you know, as we've heard on stage, um, we, we see this in, you know, very clear and obvious areas of narrative, uh, information operations, um, but I think it also, again, applies to um, broader topics. Um, yeah, you, I mean, if you want to drill down on one. Absolutely, I'd love to. Do you want to <laughs> name any names of organizations that are getting a C or a, or a D or an B? Uh, yeah. Um, again, I gave almost all of them a, a C or D, um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll play it safe and leave it at that. Um, right. Well. I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, any organization that thinks it's doing, a, in, in the U.S. government, that thinks it's doing a really good job at telling its story is probably telling a story to itself, which is a lie. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's very tactful, or not. Um, but because um, I've, I've had a lot of conversations over the years with central bank governors and financial um, officials around this, because in many ways they face the same problem as military and security leaders, in that they are in charge of a public good and platform which matters enormously, enormously to the population, which no one understands, and where most of the people who rise to the top of them are dreadful at communication and storytelling. Um, do you think that there are lessons that the military and security world can learn from other areas of government or business about how to tell stories better or how to get better at it? Or any lessons that Americans can learn from other parts of the world? So there's, I think there's a couple of things there. Um, one, uh, often um, the, what we're talking about here is sort of the strategic communications element of it is within government, um, too often either an afterthought after the policy is developed, after the, the paper, we've spent six months creating the, the doctrine, the paper, and then it's, well, how do we communicate it? Rather than, you know, most um, businesses would be in their, they would have simultaneous product development research, but they'd also be, you know, trying to understand the target audiences, the customer base, trying to understand the influencers, trying to build the plan around the rollout of it. Um, related, uh, most business, most political campaigns would not treat it as a one-off, but as a campaign. There's, a, there's sort of an irony that um, very few organizations on the government side 
uh, think about having a campaign plan related to their important documents. So they'll, you know, spend uh, huge amounts of times creating a, a, a strategy, a doctrine, a, a posture review, you know, insert name here, and they'll have the rollout of it. And it'd be like, you spent nine months on that product and you, you know, you're, you're gonna spend like three days on a communicating it rather than thinking about it as this extended campaign that I wanna have um, actions and effects over not just days, but weeks, but years. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Right, I'm curious because- um, can, Actually, can I add one sure. more thing in? Um, and it's a, 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 something that is a challenge that you probably experienced related to um, the financial world. Um, it's something we definitely see in um, science, scientists, analytic reports, including from the agencies here. Um, there is this, and, and frankly also um, students, it's the um, flaw as a reporter of you know the phrase emptying your notebook. I gathered all the data I spent time gathering the data, therefore I have to share it with you, both because I spent time doing it, I interviewed that person, I did that study, and or I need to show I'm, I'm really, really s smart. And um, we often uh, overwhelm people with the data, with the details uh, through that, rather than trying to find the story in it. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes I use the phrase, so very apt to being in Nashville, um, think of it uh, like salt and cooking. You need a l little, if you don't have it in there, it, it, the, the meal will fail, but if you add too much, you can also ruin the meal, you can ruin the report, you can ruin the article. And again, whether it's a newspaper article or a journal article, Absolutely. Um, I mean, I used to say when I was running the financial section for the FT, I used to tell the reporters who are dealing with really complex, geeky financial data, which was so abstract and disembodied, it was very hard to communicate. Just try and tell me what you imagine as being the illustration for this story, the one visual image that captures it, and that forces people to boil down what they're trying to say amid the complexity into one key thought and message, because the reality is when people put down newspaper articles, they only ever remember one or two things, and you have to try and make sure they remember the right things. There's, a, there's another, that's a great technique, there's another one that can be, um, imagine what is going to be the title of that article, or even better, what is going to be the title of the article written about your report, your program of change, um, and, and then work backwards from it. Uh, another, it, it's called a, um, Imagine a Future Perfect History. Another one for um, uh, both business and government reform, but I, I again, also um, academic reforms is, um, as an example, uh, imagine um, the retirement speech that you would give. And then, okay, what, what do imagine, I need to do? Or to, imagine what's gonna be in your tombstone in the future. Yes. Yes. Um, but you know that's a little more dismal than you know. <laughs> the, 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 but the very last day of work, uh, what is it that you're going to look back and and you know thank people and tell people that you are most proud of accomplishing, and then go hold it at my own pace to achieve that. Yeah. One other thing I'll add into that is that I I also used to teach reporters a lot about what I call the domino theory of communication, which doesn't mean dominoes toppling over in a line. It means that you have to imagine you've got two dominoes plastic pieces with two numbers on. And the game is to try and match one half of your domino with someone else's number. So you have to give them something that hooks into what they already know and resonate with, but then the other half of the domino can take them somewhere completely different. But if you give them a number that doesn't match at all and doesn't in any way hook in with your audience, you know, it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. But um, we've got a lot of great questions here actually coming in. Um, one question I love, I'm very biased on this, is we've heard a, a, today about the key need to attract the best and right talent to the mission. We have hear a lot about critical thinking, communication, and writing skills. Taking a page from your own strategies, let's have you imagine what national security efforts would look like in 2047 if we were successful in recruiting aggressively from the humanities in addition to STEM and CS. What would happen if you had a whole bunch of English majors and, dare I say it, anthropology majors running around with the computer scientists? So you might I get some culture clash. Yeah, well, but 
actually culture clash can be a really good thing. Um, uh, so I think what you would you would you know, we'd work backwards. Let's let's um, we ha we just had a, a panel on um, uh, cyber. So you and I are going to do a story creation right here up on stage. So we just had a panel on cyber. So what what we would want to do is imagine an, um, a highly effective team in uh, facing some kind of emergent cyber threat. So we would not have the threat be something of today, because that's easy, we'd solve it. But what, what's a, a realistic trend line of something we might face in the future, uh, AI-enabled misinformation attack, whatever. Um, but then we would say, okay, what, it, what, what, what would the team look like solving this problem? They would have a diverse set of skills, not just because we want a diverse cast of characters, but we know that research both within the military but also in studies of corporations find that diverse teams lead to more effective outcomes. So, and diverse defined as people who um, think differently, have different experiences, have different education. So, you know, if I'm trying to defend against a cyber threat, I, it'd be awesome to have um, computer scientists, but I also, if it's a financial network thing, I need someone who understands financial networks. Or if there's a misdisinformation element to it, to your uh, humanities issues, that's about narratives. What narratives are taking off? What narratives are not taking off? Um, okay, we've got this team. How did they join? Well, as you've heard from, uh, for example, the general, uh, there was pathways that allowed them to join rapidly, that's fiction right now for much of government. Um, we might want uh, pathways that allow people to move inside and outside of government uh, so I could gain experience in government, join private sector, but return without having to start all over again. Um, I would, it might go earlier the motivation, why did these great people want to join that team? Well, we had um, narratives of what it meant to be a cyber warrior, what it meant to serve, um, that they were exposed to at some point earlier in their life. And so again, you can kind of, back to your dominoes, you'd work backwards from that, that vision um, and, you know, and then we go, okay, what are the mechanisms that we have today to achieve this? what are the mechanisms that we don't, but we could put in place? Uh, and what I just laid out is an example of um, real world programs on, for example, creating a, a cyber auxiliary, which um, uh, is a pathway for allowing people, private sector academia, to help government, um, but not have to join the National Guard. Right. Right. Well, I say, I mean, some of this is already happening in the private sector. I mean, something that most people don't know um, is that the second biggest employer of cultural anthropologists in the world is Microsoft, because they recognize that computer science needs social science or human science to actually be effective. And there's a whole world of emerging what I call digital anthropology looking at the communications issue. Um, which leads me to another question, which is, how do you counter an adversary who we weaves a compelling narrative? Hmm. So um, there's a couple of things, and, and this relates to um, information warfare threats, whether we're going back and looking at what played out in 2016 against the US election, but also similar kinds of targeting of fellow democracies, um, studies found uh, over 36 other partner democracies have been targeted in the same way to, if we're looking at um, Chinese uh, attempts to uh, reach into the politics of um, partners like a Philippines or, or a Taiwan, um, a Japan. Um, so a couple things. Uh, one is um, you want to be able to identify the efforts to plant these narratives and the networks that they're utilizing. Some of this may involve covert means that we can't talk about on stage, but the great thing about um, foreign adversary uh, mis or disinformation campaigns is to be successful, they have to go public. They have to, in a sense, expose themselves. Okay, um, you want to understand which narratives are being planted, 
which narratives are starting to take off. Uh, Russia in particular has a, the spaghetti against the wall strategy. They throw a lot of crap against the wall. Most of it doesn't take off. You don't need to counter it all. In fact, um, if you try and respond to it all, you're giving attention to it. You want to understand the networks that they're utilizing, some of the, uh, the ne networks and nodes, some of which they own and operate and control themselves, uh, the false front uh, media outlets, false front um, uh, you know, sock puppet accounts. Bluntly, you also want to understand the network that they rely on of um, what uh, the Soviets used to call um, useful idiots was their translation. It's people in our own culture and politics who elevate foreign disinformation because they see it as good for their own political prospects. Well, I think we've okay. seen some of that recently in Washington in Congress. That would never, ever happen except for the fact that we've had multiple members of Congress uh, openly voice Russian uh, propaganda. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> next, um, uh, I could go. I, mean, I so much want to go on on that, but I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> okay, so you want to you want to understand the nodes. Um, lesson from Ukraine: um, You do not wait to debunk; you pre-bunk. Whether it's in business, whether it's in politics, um, after the fact responses do do not work. You want to establish your own narratives, your counter narratives, your own facts beforehand. So for example, um, the Ukrainians were very, very, the, the Russian stratagem um, uh, in, um, before the invasion of Ukraine was to lay the groundwork for a narrative which was um, there is a emergency going on inside Ukraine, there's atrocities and violations, and we are responding, we are rescuing, um, and instead, the Ukrainians and the larger, uh, the US, the UK, basically um, didn't wait for that to happen. They pushed out uh, you know, everything from large scale, um, you might remember you know, satellite photos of military buildup, to micro narratives such as, um, here's an image, uh, here, here's someone on a highway and notice the, the um, train going by that's loaded with Russian tanks. So they're, they're gearing up for something. They're not responding to it. Um, in your responses, you do not have a singular narrative. You do not have one response. It's a major flaw of, of government and a lot of failed political campaigns is to assume that um, you have the single story and despite the fact that you have multiple different target audiences right. out there. So you want to flood the zone with your counter narratives that might be large scale, might be small scale. So going back to that example of Ukraine, you know, remember they were countering Russian narrative with everything from um, the uh, tale of um, the ghost of Kiev, um, the supposed fighter uh, ace, to um, the uh, Snake Island, yeah. Snake Island to the the old woman who goes up to the Russian soldiers and says, "Here's some sunflower seeds. Plant um, them, you know, for for when you die." Yeah. Next issue I'll end on with this is um, you uh, you need to have a network that elevates your narratives. Um, so that old woman. It's interesting that um, she just happened to be videoed, gets popped up on YouTube, and within a matter of hours, it's being elevated by everything from official government accounts to individual leader accounts to influencer accounts. That's how you go viral. Uh, you have a network yeah. working for you. The last thing it'll end on, since this will be the, um, uh, the, the uh, second reference appropriately made to her here is, when in doubt when it comes to information operations, ask yourself what the Marie von Clausewitz of information warfare, Taylor Swift, would do. <laughs> That's a because, very good way of putting it. Yeah, who, because that, who, that leads to the other question I was going to ask. I'm really conscious that you know, we are what stands between the audience and drinks right now. So mm -hmm. 
The, the other question I wanted to ask was really on this Taylor Swift point, having tracked the Ukrainian situation very closely, I did my PhD in the Soviet Union, in fact, and you know, I've been tracking closely what the Ukrainian government's been doing on the information side. Um, how has social media changed this game? Because at the end of the day, what really pre-bunked things from Ukraine, what changed the narrative in Ukraine, above all else, was, dare I say it, TikTok imagery, it was social media imagery, it was visual imagery. It wasn't the kind of text-based um, storytelling that most of us have grown up assuming was dominant. So are we living in a world where basically if you want to pre-bunk or get your message out, you have to think visual first? I don't think you have to think visual first, but you do have to recognize the different communication channels that people are using first, and, and so what works or what doesn't work on those communication channels. Um, and uh, secondly, the old adage that, you know, a, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, broader answer to your question, uh, two points to end on. Um, anyone who doubts the, the power of story, the power of um, the weaponization of social media, um, do the counterfactual of Ukraine. Uh, imagine a world where um, a Zelensky had not been able to um, go viral. Uh, well, we can run some of the numbers of it. Um, within Ukraine, uh, before the conflict, he was at 23% levels of popularity. Um, he was basically the most popular of a deeply unpopular set of political figures. Uh, after uh, about 10 days of his incredibly effective strategic communications, he was at 90% levels of popularity. Um, but it was not just merely helping to unify a, a fractured public. Um, do the counterfactuals of how he becomes a global icon, and in turn, how his larger efforts help change the politics of what was viewed as even not just possible, but what we ought to do to support Ukraine not just the US, but you know, allies as far away as Japan, Australia are providing military aid, um, economic uh, sanctions, et cetera, just well past what anyone had right. anticipated. But I'll end on this, my concern for Ukrainian information operations, but how we have to think about vis-a-vis um, -vis China, is your goal is not just merely to win the opening battle, the opening conversation, you have to think of it as an extended competition, an extended campaign, and that's the concern that I have if we're looking at a Ukraine right now, is um, we have uh, lost the story, so to speak, when it comes to the value and importance of supporting them, not just as it relates to Ukraine and Russia, but as it relates to the larger topic of this conference, which is um, the lessons that other adversaries and allies in the Pacific would take from failure in Ukraine. Right, well I'll certainly add one tiny anecdote to that, which is that um, I've been back and forth to Kiev myself quite a few times recently and spent time with Zelensky and his, most importantly, his um, advisor, Andrei Yermak, um, in Kiev. And everyone knows that Zelensky was basically this television comedian comedy star. Um, what people generally don't realize is that Yermak, who's driving the show, was previously his producer and essentially running a production company. And they told me early in the war that basically they were treating the whole thing as being a bit like a production. And that staging of that video, that selfie in the courtyard on the first night where they all stood there and said, you know, toot, 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 we're all here, here, here was very much the brainchild of the production company around Zelensky. He brought the entire TV crew into government. Um, as you say, the danger of that is that it's a marathon, not a sprint, and they're in a long-running series, and they have to refresh the product right now, to, put it, to be cynical and put it in sort of t television terms. But the extraordinary message for anyone involved in security or geopolitical affairs right now is, as you say, communication in an effective 21st century way really can change the state of, state of warfare, the state of the world, and the state of how people perceive things going forward. So thank you very much indeed. What a wonderful way to end the first day. Thank you to everyone who's been on stage for such an incredibly interesting 
both inspiring and sobering set of conversations. Thank you to Vanderbilt for staging all this um, and for teaching us all so much. And right now, I think we all deserve a drink. Thank you. <laughs>